This is Audible. Surviving the Evacuation, Book Thirteen, Futures Beginning, written by Frank Tail, narrated by Tim Bruce. Part One, Day Two Hundred and Fifty Five, the Twenty Third of November, A Ticking Clock, Belfast and Dundalk. The story so far, Dundalk. Can't stop! Can't stop! Can't stop! Annette muttered, as she ran through the corridors of the Dundalk Technology College and into the small office near the canteen. There she did stop, just before tripping on the hundreds of crayons arrayed in a fan across the floor. Whoa! Mary O'Leary looked up from the sheaf of papers in her hand. Daisy, colouring the wall with a yellow crayon, gave Annette barely a glance. Something wrong, dear? Mary O'Leary asked, "What? No, I just don't have long," said Annette. "What are you doing?" "Well, I am calculating our vitamin intake," Mary said. "Daisy's drawing a mural. What are you doing that requires such a flap?" "I've only got ten minutes. Then Kim and I have to find somewhere along the waterfront where the New World can dock." "Ah, and was that the helicopter I heard?" Mary asked. Yeah, it's just taken off. Sholto's returned to Belfast, Annette said, as she stepped over the crayons and across to her bag. Daisy stopped colouring, frowned, and then toddled over to where Annette's foot had knocked four crayons out of position. The infant angrily replaced them before returning to her wall. What's up with her? Annette asked. Daisy's a little annoyed you aren't spending as much time with her as you used to," Mary said. "That's right, isn't it, dear?" Daisy didn't reply, but continued coloring the wall. Annette shrugged. "Sorry, Daisy, but I've got to help Kim." Now where is it? Where is it? Where's what? Mary asked. My journal. That can wait until evening, surely," Mary said. "Nope." Not if today's anything like yesterday. Stuff changes too quickly, so I have to write it down now before it's all different. Got it. Okay. Now, uh, ah,、oh, where should I start? Not with the outbreak. Not if you've only got ten minutes, Mary said. Yeah. No, that's all ancient history, Annette said. No, it's the shipwreck, and the sabotage, and Belfast, and us here in Dundalk. That's what people will want to know about. I guess I should start on Anglesey with a sabotage. Yeah, that's it. I should start with a summary of the crimes. And what are those crimes? Mary asked, as she picked up a pen of her own and scribbled a calculation on the page. Vitamin C was the deficiency uppermost in people's minds, but when safety and warmth were to be found indoors, a lack of vitamin D would be as big an issue. Though one more easily solved than the absence of calcium in their diets, well, I guess it started. Actually, I'm not sure where it started. Annette said, "Do you mean where or when, dear?" Mary O'Leary, long retired but ever the teacher, said, "And if you're not sure, begin with that of which you are certain." Okay. Well, uh, well, we knew that the nuclear power station on Anglesey was going to blow up. Melt down, not blow up," Mary said. "And how did that alter our plans? Before that, we were all going to Belfast," Annette said. "Sholto and the Admiral were already there with about a thousand people, a bit less after those hundred died, when they were clearing obstacles from the motorway so the plane could use it as a runway. And where was everyone else? Captain Devine was in Elysium with a few hundred Marines and other people." Mostly sailors and battlefield medics from the Harpers Ferry. The Veerman is there too, but both of the ships are broken. The Harpers Ferry's hull is intact, but its engines are broken. Mary said, "With the Veerman, it's the other way around. Its engines are functional, but the hull is cracked. And short of putting the submarine into a dry dock, it's doubtful it'll ever submerge again. And for the sake of accuracy." You should say they are in Kenmare Bay, just north of Kempton's old mansion farm. Right, yeah, got it. Annette said, 
scribbling furiously, and George was in London. And he still is, Mary said, and enjoying himself rather too much from what I hear. He is? He does enjoy his excursions out into the wasteland, Mary said. They've given him a new lease of life. Now, personally, I prefer living where hot water comes out of a tap, but it would be a boring world if we were all the same. Speaking of hot water, Annette said, do you think Rohinda will get the wind turbine working? It would take a lot more than that for us to have indoor plumbing again, Mary said. Now, didn't you say you only had ten minutes? You'll run out of time if we spend it chattering. Good point, Annette said, putting pen to paper once more. George, Lorraine, and her ship's crew are in the Tower of London, where there's about a hundred others, half adults, half children. That's Chester's community. It's Nilda's community, from what I understand, Mary said, and I think it's ninety, not a hundred. The figures are in the blue document case on the table over there. You know, I met her, Annette said. Nilda, I mean. When Kim and I were returning from Svalbard months ago, we found her on a rocky island off the coast of Scotland. I think you might have mentioned it once or thrice, Mary said, jotting down a note to ask the Admiral how best to monitor iron deficiency. Chester painted a message on the roof of the tower. I saw it. I should put that in. It was my idea to move the satellites over London. That's why we saw the message on the roof. Wasn't it Mirabelle who spotted the message? Mary said. She was just helping, Annette said. Yeah, so George, Lorraine and a couple of sailors went to London with Dr. Harabi. Chester went north, looking for one of his friends. What was his name? Eamon Finnegan, Mary said. And Chester found him, didn't he? Eamon was in Birmingham, being held prisoner by some of Quigley's soldiers. I, uh, no, I won't put that in. You won't? Quigley's the past, Annette said. I don't think he should be remembered. Not by name. An interesting philosophical conundrum, Mary said. Do we glorify those who are evil by naming them, or are we rewriting history by omitting their names? That has always been the chronicler's dilemma. Uh, okay. So, Chester found his friend, and he found Sorica Locke, Kempton's, uh, I don't know quite what she is. Deputy, I suppose. They rescue Eamon and some other survivors, and then come back here. I think Bran might like you to mention that he had a role to play in that rescue, Mary said. Yeah, good point. Don't want to get on the wrong side of him, Annette said. So Chester and Bran came back to Anglesey with Locke and the survivors from Birmingham. George, Lorraine and Nilda and her people were in London. Who else? Oh, yeah, the Amundsen was halfway between Svalbard and Anglesey, collecting fuel. You know, we really need a fuel tanker. We do indeed, Mary said, but we won't find one in Dundalk. I guess not. Heather Jones was in Menai Bridge with about 3,000 people who'd volunteered to farm, fish, or loot the towns on the Welsh mainland. Everyone else had moved to the ferry port in Hollyhead because of the electricity and running water. It was an easier life, I guess, until we had to leave. And why did we have to leave? Mary prompted. Because the power plant was going to melt down, Annette said. Not quite, Mary said. Something went wrong at the water treatment plant. No fresh water was reaching the nuclear power station. Without water, there was no way to cool the reactor. Chief Watts thought he could fix the problem, but repairing the water treatment plant would have required all his time, all his attention, and that of all his engineers. No one would be left to monitor the power plant itself. Thus, there would have been no warning if another system had broken down. That was the danger. That was the reason we had to leave. The power station had been plagued with problems ever since it was brought back online. The chief had been working flat out making one critical repair and then the next. Even if it hadn't been for the water treatment plant, we decided to switch the power station off. Since we couldn't decommission the power plant properly, nor prevent a containment breach when it was switched off, we had decided to leave Anglesey by January. 
The failure at the water treatment plant was the last straw. We decided to cut our losses and leave immediately. Um, okay, Annette muttered as she scribbled in her book. Hey, you don't think that the saboteurs were behind all those problems with the power station, do you? I think they might have been, yes, Mary said. It's unlikely we'll ever prove it. Daisy toddled over to her fan of crayons, placed the yellow that she'd been using between two others, crouched down, leaned forward, and ran a hand over the multicoloured rainbow. Hey, I just noticed, Annette said. The crayons are all arranged by colour. She's a smart girl, Daisy, Mary said. Very smart. Do you see what she's drawn? It's yellow at the bottom, blue above, Annette said. It's a beach? A sandy beach, Mary said. But look at the blue. There are two shades, a darker blue for the sea, a lighter one for the sky. That's very advanced for her age. And that black blob, is that a ship? Daisy, is that a ship? Daisy picked up a green and returned to the wall. You're running out of time, dear, Mary said. What happened next? Well, everyone was supposed to go to Belfast, Annette said. The plane should have landed on the motorway. The grain ships were to go to the harbour. Heather Jones should have gone there too, except she didn't. She took her people from Menai Bridge and most of our fishing boats, all in a large flotilla down to Elysium. You don't think she had something to do with the sabotage? Heather? No, not at all, Mary said. And if you're being accurate, you should use the present tense and say that her flotilla is sailing towards Elysium. I thought she'd arrived. Annette said. Not all of her boats have, Mary said. She had some fast sailing yachts and just as many fishing boats. A ship's speed isn't determined purely by the quality of the hull. The sails are just as important, and a lot of hers are now a patchwork quilt of whatever cloth was available. I never thought of that. OK, so we were all planning to leave Anglesey anyway, and then the water treatment plant broke. That's when we decided to depart overnight. It was all done really quickly. We had the grain that was on the ships and the weapons, but otherwise only took what we could carry. We left a lot behind on Anglesey. But we'd all arrived there with nothing, Mary said. So what had we lost? Personally, my favourite bag, Annette said. The ships left first, our three grain ships, I mean. There were a few small boats, but it's the grain ships that are important. People were crammed everywhere, in the corridors and below decks with the crates of grain, and once we'd left, the plane took off. Uh, you should write down who was on board, Mary said. Bill, Chester and Sorica Locke, Annette said. Then there was Sergeant Khan and Private Kessler because they were Locke's jailers. Bodyguards more than jailers, Mary said. You don't think she had anything to do with the sabotage then? Annette asked, no, because if she had, she wouldn't have been on the plane. You've forgotten someone. I have? Who was flying the plane, dear? Oh, yeah, Scott Higson. Daisy looked round. Red, she said. OK, Annette said. Is that smart, or is it just that she's hungry? I would say both, Mary said. Now, finish what you're writing. It's already been ten minutes. The plane took off, and Mr. Hickson couldn't turn it. Something had gone wrong with the... Uh, what do you call it? Avionics? Mary said. Except we don't know what went wrong with the plane. He couldn't turn more than a few degrees, so he flew the plane southwest over Wales, England, and then the Channel. According to their last sat phone call, they were over France and looking for somewhere to land. Either the phone broke during the landing, or they're out of contact with the satellites. There's too much cloud cover over France right now, but we'll find the plane soon. Yeah, but Bill won't be there, Annette said. By now, he'll be on his way back. Again, Daisy paused. Yes, he will, Mary said. Now, back to your journal. What happened after Mr. Hickson radioed in there was a problem with the plane? That's when we realised that there was a problem with the ship, too. Well, no, it was about an hour later. We tried to turn the ship, 
and the navigation system sort of crashed. Then Commander Crawley discovered there was something wrong with the ballast tanks, so if we stopped, we'd capsize in a strong wind. And then, well, then something else went wrong and we couldn't stop. We were trying to get close to the shore, but instead we ran aground here in Dundalk. The ship fell on its side. Lots of people died. It was... was... We all remember what happened, Mary said. You don't need to add the details. What happened next? Well, Kim, Mirabelle and Bran went ashore looking for somewhere we'd be safe for the night. Kim had seen a tower block just before the crash. It turned out to be a hotel. So that's where we went. I mean, there was a battle on the shore first. We had to fight the zombies. But I don't think I need to mention that. Anyway, we got to the hotel and that was that. The next day, some people went back to the wreck to get the grain. Kim went into the town. She found a hospital and found it was full of zombies. She sort of led them back to the hotel and that's where we fought them. And we won. And... No one died. Not then. But the hotel was, well, it was horrid. We couldn't live there after that. So we came here to the college because of the wind turbine. I mean, not because of the wind turbine, but it was just that the wind turbine is such a large thing. It's easy to navigate by. Rohinda still hasn't managed to get it working, though. But I'm sure he will, Mary said. Then it started snowing. It was a real blizzard, and and that's when Yasmina died. It was just a stupid, tragic accident. I'd forgotten people could get hurt like that. I think we all had, Mary said. It is a bitter way to be reminded of an important lesson. The snowstorm stopped during the night, Annette said as she rode. This morning, Sholto arrived in a helicopter. He brought some ammo. Oh, I didn't mention that we were out of ammunition for the guns and the crossbows, or that we've only got the grain salvage from the wreck. We found some old world food, but other people came through Dundalk. It looks like they searched the town, gathering what food was left. That's helpful, but I don't think we'll find any more elsewhere in the town. Probably not, Mary said, and after all this time it's questionable how edible any old supplies would be. From now on, we need to focus on fish and forage. Yeah, but... But the door opened, and Kim came in. Annette, there you are. Do you still want to come to the waterfront? You don't have to if you don't want to. No, no, I do, Annette said. Give me a sec. Kim stared at the wall. Is that a palm tree you're drawing, Daisy? Where on earth did you see one of those? Ready, Annette said. Safe journey and safe return, Mary said. Chapter 1 Photographs and Confessions Belfast Harbour As the helicopter thudded onto the warehouse's roof, Sholto finally relaxed his grip. During the white-knuckle flight back from Dundalk, he'd almost squeezed the padding out of the seat. The skids caught the ice covering the roof, and the helicopter swung five degrees clockwise before coming to a stop. Sorry about that, sir, the pilot said, speaking into the headset's mic as she flipped a switch, then another. The ground crew should have cleared the ice. Sholto said nothing, but closed his eyes, enjoying a brief moment of stillness. Sir, are you all right? the pilot asked. I was just preparing for the onslaught, Sholto said. Civilians, eh? the pilot said with a grin. Aye, Sholto said, and he wondered when he'd stop being one himself. It wasn't just that his blue and grey outdoor wear matched the clothing of all the Admiral's new recruits, it was that he couldn't remember the last time he'd been an innocent bystander, a true civilian, rather than at the very centre of the storm. Oh well, can't put it off forever. Pass me the cameras. Thanks. And thanks for the ride. He took off his headset and climbed out. Head bowed, he jogged over to the metal staircase attached to the side of the warehouse. The building was one of the few that the naval engineers had deemed could withstand a helicopter's weight. In its previous incarnation, 
The warehouse had been a delivery hub for goods that had been brought into Belfast, but which were destined for other parts of the United Kingdom. The staircase had been added after the university leased the roof for the deployment of a weather monitoring station. Without access to the data provided by at sea boys and on mountain arrays, most of the equipment was useless. The rest had given them no warning of the snowstorm that had blanketed Belfast, and a few hours later covered the town of Dundalk, some sixty miles to the south. That storm hadn't reached the community in Kenmare Bay on the southwestern edge of the island of Ireland, not yet. Even if this storm didn't, another would. It was late November. Winter had only just begun. Sholto paused at the top of the stairs and took in the city. Five inches of snow masked the devastation, but it couldn't completely obscure it. The local heliport had been at the George Best Airport, a small city airfield on the opposite side of the Victoria Channel. Like so much of Belfast's recently regenerated waterfront, it had been obliterated during the chaos that had followed the outbreak. So much of Belfast had been destroyed that it was barely recognizable as the bustling conurbation of a year before. Survivors from throughout the city and refugees from across Ireland had come to Belfast, hoping for passage, praying for rescue, looking for salvation. They'd only found chaos and death. Missiles and cluster bombs had reduced some buildings to rubble and ignited fires that had destroyed others. It was impossible to tell precisely how many people had died in the harbour, though their skeletal remains almost filled the warehouse they turned into a mausoleum. As for how many of those refugees had joined the ranks of the undead, again it was impossible to tell. The last major assault by those necrotic ghouls had been before Anglesey was evacuated. Each day since, a slow trickle of zombies reached the checkpoints and barricades that protected the five thousand who called the harbour their refuge. None of them called it their home. Further inland, time was the true vandal, savagely wielding weather and neglect. Gutters had filled, ditches had overflown, and roads had flooded. Water seeping into buildings from the outside had met the rain that spilled in through broken windows and fire-damaged roofs. In another year, those buildings would be a habitat fit only for birds. Time was running out for Belfast. They'd nearly stripped the nearby houses of clothing and furniture, and had begun ripping up the floorboards to burn as firewood. They were gathering more than they could immediately use, but it would all be ash within a couple of weeks. Sooner, if the weather didn't improve. Water was too scarce to wash clothes or crockery, and so those were burned or discarded. Soon, they'd have to venture further, deeper into Belfast, just to find the most basic of supplies. The further the journey, the greater the calorie cost, the greater the risk of attack, of injury, of death. Their diet was increasingly dependent on fish. Their supply of medicines was non-existent. Ammunition was running low, and there was no hope of finding more in the city. Kim and Mary were right. It wasn't just a new home they needed, but a new way of life. He took one last breath of the icy cold air, fixed a confident smile to his face, and jogged down the stairs. About a hundred people had gathered around the roadway and access alley below. From the shovels, brooms, and occasional wheelbarrow, they should have been clearing the snow, but the return of the helicopter had given them an easy excuse to skive. He picked out a few familiar faces among the low pulled hats and tight-wrapped scarves, and revised his opinion. There were some in the group who didn't need an excuse to shirk. Marcus, the former barman and one-time mayoral candidate, stood at the bottom of the steps, an arm's length from the rest of the crowd. It wasn't clear whether the space was being left out of respect, from suspicion due to his association with Rachel Gottlieb, or out of fear that his ill fortune was contagious. Sholto quickly scanned the faces of those nearest to the barman, but none were among the man's former associates. "'What's it like in Dundalk?' Marcus called, before anyone else could, his voice loud enough to carry over the din from the helicopter's slowing rotors. 
much the same as the report last night, Schulter replied, pitching his own voice to carry deep into the crowd. And Dublin? Marcus asked, lowering his voice as, above, the rotors finally stopped. I haven't looked at the pictures yet, Schulter said, raising the cameras. That's my next job. There's no time to waste. Not now. Not for any of us. When do we get to see the photographs? Marcus asked, his voice now an echo across the ruined alleyway. Whenever you like, Schulter said equably. Was there something you were looking for? Somewhere, perhaps? Why did Rachel tell you during those long months alone in your bar? I, I just want to make sure there are no secrets being kept from the people, Marcus said. But the crowd's mood had shifted. The moment where uncomfortable frustration might have become support turned back into suspicion. There's work to be done, Sholto said, stepping around Marcus. There's always work to be done. He said no more as he made his way through the small crowd. Clearing the snow was one step above make-work. It was as much a task to see who would willingly labor as it was to keep the alleyways clear. With food tightly rationed, and meals dependent on the meager catches hauled from the Irish Sea, they didn't have the spare calories to make the harbour properly livable, even if the populace had been willing. Those who'd proved themselves ready to toil had joined the groups going out into the city to rip the floorboards from already stripped houses. They had too few reliable guards to send everyone on that useful task. It wasn't just the undead that needed to be watched for, but stashes of food and spirits in forgotten cellars. They had, so far, too few fishing rods for everyone to cast a line from the sea wall, and far, far too few small boats in Belfast to send any but the most able mariner out to sea. No, they had too little of everything, which had led to too many people having too much free time, and Marcus was taking advantage of it. Sholto paused, one foot raised, but then continued, hoping no one had noticed him miss a step. How had Marcus known about the photographs of Dublin? Obviously someone had told him, but whom? While there'd been no way of concealing the helicopter's departure, and while its mission was hardly top secret, that it had gone south from Dundalk to Dublin hadn't been widely shared. The consensus was that by leaving Marcus on the loose, they would know from what direction danger came. The sabotage had proved that hypothesis wrong. As Sholto reached the far edge of the crowd, Callie limped out from the shadow of a loading bay door and fell into step next to him. Welcome back, she said gruffly. Thanks. Has much changed in the last few hours? The smells got worse, she said. Otherwise, no. Were you watching Marcus? Sholto asked. Not really. Callie said, there are two marines doing that. Don't look up, she added. The admiral's positioned them on the roofs. At least, I think that's where they are. I'm the decoy. There was bitterness in her voice. Gone was the exuberant young woman whom Bill and Kim had first met on the island's west coast. Partly, that was her slow recovery from a bullet wound taken not four miles from the harbour. Partly, it was the same malaise affecting all of the survivors. Only on reaching Belfast had people realized quite how much had been lost with Anglesey's collapse. That was coupled with the knowledge that things would surely get worse before they got better, and an awareness that life might never get better than this. The other cause of Callie's grim humor was far more mundane. She was one of three teenagers from the same school who'd escaped Belfast. Until she was shot, Callie, Dean, and Lena had been a trio. In the weeks while Callie was recovering, Dean and Lena had very emphatically become a couple. What was Dublin like? Callie asked. Here, you can take a look for yourself. Sholto gave her the cameras. While he'd been speaking to Kim and Mary and Dundalk, the helicopter had continued south, taking photographs and video footage of Dublin. During the early days of the outbreak, before the nuclear war began, Military units from across Europe had taken refuge in Dublin. Leon and his contingent of French special forces were among their number. They'd held the airport for as long as they could before being forced to flee into the Irish interior, leaving behind all the equipment they couldn't carry. 
The hope was that their equipment and that of the other military units might still be in Dublin, specifically the ammunition. Privately, Shalto thought that it wasn't so much a hope, but an awareness that they wouldn't find such a cache of supplies anywhere else on the island of Ireland. The summary, Shalto continued, is that Bull Island is home to the undead, and the Howth Peninsula isn't much better. A fire ripped through the city's southern suburbs, but the good news is that there are three potential landing sites for a helicopter. The southern suburbs? Do you mean Dremna, Harold's Cross, or Rathmines? Callie asked. I have no idea. I'm just repeating what the pilot told me, Shalto said. The airport is a mess, as are the roads near it, the waterfront too. The River Liffey is probably impassable, but there's a nearly intact bridge near where the university should have been. You mean Trinity's gone? The pilot thought so. Why? He asked. Oh, I had a cousin who... It doesn't matter. Do you think we'll find ammunition there? Possibly. From what Leon told us and from what the pilot saw, the main redoubt was near the airport, to the north of Dublin itself. A second had been established closer to the city, but to the north of the river, in a park of some kind. I'd say that's a good place to start looking. That's probably the botanical gardens, Callie said. So we are going to Dublin? Someone is, Shalto said. He said no more, because the Admiral should be the first person he told of their new plans. The command centre and administrative hub for their fragment of humanity had been established in a former parcel distribution warehouse. Thirty of the Admiral's most trusted recruits slept there, as did Sholto, Callie, and the Admiral herself. Colum and Siobhan alternated, one sleeping ashore, one on the container ship to John Cabot, where the three Irish children slept along with the community's other youngsters, the old, and those too sick to work. It was hard to say whether the children were safer there, and certainly they were no warmer. They had a few lights, thanks to the ship's batteries, but little by the way of heat. The shipping containers offered too little ventilation for open fires. Some, like Marcus, might view life aboard with envy, but it was only one step above squalor. However, if the undead overran the harbour, there wouldn't be a panicked search for the children for the inevitable deaths that would ensue. The reduction in personnel had freed up a dozen square feet in the warehouse, a few inches had been given over to netting and curtains, providing a modicum of privacy to the guards who spent their off-shift hours sleeping on the rows of camp beds. The rest of the newly freed space was occupied by the table and chair that had become their court, and it was currently in session. The presiding judge was Nicola Kennedy, a former solicitor and the brother of Leo Fenwick, one of the councillors elected on Anglesey. They'd appointed three judges on Anglesey, but the other two had died during the wreck in Dundalk. So far, there'd been no need for any more to be appointed. Is the Admiral home? Chalto asked the sentry. She's on an inspection tour, sir, the guard said. You should get started on those images, Chalto said to Callie. See if you can match the photographs to a map. I've only been to Dublin a few times, Callie said. That's more than me. Shalto said, Siobhan can help when she gets in, but make a start. The sooner we know where we're going, the sooner we can plan the expedition. It was a way of distracting her. From her expression, she guessed it. But he needed to speak to the Admiral before he told anyone else of the change in plans. While he waited, he listened to the brief trial. Johan Ranatin, Judge Kennedy said, the charge is drunk and disorderly. She glanced at the pages, then at the young woman standing between her and the prisoner. Ensign? The fresh-faced woman couldn't be a day over nineteen, or an inch over five foot. She was dressed in the same blue ski jacket and grey utility trousers as Sholto, the judge, and the other members of the Admiral's nascent army. But she'd managed to press razor-sharp creases into the cloth. Sholto felt shabby by comparison. Your Honour, the ensign said. The prisoner was part of a work gang gathering timbers from the houses in Duncairn Gardens. In the basement of a house, they found a crate of whiskey. They? Kennedy asked. There's only one name on the docket. Yes, ma'am. No, I mean... 
the ensign stumbled, closed her eyes, and began again. There were four of them. They began drinking while they were there. When they were discovered, the liquor was confiscated. When we returned, I told all four to go and sleep it off. Three did. The prisoner didn't. He'd brought a bottle back with him. He continued drinking out on the pier. It was then that he got in a fight with some of the fisher folk. Mrs. Christine Ping was pushed into the water. She was rescued by her fellows. Others subdued the suspect and called for the guard. And is Mrs. Ping okay? Judge Kennedy asked. She's fine, ma'am, but one fishing rod was broken and we lost the fish on the line. I see. I'm sorry, the prisoner began. I didn't mean to. Quiet in court, Kennedy snapped. You have two choices. The first is to dispute that description of events and stand trial, in which case you will be charged with the attempted murder of Mrs. Ping. That carries a maximum punishment of death, though the court would settle for exile. Alternatively, you can accept the account, plead guilty to drunk and disorderly, and accept two weeks' hard labor. Now you can speak. I... I accept. Guilty. And can I just say, no, you can't, Kennedy said. Next! Cholto felt a tug at his arm. It was Leo Fennick. Five foot six and only in his mid-forties, the stress of the last few weeks had added deep lines to his face. Like most in Belfast, he'd shaved his head, and while that masked his receding hairline, it only aided in prematurely aging his appearance. Like almost everyone else in the command center, he wore the blue and gray uniform, but his stance was anything but martial. The counselor nodded towards the far corner of the room. Sholto followed him over. Was your sister always like that? Sholto asked. She was worse before she was married, Fenwick said, and then seemed to realize what he'd said. Her approach is for the best, I think. Don't you? I'm impressed, if anything. Sholto said. How many are on today's docket? There are two more, Benick said. A divorce and a petty thief who needs the services of a psychiatrist more than a judge. What news from Dundalk? Not much, Sholto said, thinking furiously. Benick was on the council. They've not got around to writing a constitution, but a strong argument could be made that in Mary's absence, he was in charge in Belfast. The reality that even Fenwick would admit was that the Admiral was in charge, with Sholto, as always, existing somewhere to one side. There has to be some news, Fenwick said. They're low on ammunition and food, Sholto said, opting for the truth, but a slow version of it, in the hope the Admiral would return before he reached any parts he'd have to omit. And they had an accidental death last night, otherwise they haven't lost anyone since the crash. Does that count as good news? It's so hard to say, isn't it? And when will they leave? A good question, Sholto said, and one to which he could give an honest answer. The new world is ready for them to embark, but at present they don't have any way to board the ship. They're looking for a suitable place of embarkation along the seafront today. I figure it'll take most of tomorrow to move people and gear to the shore. I'd say forty-eight hours before they're all aboard? That's at the earliest, weather and the undead could delay them. I see. Not sooner than that. And when is the latest? How long will it be before the new world arrives here? Before Sholto had to lie, a hush swept through the room. It began at the door as the sentries snapped to attention, then spread to a quartet of off-duty soldiers playing cards in the corner, then to Judge Kennedy. Slightly more slowly, the hush reached the bickering couple arguing over why they shouldn't get divorced. Soon, the only sound was a chainsaw snore coming from Private Petrelli, asleep on his bunk. Carry on, Admiral Janet Gunderson said from the doorway. Lieutenant John Whitley was at her side. Mr. Shalto, the Admiral continued, heading over to him. I heard the helicopter's return. I trust you bring good news. I'd say it was considerably complex, Sholto said, using the previously agreed form of words that the lack of privacy in the close confines of the harbor made a necessity. The Admiral nodded. 
Mr. Frederick, how is the economic policy developing? The, uh, do you mean trade? Fennick replied. It can't begin until we have a currency, the Admiral said, and we can't have one that's easily forged. Encourage trade, and we encourage self-reliance. Do that, and we've solved half our problems. I, I have a few ideas, Fennick said. Are they ready to be implemented? Not yet. The Admiral raised an eyebrow. Yes, Fennick said. Yes, of course, I'll get, get back to work. That is. He hurried off, and Sholto followed the Admiral to the office. In the corner of the warehouse were two shipping containers, stacked one on top of the other. Windows had been installed during the building's previous incarnation, so that management could watch labor. The Admiral had installed curtains, so that enlisted couldn't so easily spy on leadership. But the doors and walls were thin, so Shalto kept his voice low. Currency? He didn't mention that this morning, he said. It's not entirely make-work, the Admiral said, as she removed her coat and handed it to the lieutenant. Some of our newer recruits were caught trading items they found in the city, tablets and phones for the most part, some books and... and what else, John? Four tablets, twelve phones, twenty-three paperbacks, headphones, an old oil lantern, shoelaces, and a hypoallergenic pillow, Whitley said. The pillow was what tipped off the sergeant. They'd collected the loot while searching houses for the undead prior to the firewood gangs going in to rip up the floorboards. We don't have a law against responsible scavenging, Shalto said. In fact, I'd say we encourage it. Sailors burdening themselves down with unnecessary trinkets reduces their readiness, Whitley said. Perhaps, the Admiral said, but the real issue is that those items were looted to order. They were trading them for cleaning and sewing, and, well, I shall take their word that was all it was for. Trade will happen, it will always happen, and if we don't control it, someone will sell bullets for fish. Hence Mr. Fennec's task, to find us something we can use as a currency. And it does keep him out of the way, Whitley said. He hung the Admiral's overcoat, and then his own. Where he wore the blue and grey uniform, she was dressed in a navy blue suit with gold braid on the sleeves. The suit had come from a department store, the braid from a costume shop, but it passed muster in their increasingly makeshift world. The Admiral sat in her brown leather recliner. Whitley took his chair on the immaculately ordered side of the two desks. Sholto took Callie's chair on the far messier side. What news from Dundalk? the Admiral asked. What do you have to share you didn't want Mr. Fennick to hear? That's nothing good, but nothing too bad, Sholto said. But it is news, or a change of direction coming straight from our elected mayor. Things haven't turned out as any of us planned, or hoped, for that matter. Perhaps too many of our dreams were fantasies that we clung to for too long. What's the edict from Mrs. O'Leary? Whitley asked. I'll get to that. Shelto said. First, I think it's time we put our cards on the table. Cleared the air, so to speak. I'd more or less made up my mind before I arrived here in Belfast. After that debacle on the motorway, I confirmed it. I plan to return to Anglesey, take the plane and Saraka Lock, and fly to the U.S. I'm still uncertain whether Campton had an underground storehouse there, though Locke claimed to know the location of one. As to whether it contains more supplies than were in Birmingham or Elysium, I have no idea. I was still working through the hows and whys of implementing the plan when we were forced to abandon Anglesey. I wasn't intending to fly into the unknown on some harebrained suicide mission. That doesn't change the fact that I wanted to take the plane and use that and the satellites to force everyone's hands. I dare say, on balance, you and your people wouldn't have minded bringing a ship across the Atlantic. But I would have taken that decision from you, from Mary, from the Council. I... I see, the Admiral said. Do you know where this underground warehouse is? Nope, and there is a chance it doesn't exist, or that it's already been emptied, or that it's occupied by Kempton's people. People like that woman who shot Callie. And if you found them there? Whitley asked. As I say, 
I hadn't worked out all the details, but we do still have a submarine with its nuclear warheads. I figure one of those missiles would have taken care of them. We'd have to figure out a way of firing them without satellite guidance, but if all else failed, I reckon we could tie the targeting to a signal from a sat phone. You'd call in a nuclear strike on your own head? Whitley asked. Yep, Shalto said. If that's what it took... No amount of canned food is worth handing over the future of our species to someone like Kempton. Look, when I left America, I had no great hope of finding my brother. I hadn't much more of even reaching Britain. But when I allowed myself to dream, to envelop myself in some future fantasy, because I had nothing else with which to keep myself warm, I pictured us on a farm amid the sage, in a world free of the undead. What was clear after I reached Britain, after we reached Anglesey, was that a future for the children would take more effort than Bill, Kim, and I could provide. It'll take more than a village, but that's about all we have left. Regardless of the consequences to me, regardless of what sacrifice I had to make, I was ready to force everyone's hand. But before I could, we had to abandon Anglesey. The plane's been lost, and with it my plans. Nevertheless, that was what I planned. Those are my cards. So what are yours? What do you mean? Whitley asked. The sabotage changed everything, Shalto said. It can't change the fact that Heather Jones took her fishing fleet to Elysium, not to here. We had nothing to do with that, Whitley said. John, no, he has a point, the Admiral said. Besides, he wouldn't have asked if he didn't know the answer. Yes, Mr. Shalto, you are correct. We had a plan of our own. It is essentially the same as yours, though different in the manner in which it was to be implemented. Like yours, it was lost with the plane. From the moment we stepped off the Harper's Ferry and onto Hollyhead's damp shore, it was obvious that there was nothing holding the people of Anglesey together. There was no great victory, no passion for country, no love for one another. Events proved me right. Too many still wanted glory, fame, or recognition as evidenced by the sheer number of people that put their names forward in that election. And too many desired power, as proven by the acts of John Bishop and Rachel Gottlieb. On Anglesey, where we had little but immediate security, too many were willing to take rather than make. Too many others were willing to sail into the unknown rather than stay and face uncertain dangers with us. And your plan? Shalto asked. To strip Elysium of the turbines and solar panels, take those to an island off the Irish west coast. That would become our base on this side of the Atlantic, while I took my people back home. We'd have found a secluded bay if not a serviceable harbor, and there we would have made landfall. Heather Jones and her people will be able to forge a rough life subsisting on fish while the Harpers Ferry was repaired. By March, it would have been able to cross the Atlantic with all who wanted to come. All? Shalto asked. We'd make as many trips as necessary. But only departing from your small island, it would be a self-selecting group. No one would be forced to join us, the Admiral said, but we wouldn't leave anyone behind. All who wish to join us will be welcomed. Not everyone would want to come with us or go to America. I thought that some, many, might remain in Belfast, and in a place we'd done as much as we could to make livable. And those who left would do so wearing your uniform? He asked. I'd say a good dose of military discipline is precisely what's needed, Whitley said. Shalto shrugged. Maybe... That's more or less what we thought, more or less what we feared, and more or less what you were trying to engineer with a hasty flight across the Atlantic, the Admiral said. Not intentionally, but yes. I can see how that would be the logical outcome, Shalto said. His plans, though, were partly a reaction against those of the Admirals that he, Bill, and Kim had discovered while on Anglesey. Ah, but those plans have truly gone awry. He continued aloud. I have to say, though, I'm surprised Heather Jones was willing to leave Wales behind. 
She can't return to Anglesey now that the reactor has begun to leak. Whitley said, not in her lifetime. It's leaking? I didn't get that report. Chief Watts is off the coast of Anglesey with Sophia Augusto, the Admiral said. They called in while you were in Dundalk. Ah. Uh. Chalto had deliberately made it difficult for people to communicate with the sat phones, forcing all calls to come through a central switchboard. That had been an attempt to control the means of communication, and thus the destiny of the survivors. A futile attempt, as it had turned out. You and I aren't the only ones who had plans and schemes, he added. You know, Scott Hexen wanted to fly back to Australia. If we'd managed to bring the plane here, I think he'd have taken it within a week. And we've had to stop two attempts to seize the Amundsen and sail her west, the Admiral said. You mean your crew mutinied? Shalto asked. No, Whitley said. It was a difference of opinion over the continued integrity of the chain of command. Shalto passed that and decided it amounted to the same thing. If that was the fiction they'd concocted to avoid having to punish their crew, then that was their business. What was his business, and that of everyone else, was that the mutiny had not been discussed. There have been too many secrets, haven't there? He said. Well, that brings us to Don Dock. Mary's made an executive decision. The broad strokes are that she's staying in Don Dock, as are the survivors of the wreck. They have found some food in the city, not much, maybe enough for a meal or two. Critically, they've managed to salvage some grain from the wreck. Since there's no room on the New World to bring both grain and people back here, they'll stay until it's gone, or they're forced to abandon it. When they leave, they'll head south to Dublin and then to France to find larger ships on which we can all live. Cruise ships, freighters, an oil tanker, whatever the satellites can find around the coast of France or in the Mediterranean. Having found the ships, we'll bring the vessels here and board everyone. We'll all live on ships, offshore, and follow the coast from town to town, taking what we need until the undead are finally gone. We can't dig fields in this weather, and we both know that we can't farm while the undead are still an ever-present threat. Let's leave the land behind until it's safe once more. I see, the Admiral said slowly, and off which coast will we be living? America, if you like, Shalto said, but we need to look closer than that for the ships. We've searched most of Ireland since the Royal Navy sank all shipping that strayed in the British waters. We know we won't find vessels around that coast. Those ships that didn't form part of Sophia's flotilla had to have gone somewhere. If not Ireland or Britain, it has to be Europe. The Mediterranean is an obvious place to start. Except you want to stop with the French coast, Whitley said. What do you mean is that you're sending the New World to look for your brother? This is Mary's plan, not mine, Shalto said, and her plan is to go to where she finds the ships— as for Bill, yeah, I want to find him, but Leon is closer to the French coast than we are. Nilda will want to find Chester as much as I want to find my brother. For now, I'm leaving that task to them. I see, the Admiral said. She glanced at the door, then at the lieutenant. Living aboard ships. What do you think, John? Where to begin? Whitley said. The obvious problem is fuel. The waters around Svalbard are becoming treacherous. It'll worsen as winter begins. We'll have to run the Amundsen as a fuel tanker, a task for which it was not designed, and for which we don't have the time to refit her. However, without fuel, regardless of how luxurious the ships we find, there'll be no power to recharge the batteries. That means no lights, no desalinization, and no power to the freezers. We can talk about grain and dream about sailing into a port and finding a warehouse full of canned corn— but the reality is that we'll be eating fish. You can't cast a line from the decks of a moving freighter or throw out a net during a storm. We'll have to stop, deploy boats, and fill freezers whenever we can. We've got to find the freezers first, and then use electricity and sow fuel to keep them running. In turn, that means more trips for the Amundsen deep into the ice, and there are risks for that voyage, 
even for an icebreaker. Then we'll look for an oil tanker, Shalto said. We'll bring the fuel with us. Which brings us to the second problem, Whitley said, finding ships that are seaworthy. Anything that's been untenant for months yet is still afloat will be like the John Cabot, and that leaked like a journalist on jury duty. We had an entire harbor to scavenge parts for the repairs, and what we achieved was little better than a welding job. If this plan is to work, we'll need vessels like the Harper's Ferry, but she needs another three months of repairs, and that's a ship we know inside and out. We might find a few floating hulls, some that might even get us across the Atlantic. But what if the repairs don't hold? We might reach America, only to be forced to abandon our ships at the first secluded bay we reach. So we find ships that we don't have to abandon, Sholto said. Easy to say, Whitley said. There is no harm in searching for ships, the Admiral said, though I think we should still consider an island off Connemara as an alternative, at least for the immediate future. That being said, announcing that we intend to cross the Atlantic will quell the... the discontent in the ranks. It will also reduce the uncertainty among the civilians, which is currently finding an outlet in fear and violence. Either way, Connemara or America are our two choices. There's no alternative. If we can find the ships, Whitley said. Chapter 2 Surveillance, Belfast Harbour That's it? Callie asked, her voice dripping with youthful disbelief. That's all you have to do to move the satellites? I guess so, Shelto said, though I can't say I find it easy thinking in three dimensions. And here was me thinking we all moved in three dimensions, Colum said. Sure, there might be a hill to climb or valley to descend. Shelto said, but really it comes down to left and right, back and forth. With the satellites, you've got to consider its position relative to the Earth, the curvature of the atmosphere, and hence the angle of the flight path to maintain a stable orbit. But the software does those calculations for you, Callie said. The satellites had belonged to Lisa Kempton, part of a secure communication service she offered to other members of the wealthy elite. And it had been secure, from everyone but her. Sholto had gained access by having Kempton's company hire a hacker who was in his debt. She'd provided him with access and designed the point-and-click interface before she disappeared. She wasn't dead, rather she hadn't died before the outbreak. Now, it was best not to think about it. He turned to Colin. Do you have enough images of Dublin? I think so, the boxer said. He glanced at the map, then back at the laptop. There's still a fair bit of cloud, but uh, we've got the photographs from the helicopter. They'll suffice until the weather changes. We should get Reg Kaffney to help us pinpoint what we're looking at. He spent some time in Dublin, on the stage. In a theatre? Sholto asked. Stand up, Colum said. You should hear us joke about a farmer and a giraffe. So can I move it? Kelly asked. Off you go. Sholto said. He stepped back, not wanting to crowd the woman. This particular satellite wasn't being moved to France. They needed to keep one over Ireland so that the communities in Elysium, Dundalk and Belfast could stay in contact. At present, however, the line was intermittent. Dundalk was coming through without interference, but calls with Elysium kept dropping out. It was possible that the storm had interfered with a signal though that didn't explain why they could hear Chief Watt's gruff voice clearly enough. Moving the satellite a few miles would either solve the problem or give them a better idea where the issue lay. The second satellite was northwest of London, following the Horde, as it approached the capital where Nilda and George were still awaiting the arrival of Leon and his ships. The third was over clouds, beneath which, hopefully, was France. Moving the Dublin satellite southwest was a test. If Callie could manage that and pinpoint the position afterward, then she could be let loose on a satellite over France, where there was an even greater ambiguity as to its position. There, done, Callie said. Ah, oh, that's cool. There's snow there, on that hill, but not on the southern slopes. 
Perhaps that means the storm has blown itself out, Colum said. Right. I know where that is. Do you? Callie picked up a map and compared it to the expanse of water that took up the left-hand side of the screen. Loch Derg, I think. Yeah, I'd say so. Call Elysium. See what the quality of the line is like, Sholto said. The line's still bad, Callie said when she'd finished the brief radio check. I can barely hear Captain Devine. And it's not the line, Sholto said. Either it's the satellite or the sat phones, or it's sunspots for all we know. There's nothing we can do about it. Except use the satellites while we can, Callie said. Point taken, Sholto said. He pointed to one of the other three laptops. The internal memory is capped at a little under 500 gigabytes. It'll overwrite old images, so make sure you keep copying them onto an external drive. Follow the coast southward until you find a large ship, take the pictures, then... that come and find you or John. Got it, Callie said. And keep an eye out for smoke or fire or paint, Shalto said. Bill knows we got the satellites and knows we'll be looking for him. He'll head to the coast and signal us. He forbore to give any more advice. I'll go and check on the receiver. Perhaps that's where the problem lies. He left the cabin, went outside, and crossed to the ladder that led up to the warehouse's roof. He wasn't the only person to have sought sanctuary up there. Siobhan was leaning against the extractor vent. Looking for solitude? He asked. I was watching the crowds, she said. You can tell a lot by where they form and where they disperse. You've moved the satellites, then. Callie's doing it now, he said. The search for Bill is on hold. Was France still covered in clouds? She asked. Pretty much. Assuming that it was France and not Belgium. Either way, with so much cloud, it'll take time just to find the coast, let alone the plain. In some ways, in many ways, it doesn't matter. Leon and Nilda will get to France first. If the clouds don't clear, they're more likely to find some ships before our satellites do. Either way, until they've been aboard, confirmed the hulls are intact and the engines work, any pictures we gather will do nothing more than reassure. Sometimes reassurance is all people need, Siobhan said. Is there still no word from your brother? Not since the last call, when they were twenty miles from the coast. If he was able to call, he'd have done it by now. How much fuel did they have? Siobhan asked. Full tank, I think. Enough for a few thousand miles, Siobhan said. Then that's the reason we've not heard from them. They would have kept flying until they saw somewhere they could land, and by then they were out of range of the satellites. Sure, maybe, Sholto said. There was a far more obvious explanation, but he was trying not to dwell on it. The cloud would clear over the next few days. Once they'd found a ship, there would be ample time to move all the satellites over France and even beyond. They'd find the crashed plane and then... But again, he didn't want to think about it. Your brother's a survivor, Siobhan said. He'll be fine. It's us I'm worried about, or the people out there. I don't know how they'll receive the news they're leaving, and so soon after they've arrived. Over this last year, I really thought things would become simpler when we found other people, if we found them. Instead, life has become as complex as it ever was. Does Callie seem happier, do you think? Teenagers aren't my area of expertise, he said, nor are matters of the heart but I do know that unrequited love is a problem only time can solve. What are you watching? Over here, nothing, Siobhan said. The sight to be seen is on the other side of the roof, which is why I'm here and the camera's over there. She held up her hand. In her palm was a small screen. There's a warehouse to the southeast in which Marcus has made his home. It's the one with the red trim beneath the gutter. Don't look. There's a woman who spends a lot of time on the roof. I don't think she's a lookout, but I can't be certain, hence the camera and screen. How many supporters does Marcus have? Sholto asked. I'm not sure. The camera has a better view of the road outside this warehouse than it does of theirs, but it's the only vantage point I can easily get to without revealing what I'm doing. Around ninety people still live in the warehouse, but another hundred have moved out in the last twenty-four hours. 
No one will say precisely why they left, except to say they don't want to be around Marcus. What does that tell you about the ninety who stayed? You think he's trying to build up a new supporter base? Maybe, she said, or someone in that warehouse is. But that confirms he wasn't involved in the sabotage. Based on what Chief Watts found at the water treatment plant, at least four people were involved in that particular piece of sabotage, not counting any lookouts. In my view, they sabotaged the plane and ship first, because they had to know that a drop in the level of water coming from the treatment plant to the power station would be noticed almost immediately. And they had to be aware that as soon as that drop was noticed, the damage to the plant would be discovered, the exodus would begin, and there would be too many people boarding the ships for any further destruction to take place. They had to have been planning this for weeks, if not months. As such, they knew Scott Hickson liked to tinker with his plane, and Commander Crawley conducted a weekly inspection of the grain carrier's engines. That means that the sabotage took place between 12 and 36 hours before the treatment plant was damaged. In total, including lookouts, we're looking for a group of between 6 and 15 people. That's all? Not 90, then. If that many were involved, it'd be a devil to keep it secret, Siobhan said. It's not so much the risk of one of them confessing as other people noticing that an acquaintance is unusually tired, keeps disappearing, or is acting strangely. That's how we usually crack crimes like this. It's terrorism, essentially, and that's the toolbox I'm using. I'll solve this with tip-offs and intelligence. What's slowing me down is that I've been inundated with theories as to who the saboteurs might be. Marcus is at the top of the list, but nearly everyone has been implicated by someone. On balance, there's nothing usable in these rumours. It's just the usual mix of resentment and fear. But it does confirm we're after a small group. But it is a group, and they are organised. Since Marcus arrived here without a friend to his name, I think we can discount him. But you're still watching him. The people who gravitate to him are the kind who might get recruited by a real enemy. A new recruit is often the weakest link when it comes to infiltrating a gang, she sighed. That is partly for Marcus's own safety. Distress has set in, and is beginning to fester. The one thing we all know is that the saboteurs were on Anglesey just before the exodus, and they had to have arrived in one of the grain carriers. He's an obvious suspect, and an obvious target for distrust that could turn to violence. The last thing I need is to have to investigate a murder as well. I heard an odd thing this morning, Shelto said. Not connected, mind you. Not exactly. While waiting for the helicopter to be prepped, I took a stroll along the sea wall. People were discussing Elysium and talking as if it were, well, as if it were paradise. I don't think anyone truly knew how much they were giving up when they left Anglesey. But I don't think many of them realized that all they had is now gone for good. Callum's doing his best, Siobhan said, walking the alleys, touring the fires, talking, telling stories of Ireland and the legends of Finn McCool. He's well practiced at it. The routine is one he plied while they were trekking through hell during the long past year. It's something he learned at his gym, but there he had a social and judicial framework supporting him. Stories will only get us so far, and they'll only keep us together for so long. We need to give people hope. We need those ships. And we need to find the saboteurs, Shalto said. There are no other clues as to their identity. Most of our evidence is on an island that's swiftly becoming radioactive, she said. We can't examine the plane, so we can only speculate as to what malfunctioned. Chief Watts examined the water treatment plant, but he was looking for a way to repair it, not for clues as to who'd caused the damage. He has help, though. We're looking for people with an engineering background. From what happened to the ship, we're looking for someone with more than basic programming skills. That doesn't really narrow things down. Not really. Not since we don't know who had those skills to start with. The chief volunteered to don a radiation suit and go back into the plant to collect fingerprints. I'm so desperate I almost said yes. But even if we were to find a set that weren't his, or belonging to one of his people, would it really help? Just picture it, lining everyone up, taking their prints. Imagine the mob waiting for the guilty to be found. 
Any suspects would be torn apart. And what if our findings were inconclusive? What then, hmm? No, we need proper evidence, concrete evidence. Would we find it on the wreck and then dock? Shalto asked. We don't know where the plane is, and we can't get back to Anglesey, but we can get to the wreck. Again, it's unlikely we'll find anything, Siobhan said. She glanced again at the screen in her hand. But it's better than doing nothing. Do you think they could fly me there today? I didn't mean you should go. Can't you tell Kim what to look for? Says the man who went there himself this morning. Siobhan said, No, I'll go. I'm the police officer, and this is my case and my responsibility. I'll call Dundalk, he said. We best check it's safe for the helicopter to land before you depart. But when he placed the call, he found that Kim wasn't at the college. Chapter 3 Silt and Tide Red Barns Road, Dundalk Shh, listen, Kim whispered. Half the twenty-person patrol went silent. The other half hadn't heard her. They continued their circular conversation about how long the ice would take to melt, and when or whether there would be another snowfall. Watch the left, Bran hissed, his voice low but loud enough to carry. The talking ceased, but again only half obeyed the command. The other half, the half that had been chattering, the half that Kim thought of as the green recruits, swung eyes and rifles every which way except the direction from which the sound had come. Kim tried to ignore the distraction, as she concentrated on the uneven row of trees at the side of the small house. Then came another soft clump, and then a sharp squeak. This time she saw the snow tumble from the tree's branch and land on the child's swing, which shuddered and twisted with the impact. We're fine, she said. It's just snow melting. Dee Dee? Bran asked. Clear ahead, the tall woman said. Dee Dee was a member of the collective of coders who had ensconced themselves in the knocked-through terrace on Anglesey, in which Kim had lived with Bill and the girls. She raised her hand to adjust the taped-together spectacles on her face, then to adjust her recently knitted blue and orange hat. Yep, yeah, clear. The right, Joan? Bran asked. No, um, no, I can't see anything. I think we're okay, the woman said hesitantly. She took her left hand from her rifle and ran her thumb along the pair of wedding bands on her ring finger. The gun's barrel fell, and she hastily re-gripped the stock. Aside from a brief lesson that morning, this was Joan Goldacre's first time holding a rifle. They didn't have spare ammunition to practice, or time for training, but nor did they have sufficient personnel to leave combat to those with experience. Then, since we've stopped, and aren't in imminent danger— this is the perfect time to check our position, Bran said. Go on maps, he added. You too, Kim said to Annette. But I know exactly where we are, Annette said, a little too loudly. Kim noted a few exasperated looks thrown Annette's way. The girl didn't, but sighed as she fumbled to extract the map with her thick gloves. At least Annette and Daisy were the only children among those who'd found themselves stranded in Dundalk. The members of the shipwreck were a self-selecting group. Rather, they were those who'd not selected a more proactive life while on Anglesey. The restless survivors, who'd seen too much horror to find respite among the Welsh island's small villages, had joined the groups sent to Belfast or Elysium, or had gone to Menai Bridge and become part of Heather Jones's expedition to Kenmare Bay. Those who'd remained, and who'd been crammed onto the grain ships, were those who'd chosen to cling to the comfort of electricity until the last possible moment. Another clump of snow fell. Kim had her rifle raised to a forty-five-degree angle before her hands caught up with her brain. She wasn't the only one to make such a move. Three rifles bobbed back and forth, their barrels aimed at the trees. It's just snow, Kim said before anyone else became distracted though snow falling from a branch does sound just like a zombie's dragging footstep. Bran, she noted, hadn't moved an inch. There was another soft crunch as an overloaded branch dropped its icy burden onto the snow below. 
It's melting, isn't it? Annette said. Yes, it is, Kim said. Is that a good thing? Annette asked. I don't know. Thanks to nearly a year trudging the undead wastes of England, Wales and Ireland, Kim knew how to gauge whether a house might contain supplies or the undead. The snow and ice changed everything, turning the frozen world into an utterly alien landscape. So, where are we? Bran asked the group at large. Paper rustled and feet shuffled, crunching on snow as bowed heads peered at maps. Kim found herself smiling. Most of the group were older than her, but visible between every pulled-up scarf and pulled-low hat was the familiar frown of an unconfident student hoping not to be picked. Except for Annette, who wore a wide grin as she tapped her gloved hand against their position on her own map. John, Bran prompted. We're on Red Barnes Road, the woman said, though it was as much a question as a statement. But where? Bran asked. How far have we travelled? Remember what I said about using duration to calculate distance and using the compass to monitor our bearing. Right, sure, Joan said. She turned back to the map. Round about, Annette muttered. Round about, round about. Shh, Kim said, not wanting the girl to embarrass the woman. About a hundred metres from Shore Road, Joan finally said, from where it cuts to the east and so to the sea. Good, Bran said. When you plan a route, make a note of the features you should pass, but remember that they might have been destroyed. Signs might have been knocked down, or long since removed, bridges might collapse, but rivers will still flow to the sea. Roads might be potholed, covered in snow and grime, but they'll still be there. So, will roundabouts, he added, looking at Annette. We've another three hundred metres north, then two hundred due east, and we'll get to Soldier's Point. How long will that take? Five minutes, Joan said. More like twelve the speed we've been going. Bran said, but close enough. Dee Dee, Ken, take point. Bran took up position behind the lead pair. Kim let everyone else continue before she fell in at the rear, Annette at her side. Maybe the sailors from the New World are wrong, Annette said, and we can get everyone aboard at Soldier's Point. They sailed the ship from the Shannon Estuary, Kim said. They know what they're doing, so we should trust them and we have to trust them when they say that the bay is too shallow to bring the ship in much further. But they only made one very brief trip to explore, Annette said. Even so, they wouldn't have missed a pier, Kim said. She rolled her sleeve up and her glove down so she could check the time. The cold air bit deep into exposed flesh, but a working watch was too much a rarity to risk leaving it exposed to the elements. It was three hours since Sholto had returned to Belfast with a change in plans. When they left Dundalk, they wouldn't go north. They would go south, perhaps to Dublin, but ultimately to France, where they would collect Bill. They would. And then they would go somewhere warm, somewhere they didn't have to wear a week's worth of clothes just to avoid frostbite. They would live aboard ships, sailing from place to place, taking what they needed, fishing, looting, scavenging, until they found a livable island or the undead finally died. That decision had not yet been widely shared among those in Dundalk. Regardless of where they went next, first they had to find a way to board the new world. So, if we can't get the ship close to the shore, we'll have to use the lifeboats to board it, Annette said. The lifeboats and their sailing ship... Kim said. Apparently that yacht was designed for the cross-Atlantic race. Oh, what was its name? Dunno, Annette said, with her usual disinterest in an irrelevant part of the old world. She pulled out her map. When we get to Soldier's Point, we'll follow this coastal road into Dundalk, cross the motorway bridge, and then follow the road up and down and back and forth until we get to Belurgan Point on the opposite side of the bay. It's only five kilometres, but at this rate it'll be night before we get back. We'll return to the college just in time for dinner, but too late to do any cooking, Kim said. That's the perfect time to return, 
Now put the map away and keep an eye on the buildings. We want a, a warehouse or something. I know, Annette interrupted, because we've got to carry the grain there first, which will take at least an hour. But I think it'll be at least two if we're only walking this fast. Then we've got to get it onto the ship, which will take all day. I mean, there's nearly eight hundred of us. How many can we fit on a yacht? We'll have to feed everyone and sleep on shore overnight. That means we've got to secure the warehouse or wherever. That's more time wasted. So it'll probably take us two days. It was a lot easier when it was just you, me, Daisy, Bill, and Sholto. It was different, Kim said. Not easier. What if Rahinda gets the turbine working? Will we still leave the college? If he can get it to work, we'll decide then, Kim said. While electric lights and electric heaters would be welcome, she wasn't sure they were worth the risk. If they had electricity, they would be inclined to remain in the college, but the campus buildings were separated from one another by too much open space to be easily defended. No, what she really wanted was to board the ship and set sail for France to find Bill, and and that was where her mind usually went to. An image of a farmhouse surrounded by rolling fields of wheat. Now it went blank. If he'd survived the crash, he'd be fine, and he would have survived the crash. He would. Even if we found a jetty long enough, you know what we've forgotten? Annette asked. What? A gangplank to get onto the ship. Annette said. Does the New World have one? I suppose it won't be too hard to build. With what tools? Kim asked, "We haven't got those either. It's a good point, though. Our minds are still stuck on Anglesey. Over these next few days, we need to develop a new way of thinking. Some people will need longer than that," Annette said. She pointed ten meters ahead to where Perry Monkton paused to brush snow from the petals of a fragile yellow flower growing in the lee of a wide hedge. Twenty meters beyond Monkton. At the far end of the dark-leaved hedge, Ken swung his rifle to the left. Everyone halted, but Bran waved them on. Ken had stopped just past a terracotta-roofed bungalow ringed by a five-brick-high yellow wall. The front garden had space for two cars, two trees, and one bench positioned to the right of the closed front door. Separating that from its neighbor was a towering hedge, still evergreen and flourishing. Which ran the length of the boundary line. At the front of the property, the trees ran behind a thick stone wall until they reached a pair of eight-foot-wide white-painted gates. The gates were six feet high at the gate posts, but arched upwards to a height of twelve feet in the middle. Of all things, it reminded Kim of an image of the pearly gates in that sitcom about the afterlife. Then she saw the crest worked into the centre of the gate. Who in Ireland would display a coat of arms? She was about to ask the group at large when she saw what had caused Ken to stop. In the snow leading between the open gates and up the driveway was a set of dragging footprints. Zombie, Ken said. Well, which way was it going? Bran said, his tone utterly calm. The deepest part of the print indicates where the most pressure was applied. That gives us its direction. It went that way, up the drive, Annette said before anyone else had a chance to think, let alone answer. I suppose we can't just pull the gates closed and leave it there, Joan said. Not a chance, Bran said. Why does Zombie go up there? Annette asked. You don't think that some of those Irish survivors are still here? I doubt it, Kim said. But we'll investigate. Dee Dee, you're with me. We'll be five minutes. Leaving Bran to guard the road, Kim walked up the path. She heard footsteps in the snow behind, turned, and saw that Annette was following as well. There were a million things she wanted to say, but they were long past the time when she was able to keep the girl out of danger. Your safety is on, she said instead. Beyond the gates was a wide expanse of snow, beneath which she assumed was a lawn. There were no sundials or benches, no flower beds or vegetable plots, no trellis or trees. There wasn't even a football net, though the space was large enough for a seven-a-side pitch. 
At the far end of the snow-covered lawn, the ground sloped upwards, ending in another tall hedge. But this one had an eight-foot gap in it, presumably for a car. The dragging footsteps led towards that gap. Can you see it? Kim whispered. No, but I can see a chimney, Dee Dee said. Can't see the roof, let alone a window. Weird. With the incline, they'd have a great view of the sea. Those are paw prints, Annette said. That's a cat. Kim looked down. She hadn't noticed them before, but there were paw prints mixed in with the dragging scuff marks. That explained what the zombie had followed. Annette had spoken too loudly. From behind the hedge came a crunch of snow and then a soft, gagging rasp. Here it comes, Dee Dee said as the creature lurched around the hedge. It was barely humanoid and more skeleton than person. Its head was missing ears, its face missing an eye, and its mouth was missing its lips. Its left arm was gone at the shoulder, its right absent below the elbow. Both its legs still ended in feet, but it moved as if they were tied together. A rib protruded from a chest covered in ragged strips of grey-green cloth. No, Kim corrected herself as the zombie shuffled another step nearer. It wasn't a rib. It was a shard of white plastic, and those weren't strips of cloth hanging from its chest, but ragged flaps of skin. Kim let her rifle fall to its sling and drew her machete. No point wasting a bullet. Keep watch, but I think it's alone. The zombie staggered another step, then attempted to throw itself forward at the prey which had so eagerly presented itself. It slipped on the ice and fell face first into the snow. Kim lowered her machete as the zombie's legs twitched, then shuddered. Then they went still. Did it just die? Annette asked. Maybe, Kim said. The zombie spasmed. Maybe not. She raised the machete as she trudged across the ten feet separating them and swung the blade down on its skull. Maybe the snow and ice will finish them off, Annette said. Maybe in a few weeks they'll all be gone. Remember what they said in Svalbard, Kim said, walking slowly up the path. But that was at the beginning of the outbreak, Annette said. I'm saying that this snowfall could be the last straw. And we can continue that debate when we're back inside, Kim said. But first, we've got to get to Soldier's Point. So let's check the creature was alone, then we can finish our day's work. Not until we found a cat, Annette said. It survived this long. It'll be fine, Kim said. It'll be feral, Dee Dee said. You don't like cats? Annette asked. I like domesticated cats just fine, Dee Dee said. The kind that welcome you home after a long and tedious day, even if it is just so you can fill their bowl. Those I like. The kind that spit and snarl and tread your favourite chair. Those I can do without. You speak from experience? Kim asked, as she wiped the machete clean on the snow, leaving behind a trail of black gore. When you left a cat in a friend's will, what can you do? Dee Dee said. She vanished three days after the outbreak. I wasted two more waiting for her to come back before I decided she stood a better chance of survival than I did. Oh, we can't leave her here, Annette said. Please, Kim. One minute to look for the cat, Kim said. No more. The hedgerow concealed a very old, small cottage. At least, that was her first impression. Then she realised how large the windows were, how the chimneys were topped with vents, and how the guttering was artfully concealed within the eaves. Some of the stone might have been reclaimed, or perhaps there'd been an ancient cottage on this plot. But this was an improved version of those basic homes of two centuries before. The door's open, Kim said. That's never a good sign. But there are no footprints in the snow, Dee Dee said. Not beyond the point that zombie reached. There are paw prints, Annette said and they're going inside. She hurried forward. Kim caught her arm. Wait, she said. Remember England? Never rush in. We can't leave the cat, Annette said. Not now. It's a survivor like us. We've got to help it. Knowing how stubborn Annette could be, it would be quicker to search inside than to argue. 
OK, fine, there's no car out here, no signs of a battle, no signs of bodies either. A bench faced the house, next to a trio of pots containing plants that must have died during the long, hot summer. In the corner was a six-foot-high plastic basketball hoop, almost lost in the hedge. Kim tapped her machete against the door. Above, she heard snow shifting on the roof. Was there a sound from inside? It was hard to tell. I'll go first, Dee Dee second. Annette, you're to watch the door. Shout if there's trouble. She went inside. The carpet was sodden from snow and turning green from where the autumn's rain had washed moss inside. That moss was making a bid for the walls, angling towards the gallery of photographs that almost completely obscured the paint underneath. I know this one, Dee Dee said. That's Frankenstein's revenge, and this is the mummy's return, the vampire of Paris. They're opening night photos. I've not heard of them, Annette said. They're old films, Dee Dee said. About forty years old, I think. That poster, Kim said, pointing at a framed print above an ancient rotary phone perched on an equally ancient teak and baize table. Do you see the gate? That's the same crest. As is on the gates outside, if the film's called Dracula's Children, then I suppose that's Dracula's Crest," Dee Dee said. "So I guess that makes this Dracula's summer cottage in." Kim sensed the movement before she saw it, and was already swinging the machete when a small ball of fur darted around the corner and through her legs. "Wait, come back!" Annette called as the cat dodged between her hands and darted out into the snow. Oh, it's gone! I told you," Kim said. "It survived this long. It'll be fine. The house belonged to an actor then. I don't think so," Dee Dee said. "There's an award here for cinematography. Someone who worked behind the lens, I think. You never think of." Kim stopped. She listened. She heard a sound again. It was soft, and it came from around the corner from which the cat had run. Wait here," she said. She could guess what she'd find. She stepped around the corner. Four doors led off the corridor. Three were anonymously blank. The fourth, at the far end, had a porcelain nameplate. Moira was picked out in pink, surrounded by a garland of hand-painted roses, over which stickers of footballs had been plastered. The scratching came from behind the door. What is it? Annette asked, "Watch the front door," Kim said. "Keep an eye open in case that cat returns." She tried the handle. The door had no lock, and it opened easily. Inside was a familiar smell of death and decay. She tried not to breathe. She tried not to take in the room: the soft, pink-painted walls covered in posters of footballers, the four-foot-high doll's house pushed into the corner. And which was being used as a prop to support a forest of hurleys and hockey sticks, the white princess bed frame, on the base of which was tied an island scarf, and to each corner was tied a limb of the undead girl. She snarled as Kim entered, struggling against the nylon ropes with which she was secured. She bucked as Kim sheathed her machete and raised her rifle. Kim fired. And、the girl went still. Clear, she called out. Then quickly checked the other doors leading off the corridor. She found the corpse in the room opposite. An old woman sat in a chair, an empty pill bottle on the table in front of her. What was it? Annette asked, as Kim returned to the entrance hall empty-handed. Nothing, just a zombie tied to a bed. Kim said. Oh. Yeah, I don't get why people did that," Annette said. Kim said nothing, but let Dee Dee take the lead as they headed back to the road. There were some things best not thought about, and some things once seen that were impossible to forget. Find anything? Bran asked. We almost caught the cat," Annette said, "but it got away. Did you see it? Anyone? It didn't come this way," Bran said. Never mind," Kim said. "Everyone ready? What's in the bags?" 
Everyone had brought an empty pack with them from the college in case they stumbled across anything worth scavenging. No one eluded the bungalow, Ken said. We found some spices and more tea and coffee, but the real treasure was a pack of biscuits, still sealed and only four months past the expiry date. They're edible? We don't know yet, Bran said, glancing at the group. I thought we'd keep them for lunch. Something to look forward to after we finish our tub of cold porridge. Kim eyed the bags. It was a small bungalow, and the bags appeared to be nearly full. They had to have collected other things as well. Clothes? Books? She shrugged. I told them they'll regret the extra wait in an hour, Bran said. Well, we should be on our way back by then, Kim said. Again, she fell in at the rear. She fixed her gaze on Joan's bag and her mind on the problem its contents represented. One hundred people were collecting grain from the wreck and were unlikely to return even with much of that. Eighty were gathering burnable furniture and wearable clothing from the homes near the college. A further hundred were searching the college buildings themselves, but they would find little to improve their personal existence. The others, about half, were breaking firewood, cooking food, gathering and boiling snowmelt, standing guard, building barricades out of cars and benches, or each of the other hundred mundane but essential tasks. They would have no chance to search for books or clean clothes, let alone the real treasure of a packet of biscuits. They'd all arrived in Dundalk with next to nothing, and would be leaving with little more. In the meantime, there had to be an equitable way of sharing what little they found. Mill would say that she was fighting against human nature. She tried to conjure his face, but she found her mind returning to that girl's bedroom in her grandparents' home. With it came a legion of questions, none of which would ever be answered. Next to her, Annette looked back the way they'd come. What is it? Kim asked. Nothing, Annette said. I was just looking for the cat. Chapter 4 The Point of Maps Soldier's Point, Dundalk Where's the bus stop? Annette said. Where's the road? Joan said. We are in the right place, aren't we? Of course we are. It's the map that's wrong, Kim said. To the east was the Irish Sea. To the west, and widening as it approached the city, was Dundalk Bay. To the north, and across four hundred metres of sea, was Belurgan Point on the Cooley Peninsula. Beyond that were the Cooley Mountains. Those features were marked on the map, but the cartographer had obviously embellished the page with fictional additions that didn't match their immediate surroundings. They'd found stacks of crude straight-line maps of the surrounding area behind the reception desk at the college. Those were intentionally inaccurate, designed to get students to download the college's map and fitness app, and so useless as anything but kindling. The maps they'd brought with them had been found in three sealed boxes in the graphics department. They looked every part the professional map, down to the topographical lines. Kim looked between map and the distant mountains, then back to the map. There's no way the Cooley Mountains are really two thousand meters high, she said. Told you, Ken said. You're calling it, then? Kim sighed. Fine, yes, you win. She took out a small slip of paper from her pocket and handed it over, an IOU for a chocolate bar as agreed. A few other slips of paper were handed back and forth. She'd suggested the bet on a whim after seeing Bran parade the group in the college's car park. The harmless wager made the expedition less martial, but now she wondered whether, if she was ever able to pay the debt, that would only exacerbate inequality. More immediately, on their side of the bay, the map claimed that Soldier's Point ended in a wide pier, approached by a wider road with an expansive car park and bus stop. That road then curved along the coast back into Dundalk. Despite the icy white blanket coating the surface, it was obvious they were standing on a footpath. There was no pier, either, just the last ten metres of a ruined steel jetty. The tide was out, and so the sea began a further twenty metres from the twisted remains of the jetty. 
There are bones, Ken said, peering down at the rocky shore. Human bones. No zombies, though. There isn't even a road, Annette said. The people on the ship should have said. Her eye was shared by most of the group. Eyes went from the narrow track to the wrecked jetty to the single-sailed boat riding the gentle waves a hundred metres out to sea. She couldn't see the new world, but it wouldn't be far away. I think they're fishing, Kim said. A fish supper. That's motivation for us to find somewhere they can dock, and they told us they couldn't do it here. They should be looking too, Joan said. Kim shrugged. These maps must have been a student project. Quite why they had so many printed is a mystery we don't need to solve. I'll add proper maps to our list, Annette said. She took out a small notebook and wrote it down. She was only recording the utter essentials, and she was already on the third page. Can we repair that jetty? Joan asked. Theoretically, yes, Ken said. The foundations are still there, embedded in the silt, and they're exposed at low tide. We just need some scaffolding and cement. A lot of scaffolding, Dee Dee said and we'll need to create a waterproof shield around the exposed foundations because even quick-drying cement won't set before the tide comes in. We don't have the cement, Ken said. Or the scaffolding, Dee Dee said. Fair point, Ken said. And there aren't any warehouses or other large buildings close enough to the water's edge, Bran added, bringing the debate to a close. There's nowhere for us to store the grain or to store ourselves while we build the jetty and board the ship. Those houses back there might do in a pinch, but we'd be splitting up into small groups at night, and that would create too large a perimeter, with too many people tending too many cooking fires. Too much duplicated labour. He nodded towards the sailing boat. They said there were some warehouses closer to the bridge, where the Castletown River becomes Dundalk Bay. On the boat, a figure stood up, waved, bent down, and picked up a foot-long object. They're waving a fish at us, Annette said. That's mean. Let's move out, Kim said. The sooner we find an anchorage, the sooner we can have some fish in our stew. A five-foot-high flood defence wall showed them where, beneath the snow and ice, the path lay. After four hundred slow-paced trudging metres, they came to an improbably massive tree, that had collapsed onto the path. How about another bet? Ken said. How old's the tree? Two minutes to make a guess, and then I'll start counting rings. No, no more gambling until we've something more than IOUs to pay the debt, Kim said. Up and over, then. She kept her tone light and a smile on her face. Where the snow lay undisturbed, it was only five inches deep, but each trudging footstep dragged flakes upward, coating the hem of her trousers. The clothes had come from the hotel, bound in a mildewed bag left by one of the lost Irish survivors. From the number of pockets and loops and the pair of vents behind the knees, they appeared to have been designed for outdoor pursuits. Appearance wasn't everything, and the material was absorbing water like a sponge. With each passing second, damp was turning to cold, discomfort to frostbite, and she clearly wasn't the only person slowly suffering. Only Bran seemed utterly immune. There's a body here, the soldier said. The snows formed a drift against the tree trunk, partially obscuring the corpse beneath. Is it a zombie? Kim asked. Hard to say, Bran said. He was a soldier before. Tags are... Dutch. The head's not destroyed, so I'll say uninfected. You heard her. Up and over. Kim was the last to clamber over the fallen tree. Her jacket caught against a branch, and the sleeve ripped as she tore herself free. She jumped down to the snow and saw that the fallen tree marked the end of the footpath. At least, it marked the end of where the footpath followed the coast. If the signpost was to be trusted, the path curved inland to what looked like a wider road. From the rooftops, it was one lined with houses, but in the distance, she saw a trio of chimneys. Didn't the ship's crew say something about industrial chimneys being close to the waterfront? Kim said. We'll make that our marker. It would also be the point where they turned back. She'd been over-optimistic 
about what could be achieved in this weather. Even so, they'd achieved so little. They had a few packets, clothes and books from that bungalow, but that wasn't enough for half a day's labour. The weather was confirmation that they did need to do things differently, but she could see each coming day unfolding like this. It would be trial and too much error, putting a nighttime theory into frigid daylight practice, making one new mistake after another, wasting hours, wasting calories, until there were none left. There's another body here, Annette said, almost as cheerfully as Bran. She kicked at the snow. Bones, anyway, and a gun. She bent and picked it up. A weird gun, more like an overweight pistol with an overlong magazine. It almost looks like it was made in someone's shed. That's a Heckler and Koch MP7, Bran said, taking it from her. It's a personal defence weapon, designed to penetrate body armour, more common among police and paramilitary units than regular infantry. Slides jammed, magazines empty. It's a German weapon? Kim asked. It was designed for NATO, Bran said. The Irish Gardaire used it, so did GSG-9, the German anti-terrorism unit. French Special Forces, Austria, the Czech Republic, it was commonly used. Well, not a common weapon. There's another body, Ken said, five metres ahead of them. And another here, Dee Dee said, five metres ahead of him. There were more after that. An erratic line of pecked clean skulls and bones, mixed in with rag-covered limbs of dead zombies, all partially buried in snow. There was little uniformity to the clothing, or to the weapons, though most firearms were military. Scattered among them were rusting bayonets, and just as many axes, shovels and metal bars. It was impossible to tell whether these defenders were fleeing to the town or from it, but the greatest concentration of the dead was outside a two-story warehouse. Though it was ringed by an ancient stone wall, the building was made of entirely functional gun-metal grey cladding, dotted with six-inch by two-feet windows. With those grey walls and narrow windows, it's a bit like a castle, Annette said. Is that why they came here? Because it looks like a castle? Listen a moment, Bran said. No, I think we're okay. Anyone want to take a guess at what O'Brien and Sons sold? The name was emblazoned in bright yellow letters, on an equally bright red background, the sign the only splash of colour on the drab building. But there was no clue beneath or in the courtyard as to what business was conducted within. Ken, watch the south, Bran said. Dee Dee, the north. Take five people apiece. Joan, watch the corpses. You gonna check inside? Annette asked. There's a reason they died here, Bran said, as he stepped over one body and then the next, stopping at the patch of snow by the doors. Nearly pristine, it was marred only by a dripping rust-red stain from a broken-down pipe. He slung his rifle, drew his crowbar, then nodded to Kim. Ready? Go for it, she said. He knocked the crowbar against the heavy steel door. No sound came from within. He tried the handle, the partially recessed lever. It squeaked as it descended, but when Bran pushed, the door didn't move. He pressed the crowbar between door and frame, heaved, but still the door didn't budge. And now I am curious, he said. He looked up. The windows are too narrow for a person to fit. We'll have to cut through the door. That'll take half an hour after we've found the tools. I say leave it for now. He lowered his voice. Time to think about calling it a day. I was thinking the same, Kim said. We'll take a look at those chimneys, then head back. Beyond the warehouse, the trail of corpses thinned. Abruptly, they grew more numerous as they approached a T-junction masquerading as a crossroads, where Point Road met Peter Street. A barricade had been built across Point Road, made of razor wire, sandbags and steel crash barriers, supported by cement-filled oil drums. It was a far more professional construction than those they'd seen elsewhere in Dundalk. Behind the barricade was an APC, its roof-mounted machine gun still aimed along Point Road. In front of the barricade 
was a great mass of the twice dead, and an even greater collection of bones. Bran whistled. His eyes narrowed, but before he spoke, the razor wire jangled. Zombie, Ken said, aiming his rifle at the mass of corpses. This time they all saw the creature move. It was caught on the wire, having managed to pull itself halfway to the top before the barbs had torn its undead muscles to shreds. Its left leg feebly kicked. The wire moved, and further along, closer to the APC, a discarded rifle whose strap was also tangled in the wire knocked against a steel drum. I can't see the zombie's head, Ken said. I can't get close enough to swing. Then don't waste a bullet, Bran said. It'll wait. The zombie kicked. Again, the rifle hit the metal drum. About twenty dead soldiers, maybe, Dee Dee said. A lot more zombies than that. Why would you set up a barricade at a junction here? Annette asked. Usually because there's something inside the perimeter worth protecting, Bran said. Barricades never appear alone. Somewhere beyond there'll be another barricade, or the road sealed. As to why, if it was valuable to them, it'll be valuable to us. Assuming the weather hasn't beaten us to it, Jones said. So how do we get past? I don't want to climb razor wire. It's a professional job, Bran said which means there's a door. There, that wooden pole. We should be able to move that section beneath. If that's a door, and if it's closed, then what will we find inside? Ken asked. There has to be a reason that those people who died outside the warehouse abandoned their barricades. If you ask me, that reason has to be zombies. Does that mean that this barricade is now keeping the undead inside? Further along the wire, the zombie kicked. The wire jangled. The rifle knocked against the metal barrel. They all listened. I think we're cool, Annette said. The barricade must have broken on the other side of town, right? So all the zombies would have gone inland. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Who'd worry about zombies coming from the sea? When the barricade on the other side of town broke, some people fled this way and others. I guess they went to the hospital, and that's where they died and stayed until we turned up. Bran grabbed the wooden pole. Let's find out. I'd say that's the answer, Ken said, slapping the sign. More snow fell away, but the writing revealed was in Gaelic. Aside from the name of the government department, that left only five words of English. Regional Strategic Fuel Distribution Depot. What does that mean? Annette asked. The building itself was equally opaque in that it was covered in a two-story hoarding painted to look like a sanitized street scene of a century before. A cobbled but clean road, a brewer's dray, chimneys puffing narrow plumes of grey smoke, pedestrians in flat caps, bonnets and scarves, an anachronistic woman with a parasol, a timeless priest in his dog collar walking with an equally changeless black-habited nun. The exception was the gates. Wide enough for two lorries to pass abreast, they were painted a plain dark grey. Even the pedestrian entrance, ten feet to the side, had been painted as part of the mural. The artist had a sense of humour, though. The door had been painted as the front door of a house, at which a milkman was placing a bottle on the stoop. The milkman's face was now marred by a modern bolt and clasp, held closed by a bayonet. We're not the first to break in. Kim said. Metal rasped against concrete as her foot hit something buried beneath the snow. She bent, expecting to find a discarded weapon, but it was most of a padlock. Cut through. So that explains why there's a bayonet holding the door closed. Like we practiced, Bran said. Eyes on the road, barrels too. Never point a gun at a living person. Never pull the trigger unless you're sure of the shot. If we have to run... Head to the barricade and go through to the other side. Wait there for the others and for as long as you can. Retrace your steps back to the college, but don't run blindly into the town. We don't know what other roads might be blocked. If you have to take shelter, remember that the undead might be inside. Secure the ground floor, go upstairs and hang out some sheets. We'll come looking. Whatever you do, don't panic. 
Always remember, the undead can't run. Nor in the snow could people, Kim thought. The rusted bayonet rasped as she dragged it free from the clasp. From beyond the door came a familiar sound as cold air was dragged into long, dead lungs. Zombie, Kim muttered as she pulled the clasp out. She pushed at the door. It moved an inch. It won't open. There's something blocking it. Well, zombie? Bran asked. I don't think so, Kim said. Let me try. Bran stepped forward and launched his shoulder into the closed door. The hoarding shook, but the door didn't open any further. See what I mean? Kim said. On the other side of the door, a foot crunched on snow. She heard another footstep, a third. Then the hoarding shook, this time without anyone touching it. Zombies, Kim said. The giant panels shook. Snow fell from the top, crumping onto the ground below. Metal rasped as bolts strained against brackets. I guess we found what those people were running from, Annette said. Everyone back, Bran said. Form a line on the road. Ken, watch the east. Joan, the west. Everyone else, be ready to run back to that barricade on my command. The two-story gates shook. They shuddered. The metal bolts holding the door to their over-tall frame burst, and broken bolts shot out like bullets. Kim ducked, straightening in time to see the doors collapse downward, shattering as they hit the icy ground, spraying up a cloud of dust, splinters, and snow. Eyes forward, ready! Bran bellowed as a cloud of dust and snow settled. Huh? he added. On the other side of the door were three undead figures, but only three. Wizened, desiccated, twisted nearly double. Between them, they were missing two ears, three hands, and four eyes. The creature staggered a pace forward. The zombie on the left slipped on the ice and fell onto the door. The wood cracked louder than a shot, and that was the trigger. Half their group opened fire. A soft crescendo of suppressed shots tore into the two upright creatures. Stop! Stop! Hold your fire! Bran called, his voice even louder. Silence returned, but only for as long as it took for the fallen zombie to roll to its side with a further cracking of that rotten wood. Mine, Bran said, firing before anyone else attempted the shot. The zombie slumped, dead to the ground. There's a lesson here, Bran said. There is, Kim said, and one I think we've all learned. Is that it, then? Ken asked. There were only three of them. Three and a rotten gate at a temporary hoarding, Bran said. We'll all hear for a minute. Everyone listen. Everyone keep watch. The minute passed slowly. Shuffling feet crushed snow to slush. Hands tapped against rifles. Breath was slowly exhaled. And, in the distance, waves lapped against rocks. That's sixty hippopotamuses I've counted, Annette said. So can we go inside now? Coal, Kim said. That's why the door wouldn't open. Two heavy-duty plastic sacks, five feet square and a foot deep, blocked the pedestrian door. They were far too bulky for even two people to carry, but next to them was a small forklift on which were another three sacks. The defenders were interrupted halfway through moving the coal, Kim said. Were they trying to make this place a new fortress, or just moving the fuel away somewhere? There's more coal over here, Ken called. Lots more. The gate led onto a driveway, and that to an open area ringed by narrow warehouses, and the low building out of which the industrial chimneys emerged. Ken hadn't gone inside the building, but stood next to a sixty-meter-long metal rack in which hundreds of blue plastic sacks were stacked. Did Ireland provide coal to its pensioners? Dee Dee asked. Or was that Scotland? There were no coal mines in Ireland, Bran said. That's why they burned peat, wasn't it? I think that's what the book said. From what we've seen of Dundalk, it doesn't look like a coal mining town, Dee Dee said. And if it was, Mary would know, right? So, if there's no mine, the coal had to have come in by sea, Bran said. 
And if my internal compass is correct, beyond that coal, beyond that wall, there's the bay. There's got to be tons of the stuff, Ken said, hundreds of tons, and who knows how much more in the warehouses. Forget burning furniture, we can burn coal all winter long. Hey, maybe we can get a steam engine going and have some lights too. Why bother if Rahinda can fix that wind turbine, Dee Dee said. We'd have electricity when the wind blows and can burn the coal for heat when it doesn't. We'll be able to boil water more quickly than with wood, Kim said. But we can't eat coal, she shivered. I don't know about you, but I'm freezing. I'm exhausted, and we've only been out of the college for a couple of hours. Just imagine, three months of this weather, of this kind of life. No, we need to get to France. She clamped her mouth closed but it was already too late. France? I thought we were going to Belfast, Ken said. The cat's out the bag, Bran said. That's the point, Annette said. We need to look for that cat. What do you mean, France? Dee Dee asked. Mary and I were talking about our options, Kim said, and nothing could be decided until we've a way to get onto the ship, so right now it's just a theory, just an idea. But once we're on the ship, why go to Belfast? Why not go somewhere warmer? France, initially, to find Bill and meet up with Leon, George and Nilda. Then we could follow the coast down to the Mediterranean. We can look for more ships, enough ships for everyone in Elysium and Belfast. We can live aboard the New World while we look for somewhere with a climate where we're not shivering in five layers. As I say, it's just an idea we were kicking around and it's utterly academic until we're aboard the ship, but I don't think this cold changes much. I like the idea of seeing sunshine again, Dee Dee said, and the saboteurs are in Belfast, Ken said. I'd like to steer clear of there until they're caught. As she said, our destination is academic until we've found a way to board the ship, Bran said. We've got to check the waterfront and search these other warehouses. Let's not forget that these people... These soldiers, they weren't killed by the snow. Thirty minutes later, they were back outside the depot's entrance. At high tide, we might be able to get the new world up to the sea wall, Kim said. We can certainly get those lifeboats and a yacht there. I'll leave a sailor to make the judgment, but then I want to get Commander Crawley to confirm it. The ship's crew should have seen those small cranes. It worries me that they didn't. Instead, they fished for their supper, Ken said. Those cranes will make loading the ship easier, right? Annette asked. I mean, they were there for bringing the coal ashore, right? So we can use them to move the grain the other way. Not without electricity, Bran said. Maybe Rahinda can rig up something mechanical. You don't think that liquid in those tanks is diesel? Ken asked. The sign said heating oil, Dee Dee said. I think we should trust it. But the peat, the coal, will be able to get warm after we finish work, Bran said. Fine. No one builds a single barricade across one road whose only approach is from the sea. Not in our world, anyway. There'll be at least one more between us and the college. We've got to find that, clear it, and then we'll have a route to get back here tomorrow. One more hour, and we'll be back in the dry. Shall we bring some coal back with us? Annette asked. Only if you want to carry it, Bran said. Speaking of which, anyone who wants to unload some of the loot they found in the bungalow, that shed they kept the peat in would be a good place to leave it. From their quick exploration of the interior, they knew that the depot was massive, curving along the waterfront. Outside, they followed the hoarding eastward until the road met the motorway. This isn't on the map, Bran said. There should be another road here and a string of... Ah! He shoved the map back into his pocket, this time with far less reverence. There should be a string of restaurants and cafes here on the waterfront. Yes, I think we can say this was part of a student project, perhaps something to do with regeneration. Either way, the map is untrustworthy, but we don't need it any longer. We'll follow the motorway for a bit. Well, at least we know where we're going, Ken said. Aim for the turbine, right? That's easy enough to spot, Dee Dee said. Though a second later, the weather proved her wrong. A gust of wind appeared from nowhere, 
dusting flurries of snow across the road. Another quickly followed, raising a fine white cloud in front of them. The distant turbine was momentarily obscured, but as the snow drifted downward, the towering monolith re-emerged. Kim was glad they were on their way back, not just because she desperately wanted to get into the warm and dry. She needed time to think. It was an understatement to say that they needed to do things differently. The new world hadn't been in Dundalk for long. Even so, the crew should have made a more thorough examination of the shoreline. Then there was their own expedition, of which she couldn't help feel the first two hours were wasted effort and wasted calories. Yes, they needed to do things differently, but that didn't give her the method by which they would do things in the future. Bran ran ahead, briefly vanishing in a white squall before the wind dropped and the loose snow settled back to the roadway. He was by a sign, partly hidden by a dead hedge, collapsed across the snow-coated pavement. Now we're getting some answers, he said. As Kim tried to grasp his meaning, Dee Dee pointed at a sign. Barrack Street, she said. You think there's a barracks here? She took out her map. It says this is Doyle Way, and it leads to a cinema and an ice rink. It could just be an old name, Ken said. Not on a road sign, Dee Dee said. Good point, Ken said. I vote we should investigate. There was a general shifting of feet, a general shiver against the cold, but also a nodding of heads. It wasn't that no one wanted to give up, but that no one wanted to be the first to suggest it. Best to keep moving, Kim said. Let's see if there is a barracks. The houses either side of the street were a mix of terraced, semis, and a smattering of maisonette conversions. What they all had in common were the padlocked doors and block ground floor windows. Some of the unseasoned plyboard had warped, sections of rough sawn planking had come loose, and Kim counted two doors where the padlocks had been cut through. There were many more doors where a key still hung on a nail next to the letterbox. It was a professional job, and so was the barricade. It stretched across the road a hundred metres from the junction with the motorway. Giant plate steel sheets towered as high as the second story windows of the houses either side. The plate sheets ran from those windows through the front gardens and across the pavement on both sides, leaving a gap in the middle. It was impossible to tell whether there was a gate or a low barrier due to the mound of snow covered corpses piled in front. The dead lay three deep and four high close to the houses but nearly ten times that number lay in front of the gap. Barricade, a barracks, a fortress, Dee Dee said softly. Here they fought, and I hope they escaped. But why here? Ken said far more loudly. Why not at the coal depot? Surely the coal is the real prize worth protecting. But they built this back in March or April, Annette said just as loudly. You don't need to burn coal when... The frozen landscape deadened sound turning the usual symphony of decaying town into a four-piece band of snow-melting, ice-cracking, wood-creaking, and metal warping. As they'd spoken, the sound had grown, almost as if it was caught by the wind, centralizing and focusing on a point just beyond the fallen dead. Though the wind had dropped, snow billowed from the mound of corpses, exploding outwards as the frozen undead clawed and pushed, and rolled to their feet. Spread out, Bran called. Form a line, one date, slowly now. Joan slipped as she took three steps sideways and four back. Kim caught her arm. Don't run, Bran called. Take your time. Aim. Wait for... But then the firing began. Bran didn't try to stop it, so nor did Kim. She just grabbed Annette's arm and dragged her to the side of the road, and into the lee of the nailed shut door. Hey, no! Annette said. Crossfire, Kim said simply, raising her own weapon looking for a target. Watch our retreat. The undead were obscured by a cloud of snow, ice, and flying black gore, as bullets smacked into living corpses that shoved against one another as they rose. Few bullets hit heads, as a great roiling mass of death 
undulated too violently for anyone to get a clear shot. There was a brief lull in the gunfire as magazines were emptied and hastily replaced. Fear rose, hands slipped, and full magazines were dropped to the snow. Nervous shuffling became a backward step. Stand firm, Bran said loudly but calmly. Don't run. We're winning. We're winning. Take your time. We've got plenty. Take your time. Aim. Always aim. Watch the rear, Kim said again to Annette. Shout if you see anything coming. She ran out into the road and walked behind the ragged line of shaking rifles. Take your time, she said, matching her tone to the soldiers. Aim for the heads. Take your time. We're winning, Bran called. Aim and fire. Aim and fire. The rifles were fitted with suppressors, but over the sound of cracking ice, of breaking bone, of air being dragged into dead lungs, the words barely carried. It was the tone that mattered. These zombies were between the college and the waterfront. Kill them now or kill them later, but they would have to be killed. The zombie fell. Had it slipped? Or had it been shot? The ice-covered creature that staggered over the corpse definitely slipped, falling to the snow-coated roadway, sending up a plume of white dust that obscured the zombies behind. They were firing blind now, but the barrage slowed. It didn't stop but confidence was replacing panic. Not all the bullets were on target, but between them, the ice and the constant shoving and pushing of their fellows, the zombies were getting no nearer. There was another lull as empty magazines were replaced. Kim raised her rifle, firing one quick shot after another, barely registering the snow-sleek faces as she placed one bullet after the next into an undead skull. Stand your ground! Bran called as Joan took a step backward. Keep firing! It was a waste of ammunition, but if they stopped shooting, the line would break. People would run, and then almost certainly some would die. Yes, they had to do things differently, but would they ever get the time to learn? Eyes front! Bran called. We're winning! Kim spared a glance at Annette. The girl at least was obeying orders. She stood, rifle half-raised, her eyes on their retreat. Kim allowed herself a thin smile, then returned her attention to the undead. The movement had slowed, though it hadn't stopped. Cease fire! Bran called. Cease fire, it's over! Hold your fire! Stop! As raggedly as it had begun, the barrage ceased. Annette! Kim called. We're fine, the road's clear. Annette called. Did we win? Almost, Bran said. Reload if you have to. Twenty feet away, a crawling zombie threw out an arm, spraying snow into the air. Almost simultaneously, four bullets slammed into it, only one of which found its head. Hold your fire! Bran called. Ken? Dee Dee? Watch our retreat. Everyone else? Fix bayonets. Um, I don't have a bayonet. Joan said. I mean, sling your rifles, draw your machetes, Bran said. We need to save the ammunition. Let them come to us. As they stood, watching the remaining undead claw their way along the road, then thrash their way to their feet, the wind returned. Snow danced from the corpses, making it seem as if once again the twice dead were rising. But movement truly only came from a handful. Bran fired shooting one, then two, then the third upright zombie. Two more pushed their way out of the mound of the dead and joined those crawling along the road. Kim and I'll take care of those that are upright, Bran said. When the crawling creatures get within ten feet, whoever is closest, move forward, kill them, step back. This is one hell of a way to learn soldiering, Joan murmured. A zombie staggered to its feet on the left-hand side. Kim? The left's yours, Bran said. The right's mine. Kim fired. The zombie fell. Joan darted forward, hacking her machete at a zombie's head. It took her two swings to kill the creature. Kim waited until she saw the woman retreat back to the line, then focused once more on the shifting mound. 
ignoring her heart pounding like a drum in her chest, ignoring the sheen of sweat turning to ice in the sub-zero air, ignoring the ocean of fear, the wave of exhaustion, the tide of despair that the nightmare would never end. She fired. Bran fired. One by one, people darted from the line, hacking machetes and hatchets at the crawling undead, until, ten minutes later, all movement had ceased from the mound of the dead. Ken? Dee Dee? Watch our retreat. I was doing that, and didn't say I needed help, Annette muttered. Everyone else, count your ammo, Bran said. He waited until everyone's eyes were on their gear before taking a few steps away from the line and towards the barricade. Kim trudged through the slick snow, crushed to slush by the crawling undead, and over to him. What do you think, between a hundred and two hundred zombies, she said. About that, closer to two hundred, I think. Maybe one seventy? But a lot were dead before we arrived. They stepped over the legs of a corpse, its body riddled with bullets before someone had got lucky with a headshot. It was luck, wasn't it? Kim asked, her voice low. What's that? Oh, nothing that can't wait. She paused by a corpse still buried in the snow. She prodded it with her rifle barrel. Okay, yes, some were dead before we got here. This one's head's undamaged. Must have been a survivor. And a soldier, Bran said. A lot of them are in uniform, redeployed from some distant posting, shoved onto a plane, flown to Dublin, and then they came here, and died, before they had a chance or need to change their clothes. Her eyes tracked from that corpse to those they'd killed, settling on the barricade. Now that the undead had moved, she had a clearer view of the gap between the two sections of sheet metal. It was filled with a five-foot-high, three-foot-thick, metal-clad concrete monolith. It looks like those things they had at airports, she said. An anti-ram barrier? Probably. Looks like they added some barbed wire, but the zombies have crushed that. It's professional, though, Kim said. Very, Bran said. Now I'm really curious what's inside. There's a stepladder on the other side of the barrier, Kim said, and a lorry beyond that. The ladder means they came back and forth. They knew they would be fighting the undead, that people weren't a threat. I'm cold, I'm sore, I'm half drenched with sweat, and the rest of me is dripping with snow melt. But I don't like leaving a secret unanswered. Not any more. Me neither, Bran said. I'm out, Joan said loudly. Does anyone have a spare magazine? A minute later... They had the answer for the group. We're down to less than thirty rounds apiece, Bran said. Kim knew that the real figure would be closer to zero than thirty. They'd set off with three magazines each, with both herself and Bran carrying a small reserve. Close to a thousand rounds had now been expended for less than two hundred undead. That was far too unequal a ratio. Bran opened his pack. Here. Pass them out. This is the last. Stay here. Watch the road. Chapter 5 The Barracks Aiken Barracks, Dundalk Those are speakers, aren't they? Annette asked from the top of the stepladder. Kim turned around. I thought I told you to watch the road. No, Bran told everyone else to do that, Annette said. You didn't say anything about me. So, are they speakers? She jumped down the ladder and came to join Bran and Kim on the inside of the barricade. They're speakers, yes, Kim said, looking at the rear of the army lorry. The tailgate was down and the tarp had been pulled back. That had let in leaves and rain, which the wind had sprinkled with snow. Speakers, a generator, an amplifier, and what looks like a laptop, Bran said. He climbed up the tailgate and into the rear of the lorry. The generator's dry. Laptop's open. He swept the icy flakes off the keyboard and tapped the power key. Battery's dead. They used music to lure the zombies here, Annette asked, and the zombies kept coming until the generator ran out of fuel. The laptop died first, I'd say, Bran said. But yes, 
I think this was a lure, not a trap. He jumped down, almost losing his footing as he landed. He kicked at the snow. Casings. Nine millimetre, a few dozen. Maybe a few hundred. Someone stayed long enough to make sure the lure worked. Can't see any bodies this side of the barricade, Kim said. No weapons either. Hmm, but at the end of the road, that, I think that is a barracks. Hey, look at this, Annette called. She'd opened the door at the front of the lorry and picked up a folded piece of paper. It's a map, a proper one. Look, they've marked in the barricades. And the barracks. It is a barracks. Let me see, Bran said, as he and Kim walked over to the front of the lorry. They've marked out the barricade by the coal depot and another on the bridge. Hmm, the ship's crew really should have spotted that. There's a barricade south of here, on the motorway. Then three, no, four in the town itself. It's a ring, isn't it? Kim said. A defensive ring around the barracks. Looks like it, Bran said. Yet this is where they lured the zombies. Annette had climbed back into the cab. Now we're talking, she said. Is it another map? Kim asked. Better, Annette said. It's chocolate! She tore the wrapper apart and took a bite. Mmm, sour. Well, I've had worse. You want some? I suppose if you hadn't had food poisoning yet, you're unlikely to get it now, Kim said. I'll have half, but you can give it to Ken to cover my debt on the bet. Hey, no, that's not fair. Consider it a proxy lesson in the dangers of gambling, Kim said. Annette muttered something that Kim pretended not to hear. Bran turned the map over. They didn't mark the hospital. I'd say that's odd. Because of the zombies we found there? Kim asked. And because I'd have considered it an obvious location to protect, Bran said. So is the college, Annette said. Because of the wind turbine, I mean. And the hotel, because of its height. They weren't marked, were they? No. Bran put the map away. I think we should send everybody back. Send? Not lead? Kim asked. I want to inspect the barricade on the bridge, Bran said. The ship's crew should have spotted it, if it's as sturdy as the barrier they constructed here. And again, they didn't spot those cranes by the coal depot. Yes, I think we should send Commander Crawley to take command of the new world. I like the way you do that, Kim said. Couch a command as a suggestion. It's a habit of sergeants, he said. But if the bridge is secure, then it would be useful to know before we bring more people here. He glanced up. That won't be until tomorrow. No. It would be best to send everyone back. We're low on ammo. They're frozen, hungry and tired. I'm not, Annette said, her voice slightly muffled by chocolate. We'll send Ken and Dee Dee to look at the bridge, Kim said. We'll send everyone else back to clear the barricade between here and the college. You and I will search the barracks. And me too, Annette said. Ken ran his tongue around his mouth. On balance, I'd say the nuts have gone off. Chocolate's fine, though. We'll call that a debt paid. You want a bite, Dee Dee? Not until I know where the nearest dentist is, she said. We're to go to the bridge, check the other barricade is secure. That's it, Kim said. You know the route? Back to the motorway, then left, Ken said. No, right, Dee Dee said. That's what I meant, Ken said. Towards the river. Here. Kim gave Dee Dee the map. I'm not sure what you'll find there. The boat's crew didn't say they'd seen anything, but, well, find out if there is a barricade, and if it's where the map says it is, and whether it'll keep the undead away from this side of the bay. Then come back. Thirty minutes is all you've got. Aye, aye, Captain, Dee Dee said with a grin. Come on, you, she added, speaking to Ken. One more hour, and we'll be back in the warm. I knew I should have volunteered to help Rahinda and Mirabelle, Ken said. Kim spared another minute watching Dee Dee and Ken disappear down the road. With the rest of the group having already made their way back along the road, the snow had been churned to slush. When pristine, the lack of footprints had been reassuring, proof that they were the only people to have walked that way since the snowfall. It had offered security. A false security, 
as the frozen undead by the barricade had proved, but security nonetheless. Now it was just a cold and treacherous surface, and they were on the wrong side of Christmas to look forward to the spring. She walked back to the barricade, clambered over the anti-ram barrier, and trudged across to the lorry. Annette was still in the cab. The door closed. Kim knocked. Annette grinned and opened the door. Want to come in? I want you to come out. Oh, you've emptied the bag over the seat. Did you find any more chocolate? No. I found something better, Annette said. Two things, actually. First, gloves. They're dry and don't fit me. Here. Kim took them a little hesitantly, but they were obviously too large for the girl. She ripped off her sodden pair and plunged her hands inside. That feels good. Your hand's bleeding, Annette said. It's the cold, Kim said. What's the other thing you found? Annette held up a slim moleskin notebook. It's a diary. Well, kind of. It's all about supplies and who's on watch, that kind of thing. What's interesting is, well, you know those Irish survivors, the ones who left those notes in the hotel? They're mentioned? I, I'm not sure. I'd need to look at it again. But I think I was reading their account wrong. It was full of stuff like, while we're waiting, I'll record how so-and-so died, or until we leave, I have more time on my hands than anything except blood. The blood of Colleen Higgins will never come off. I won't forget that one. She shuddered. Anyway, the point is that they were waiting for something. I thought it was a person like Siobhan and Colin. But what if it was a ship? I mean, what if those people out on that path died to protect others as they got aboard? They were waiting for a ship. How else do you explain the speakers? Annette asked. They lured the zombies here to their most heavily fortified position. They were basically destroying them. Why? Because they didn't need the fortifications anymore. If they were going somewhere on land, even to Belfast, they wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't have, would we? I mean... OK, there was Brazley Abbey, but we were surrounded, and these survivors weren't surrounded. Not if they had to use the speakers to lure the zombies to the barracks. Maybe, Kim said. But I wouldn't use what we did in England to predict what a large and heavily armed group of soldiers might have done. Yeah, but if they did escape, imagine it. They might still be out there somewhere. Hmm. Come on, let's go and help Bran search the barracks. What does that mm mean? Annette said. You disagree, don't you? They trudged through the snow, following Bran's single set of prints to the barracks. You might be right, Kim said, and I think you are. There was a boat, or the promise of a boat, or the hope of it. Maybe they got aboard, or maybe they all died on the waterfront. We may never know. Right, exactly. So why assume they're dead? Kim sighed. That's not the problem. The problem, the real issue, the real question, is whether Dundalk is where they all ended up. Don't forget the hospital and the zombies inside there. Did they all come here, all the soldiers and civilians who escaped Dublin? And is this where their story ended? What if it is? Why is that a problem? Well, if they did all come here... They brought APCs and ambulances and thousands of people. Did they bring this gear from Dublin? If so, is there any point in us going there? Chapter 6 Dead Soldiers Aiken Barracks, Dundalk The cold bit deep into her face, but Kim left her coat's hood down and a rifle pressed against her shoulder as they followed Bran's footsteps from the barricade to the barracks. His were the only set of prints in the snow, but after the shock of seeing the frozen undead suddenly waking, that was less reassuring than it had been earlier in the day. The entrance to Aiken Barracks had been reinforced with sheet metal affixed to the fencing, razor wire attached to the gate, and sandbags stacked neatly around the entrance, leaving a gap only four feet wide. At least there are no zombies, Annette said, none living anyway. There were eight bodies next to the closed gates, all long dead. Remembering the zombies by the barricade, 
Kim triple-checked that their heads had been crushed. Another pair of undead corpses lay next to the entrance to the cabin-like sentry post. In the doorway itself was a pecked clean ribcage. There were no other bones. Kim glanced upwards, but couldn't see any birds either. But what bird would fly in a snowstorm? What's that? Annette asked. Nothing, just be careful. And, and if we have to run, go to the coal depot. You remember that shed? The one with the ladder? Go there, and up the ladder. It wasn't much of a refuge, but it was the closest to one they'd seen that day. Now, cautiously. Bran's footprints led into the barracks complex, across what was either a car park or a parade ground, to one of the narrow-windowed, low-roofed buildings on the opposite side of the square. Kim glanced across the rooftops, but couldn't begin to guess what was inside each building. Bran knows what he's looking for, Kim said. So, are we going to stand in the cold waiting for him? No. We'll take a look in there, Kim said, pointing at the building closest to the sentry post. But, I know, be ready for danger, be ready to run. The door opened into a security post, two-thirds filled with slim metal boxes. Blank monitors lined two walls, a table occupied a third, and a computer the fourth with a door next to it leading to a long corridor. There were seven doors leading from that corridor, six on the barrack side of the compound, with a seventh at the far end. All were closed. Kim took a step back from the doorway and gave the metal boxes a second glance. Those are ammunition boxes, she said. Five nearest the door were open. Four were empty. The fifth, though, was nearly full. She picked up a cartridge. It's nine millimeter. Now this is a big gun, Annette said, unfolding the tarp-wrapped object that had been propped on the narrow part of the desk not taken up with the dead security monitors. Smells of oil. A machine gun from an APC, I think, Kim said. It looks the same kind that was on that vehicle by the waterfront checkpoint. And there's ammo for it here, Annette said, opening one of the boxes on the floor. At least... I think it's for that gun. It's too big for the rifles. The calibre's on the cartridge and on the box, Kim said, scanning the room, then doing it again, this time more slowly. And there are more boxes under the table next to that computer. Check those. 7.62 millimetres, Annette said, reading the box. But this box is empty. So's this one. Oh, this box isn't. It's full. Look for 5.56 millimetres, Kim said and let's hope Ireland used that calibre for their rifles. She glanced out the window, but there was no sign of Bran. There were no signs of the undead, either. There's more bullets for the machine gun, Annette said, opening another box. They're really not much use, Kim said. We can't be accurate enough with a machine gun. What about grenades? Annette asked. Don't touch them, Kim said. Where are they? Here, this bag beneath the desk. Annette said, and I wasn't going to touch them. I was just seeing what was in the bag. Kim breathed out. OK, well, that tells us something, doesn't it? It does. A machine gun and grenades, useful for fighting people, but noisy and inaccurate against the undead. Soldiers would realise that quicker than civilians. That's why these weapons are here, I think. Left as a last reserve for when they'd run out of ammunition for the more useful weapons and that these are still here confirms what the speakers in that truck suggest. The soldiers set up a lure, and then they escaped. She pulled, closed the door, leading outside. Keep an eye on the parade ground. I want to check those doors off that corridor. You mean, don't touch anything, I know, Annette said. But she moved to the window, while Kim went to the corridor. The first door leading from it was locked, so were the others, except for the room at the far end. It had been an office. More recently, it had been an operating theatre. Bandages coated in brown, dried blood filled an empty waste paper bin, with more discarded on the floor around it. The table was similarly stained. A chair in the corner held a metal tray with forceps, needles and probes. Kim frowned. Something didn't add up. There were no bodies, 
no bones, no sores or amputated limbs. She wasn't sure why she expected those. Something to do with how primitive we've become? No. It was something else. The probes. What was there to probe for with a zombie's bite? She kicked the bin over, then rolled it with her foot, shaking the bandages over the floor until something metallic rolled out, a spent and blood-pocked bullet. Perhaps the machine gun and grenades weren't being kept for the undead. She scanned the room, looking for some other clues, but there were none to be found. Perhaps it was friendly fire. Reluctantly, unsatisfied, she headed back to the entrance. It's nothing for our assault rifles, Annette said, but if the numbers on the outside of the boxes can be believed, there's about 10,000 rounds for the machine gun, 40,000 9mm bullets, and a 100 cartridges for the shotgun. Oh, and the grenades. You should have been watching the parade ground. I was multitasking. Kim let it go. 40,000 rounds of 9mm, really? Yeah, well, maybe. Hang on. Wait, no, I think I counted wrong. Did I carry the five? I think it's four thousand. No, that can't be right either. Whatever, a lot is missing. What do you mean, missing? It's in the notebook, Annette said, holding up the book she'd taken from the lorry's cab. The last entry says they had one hundred and twenty thousand rounds of nine millimetre. They must have taken it with them. Or fired it, I guess. No mention of five point five six millimetres. Nope, no mention of the grenades either. So maybe Bran will find rifle ammo somewhere else. But this is good, right? I mean, Sholter only brought us 10,000 rounds, and they must have shot a 1,000 of those zombies by the barricade. But the bullets are useless unless we have the guns that can fire them, Kim said. Even then, they're not that helpful without a suppressor. There were no guns here. Just the machine gun and shotgun, Annette said. What was in those rooms? Blood, Kim said, and locked doors. Oh, well maybe that's where the rest of the bullets are. Shall we check? We'll leave them for now. There's Bran. The soldier trudged across the courtyard towards them. He had his rifle in his arms, a newly found bag over his shoulder, and the weapon slung next to it. Is that a rifle? Annette asked when he reached them. A submachine gun, Bran said. The collapsible stock is of a kind the Dutch special forces preferred. There are a few more weapons in the barracks. Same calibre, same manufacturer, similar design, but no two exactly the same. I don't think they were here before the outbreak. Must have been left by the soldiers. Different soldiers from different units in different nations' armies. Did you find more ammunition? Annette asked. Some. Nothing for our rifles. Not there but it was an improvised bunkhouse with mattresses on the floor. We might have better luck with the armoury, but I don't think we've time to continue the search today. Any suppressors? Kim asked. Not that I saw, and I wouldn't hold out much hope for finding some here, Bran said. There were none affixed to the weapons we saw discarded between here and the waterfront. I'm going to ask Rahinda if he could adapt a silencer for one of our rifles to fit a submachine gun. Mattresses on the floor? Kim asked, and they were Dutch soldiers. This submachine gun might be. There were a few French paperbacks and a German Bible, for all that tells us, but it doesn't tell us that the last people to sleep there were soldiers before the outbreak. What I'm wondering, Kim said, is whether these soldiers came from Dublin, gathering civilians along the way. More importantly... Did they bring all the ammunition those airlifted soldiers brought to that city? If they did, is there any point in us going to Dublin? Hard to say, Bran said. At least it's hard to say now. We'll know more when we've properly searched the place. But sunset is coming, and we don't want to be out after dark. Ah, oh, it's frustrating, isn't it? Kim said, as they headed back to the gate, and then to the two-story sheet metal barricade. Her gaze caught the twice-dead corpses. And if the defenders came from Dublin, I wonder whether these zombies did too. I wonder how they ended up piled together. They were lured here by the sound, like you said, Annette said. No, I mean, it doesn't matter. 
After the generator had died, after the sound had stopped, why hadn't the zombies drifted away? Even that wasn't what she really wanted to know. What she wanted to know was whether if they hadn't come to the barracks now, but in a month, or two months, or a year, would the zombies have been dead? After a few days, they often adopted that squatting position, waiting, motionless, dormant. Was that the first step to death, or to an eternal hibernation? Chapter 7 None Shall Pass Dundalk The motorway was mercifully absent of the undead, and thankfully absent of Joan and the others who'd gone south. Worryingly, there was no sign of Ken and Dee Dee. We'll give them five minutes, Kim said. A gust of wind dragged a curtain of snow across the empty road. The weather's changing, Bran said. We're going to have another snowstorm? Annette asked. I don't think so, Bran said. The wind's coming from the south. He cricked his head, then turned north. Did you hear that? Kim peered into the white haze. The wind dropped, the snow settled, and the setting sun lit up the white-coated landscape. Ice glittered, visibility improved, and Kim saw a figure running towards them. It was Ken. He raised a hand, yelled something, then slipped on the ice. Zombies, Ken said breathlessly as he picked himself up. Zombies, barricade, on the bridge, what, hundreds? Where's Dee Dee? Kim asked. Shooting them, Ken said. Hundreds? Bran asked. Maybe thousands, Ken said. Way more than by the barracks. If they get through, we'll have to fight them in the town, Bran said. Go, Kim said, forestalling any more discussion. Take Ken and Annette. Give me your ammo. We'll hold them as long as we can. She took the magazines from Bran and Annette. Already gave mine to Dee Dee, Ken said. Go, Kim said again, then ran north along the snow-covered motorway, following Ken's tracks into danger. The barricade had been built on the northern bank of the bridge which explained why the ship's crew hadn't seen it. Excused was a better choice of word, since the barricade was of a similar construction to that near the barracks. It towered over twenty feet high, made of great sections of sheet metal, bolted and welded together, supported by girders, toughened by cement. Like the barrier at the barracks, a gap had been left in the middle, wide enough for a vehicle to drive through. Here, though, there was a gate. Six feet high with hinges, three feet long, it had begun as a farmer's five-bar gate. Reinforced with wire mesh, a timber lock bar, and a patchwork of far smaller metal plates, half of which had been knocked free by the thrashing, clawing zombies on the gate's far side. On the bridge was a rusting police car, on the roof of which stood Dee Dee. Slowly, methodically, she was shooting over the top of the gate into the mass of the undead beyond. What happened? Kim asked. Zombies, Dee Dee said. The other side of the barricade. Over there. Fifty meters away. That field. A tone was clipped, each phrase punctuated with a shot. Tried shooting them, before they got to the barricade. Too many. Hundreds. Thousands. They heard you. Not sure. Must have. Who knows? Dee Dee's rifle clicked. The magazine was empty. She ejected it, letting it clatter onto the vehicle's battered frame, as she took a spare from her webbing. What's the plan? Kim climbed onto the police car's bonnet. We'll hold them for as long as we can, she said, raising her rifle. She took aim, but the angle was wrong. She could see a long, thick column of the undead drifting onto the road, but not the zombies immediately behind the gate. She could see the metal shake, though as the undead beat and pushed, and in turn were pushed by the greater number beyond. She fired at a bare-scalped creature twenty feet from the barricade, but didn't wait to see if it fell. There's ammo at the barracks, she said, firing again. Bran, Ken, 
and a net have gone to get it, and some guns. We can hold them here. She fired. I'm not sure we can, Dee Dee said, firing a shot of her own. The gate shook. Kim fired. The gate shook again, and this time Kim saw the sheet steel barricade shudder. If we have to, we'll lead them back through the town, Kim said. To the college? What choice do we have? Kim said. If they get through here, they'll cut us off from the sea. Now or later, we have to deal with them. No retreat, Dee Dee said. No retreat, Kim echoed. The gate had stopped shaking, but not because the undead had stopped pushing. It was simply that the roiling mass on the other side were pressing the frame taut. The beach, the hotel, the barracks, and now the bridge. One last desperate stand after another, a life spent terrified, horrified, but relatively safe as long as they had ammunition. But the ammo would be gone soon enough. This was life. This would be every expedition ashore. And if they were to live aboard ships, there would be many expeditions, and soon the ammo would be gone. She fired. This was life and in it she could see the shape of her death. There were trucks the other side of the barricade, near where the zombies were gathered, Dee Dee said. Army trucks? Kim asked. Think so, Dee Dee said. Another lure, then, Kim said. Doesn't explain how the other zombies got inside the barricade. She fired, then reflexively glanced around. She'd had a sudden fear of being surrounded, but there were no zombies behind. No sign of Bran, Ken, and Annette either. There was a loud creak, then a sharp, metallic crack. She turned to her front in time to see the gate's hinges torn from their brackets. The gate thudded down into the snow, and the undead piled through. Those who'd been closest to the barricade had already been crushed. Their bones pulped as the great roiling mass surged through the narrow opening. More fell as they tripped on the ice, on the bones and skin and frozen rags of their fellows. But between and behind them were hundreds more. Kim jumped from the roof, propping her rifle on the police car's snow-covered bonnet. A frisson of cold swept up her arm as her elbow dug deep into the snow. Her clothing was already damp, and it would soon freeze. But that discomfort was a welcome distraction as she fired one shot after the next into the approaching tumult of death. She aimed at heads, but the undead moved too erratically, too fast, and too often her bullets missed their targets, impacting against arms and chests, and did nothing to stop the surge. Dee Dee had jumped down and propped her rifle on the roof, there was no point calling out targets, as the scrumming undead were uniformly horrific in their coating of ice and frozen rags. They fired, one bullet after another, until the magazines were empty. Kim reloaded, her numb fingers fumbling with a fresh magazine. I'm out, Dee Dee said. Here, Kim said, handing her one of the magazines she'd taken from Bran. This is the last... The undead were now beyond the gate. Some had staggered sideways into the relative shelter of the steel sheeting. There they'd found their footing. They lurched onwards, slipping, sliding, and one even tumbled over the bridge's low wall down to the river below. The others staggered on, slowly approaching the car. Two more shots, Kim said firing into the bare skull of a creature from which the skin had been peeled away. Two more, then we run. She fired to the right of the gate, then to the left. She had five shots left, at least she thought she did, but she'd keep those for the retreat. Ready? And then she heard footsteps, running and coming from behind. She turned around and saw Bran sprinting along the road, his feet kicking up a cloud of snow with every two-meter stride. Fire every last bullet, Kim said. Four bullets later, the magazine was empty. She dropped it onto the car's bonnet 
and reached for the holster at her belt. She had six rounds left in the pistol, and the weapon had no suppressor, but it would buy them a few more seconds, if she could draw the weapon. The flap was frozen solid, and her fingers weren't much better. She'd managed to get it free just as Bran reached them. He slammed something large and heavy down on the car. The machine gun. You brought that? Kim asked. I need a minute, he said. As Dee Dee fired the last of her shots, Kim raised the pistol. The unsilenced shots echoed like thunder across the frozen landscape. At the sound, the undead by the gate became more animated, more violent, more erratic, pushing and shoving each other, so that even more fell to the icy tarmac. Those further from the gate had no such impediment. They staggered onward, their twisted backs straightening, their broken arms swinging, their gaping mouths snapping. Kim was on her last bullet. She aimed at a tall creature, wearing clothing more intact than the others. Its trousers were taped at the ankles. Body armor was visible beneath a ragged red coat, and a ski mask covered its head. She fired, but the sound of her shot was drowned by the cacophonous bark of the machine gun. The tall zombie danced as bullets thudded into it. The short burst ended. The zombie continued staggering back a pace. It straightened. Kim couldn't tell whether the bullets had penetrated the body armor, but none of the dozen rounds had hit its head. She works, Bran said. Now let's see what she can really do. He opened fire, stitching bullets at head height. This time he had the angle right. Bullets smacked into as many chests as heads, but the zombies began to fall. The only thing louder than the gunshots was the sound of bullets hitting the sheet metal barricade. The undead flooded into the gap, but Bran concentrated his fire there. Kim smiled until she saw a shot zombie stand. The machine gun was just too inaccurate. Watch the sides, Bran said as he reloaded. Watch the sides. I've got the left, Dee Dee. Take the right, Kim said, as she drew her machete from its sheath. Bran opened fire again. Kim saw a head explode, then turned her attention away from the gate and to the undead that had already staggered through. Most headed towards the sound of the machine gun, and so lurched into the path of its bullets. But there were three, two feet apart, staggering along the motorway's curb. Fingers numb, she gripped the machete with both hands, planning her blow as the zombies approached. She swung high, the blade skimming off its frozen scalp, but then had to jump back as the zombie's three-fingered hand clawed at her face. She ducked low, swinging at its knee, the oft-sharpened blade slashed through shredded cloth and rotten sinew, and the zombie fell. Kim stepped back as the next zombie lurched forward, but it tripped on the thrashing, grounded creature, leaving her free to sidestep them both and slash the blade at the last creature's skull. It burst like a rotten egg, spraying a dark ooze over her and the trampled snow. She spun around, hacking the machete at one fallen zombie, then the next, and kept moving, spinning, looking for the next threat. Kim! Annette called. Kim kept spinning, kept turning, until she spotted the girl, standing by the car, a shotgun in her hand. Kim ran over, grabbed it. Ammo? Here, this bag, but it's loaded. Kim slung the bag and moved away from the vehicle. Ken was there too, a submachine gun in his hands, crossing to the other side of the bridge. He fired, his shots calm and measured, barely audible over the industrial racket of the machine gun, until, without warning, the machine gun stopped. Jammed! Bran spat the word as if it were a curse. Lying on top of the fallen gate was a mound of the dead. For a moment it was still, and then it shifted and rolled, heaved and shuddered, as the undead behind struggled against the fallen that were trying to stand. Kim raised the shotgun, 
fired, ratcheted in a new shell, and fired again. The range was too long. She took a step forward. Bran, are we retreating? I brought these, Annette said. Are they any use? Yes, Bran said. I need some wire in about thirty seconds. Kim took another pace forward. She hadn't turned around, and so wasn't sure what Bran was planning, but it didn't matter. All that mattered was that they needed time. She fired into the heaving mass by the gate. The slug ripped a hole through a zombie's chest. Kim sensed the movement more than she saw it, and stepped sideways and back as a crawling zombie swiped an arm through the space her foot had just been. She ratcheted in a fresh round, lowered the barrel, pulled the trigger, and fired from a distance of less than two feet. The zombie's skull exploded, spraying bone and rotten brain across the churned snow. Kim chambered a new shell and fired again at the gate. Ken was firing too, his shots more measured, more carefully aimed. But it wouldn't matter. All that was keeping the undead back were the mass of corpses in the gap where the gate had been. The sheet metal barricade shook. Either it would collapse, or the undead would push their way through. And then... And then the shotgun clicked on an empty chamber. She thrust her hand into the bag, pulling out a shell. Kim, get back now! Bran called. Run! Shell still in her hand, Kim turned and ran, and saw Bran running towards her. The canvas bag was in his hands. She didn't ask, because she could guess. She dived forward behind the relative cover of the car, turning again in time to see Bran hurl the bag over the roiling mass of undead in the gate. He pivoted on his heels, slipped on the ice, pushed himself to his feet, slammed his palm into an approaching zombie's chest, and darted towards the car. Kim finished reloading, raised the shotgun, but couldn't get a clear shot. Bran dived over the bonnet, dragging Kim down just before the bag of grenades detonated. If the sound of the machine gun was like thunder, this was an earthquake, throwing an avalanche of metal and pebbles, gravel and grit, ice and gore, bone and flesh against the sheet metal, the road, and the river either side of the bridge. I thought you'd use the grenades one at a time, Annette said. Too much risk, too little cover, Bran said as he grabbed the machine gun. I need a couple of minutes. Who has ammo? Kim asked, hastily reloading the shotgun. As the ice and snow settled to the ground, all appeared momentarily still. I think you got them all, Ken said. He spoke too soon. A figure lurched out of the snow. Annette and Ken fired at the same time. At least one of them was on target. The zombie fell. Call out your targets, Kim said. We really can't waste the ammo. Mine... Ken said, as another zombie lurched out of the snowy mist. Next is mine, then, Kim said. A minute passed, then two, and then a zombie crawled through the gate on hands and knees. Mine, she said, and fired. I think she's ready, Bran said. And I think we got them, Kim said. That's probably for the best, Bran said. An FN mag isn't the best weapon for this kind of work. That's the type of gun? Dee Dee asked. She is, Bran said, and she's an old friend, or the cousin of an old friend. You used one in the army? Annette asked. Kandahar, Bran said. What happened there? Annette asked. You never told me any stories about your time at war. There's not much to say, Bran said, except that's where I had the best coffee I've ever drunk. I think we're clear. They weren't. Not quite. As they left the cover of the police car and walked slowly towards the barricade, the mound of wrecked bodies and broken limbs undulated. A wretched creature crawled out from underneath. Ken fired. The shot echoed, but silence returned. I can see the boat, Annette said. The new world? Kim asked, not taking her eyes from the twice-dead. No, the sailing boat, Annette said. 
They must have heard the explosion. They're sailing this way. Wave, Kim said. Signal, we're okay. The last thing we need is them coming ashore and us losing the boat or something. She spoke distractedly because there were noises coming from the other side of the barricade. Can you hear that? It's the injured undead, Bran said. So it's not over yet. And then came another sound, an increasingly familiar one, that of running feet slipping on the ice. It was Joan and the others. We heard the gunfire, Joan said. We're not too late. Actually, you're just in time, Bran said. And when I tell you what for, you'll wish you hadn't rushed. We need to clear the bodies by the gate, kill any crawling undead on the other side, get the gate back in position, then move the car in front to keep it closed. So much for getting back late to avoid the hard work, Annette muttered. She looked up, then raised her gloved hand. Hey, I think it's snowing. Kim looked up in time for a heavy drop of water to land on her cheek. That's not snow. It's rain. Chapter 8 Meeting a Consensus Dundalk Technology College Sit down, dear, Mary said. You look exhausted. Annette looked up and giggled. She looks like a lemon. What? You don't think yellow velour suits me? Kim said as she collapsed into the office chair, which then rolled back a few inches on the damp floor. I thought we were going to put down some cardboard. We've already run out, Mary said. And we're down to the last few stitches of dry clothing, Kim said. She took Daisy from Annette's lap. The toddler plucked at the soft yellow cloth and smiled approvingly. We've gone through all the clothes already, Donnie asked. He picked up a thin notebook. What about the suitcases we brought back this afternoon? They contained all of the clothes we found in all of the nearby houses. And before we answer that, I think we should call the meeting to order, Mary said. The long table in the middle of the canteen was half full, and the same could be said for the rest of the dining hall. It wasn't civic-mindedness that had filled the room's other tables, though, but the imminent prospect of dinner. The canteen was rich with a smell of turmeric and cumin, though missing the scent of anything more substantial among those spices. The room was warm, though, thanks to the cooking fires and the second-hand heat of hundreds of people. Some put their books down, some turned away from the games boards, and a handful stood and moved to a table closer to that of the unofficial council. Just as many left the canteen, taking their books and quiet conversation with them. We'll begin with apologies, Mary said. Prudence is too busy in the kitchens to join us. I've got her notes, Donnie said. And Bran is inspecting the sentries, Mary said. You should write that down, dear she added to Annette, and then write down who is present. Myself, Donnie, Kim, Rehinder, and Commander Crawley. You have that? Good. She turned to the room at large. And does anyone want to join us at the council table? No? Well, feel free to chime in if you've got something to add, or if there's something I've forgotten. Daisy squirmed in Kim's lap, trying to reach for Annette's pen. Annette passed Daisy a blue crayon, and the toddler immediately began colouring the table. That it didn't matter was a good summary of what had to be said at the meeting. To begin, then, Mary said. Everyone who went out today has returned. We've a few more bruises, a few extra cuts, but there are no major health issues that need to be discussed. No. Then, Kim... Perhaps you could give a summary of your trip to the waterfront. On balance, it's good news, Kim said, speaking loud enough for her voice to carry to the people at the nearby tables. Good news tempered with a battle. Two battles, I suppose. On the positive side, we found coal at a depot by the waterfront. More coal than we could burn in three months. And some peat, too. We've located somewhere we can board the New World... I'm not sure we can bring the ship up to the seawall, but we can certainly get the small boats close at high tide. It'll take a while to board, but we can manage it. In addition, there's a barracks here in Dundalk, and we found ammunition. 
None for our rifles, not yet, but there's thousands of rounds of 9mm. We're not quite sure how many, but collecting it and searching for more has to be one of our priorities for tomorrow. As for the undead, there were about a thousand on the bridge, another two hundred near the barracks, not counting those that were dead. They were frozen, Annette said. A good stenographer never comments, Mary said. She only writes down what other people say. Were they frozen? At the barracks they were piled together, Kim said. At first we assumed they were dead, but they were waiting, like how we saw them back in England and Wales. Coal, a jetty, and ammunition, Mary said. That is good news to end the day. Now, Rahinda, can you fix suppressors to those submachine guns? Hmm? Rahinda glanced up, only having half heard what was being said. He placed the suppressor on a table next to the dismantled submachine gun. Ah, oh, right. Yes, yes I can. It'll take time. How long? Mary asked. Ask me again in a couple of hours, he said. I'll need that long to work out what tools I'll need. I'll also need more submachine guns on which to practice. I need the barrels anyway. I'd say I can make one or two tonight. To do more, to do enough, to develop a system where we can mass produce them, that will take a few days, but it's dependent on how many guns you find for me to convert. The end result won't be as accurate or as silent as with the assault rifles, but it'll be better than nothing. With electricity, the conversion would be much quicker. And can we have electricity? Donnie asked. What are the chances of getting the turbine to work? The chances? One hundred percent, Rahinda said. The turbine is a relatively simple mechanism. Complexity lies in the transformer, and I'll need at least two days to identify what parts need to be replaced. Assuming that nothing irreplaceable is broken, then it's just a matter of time. But how much time? Pete called from two tables away. It's impossible to say for sure, so I'll say a week, Rahinda said. But I can neither work on the turbine or the suppressors, not on both. And that brings us to defence, Mary said. Donnie, how much ammunition was expended today? Out of the ten thousand rounds that Sholto brought from Belfast this morning, just over a quarter, Donnie said. Then, if the future is like the past, we have three more days, Mary said. Converting those submachine guns must come first. We'll ask Bran to return to the barracks in the morning to find more weapons. We can also conduct a thorough search and count the remaining ammunition. Of course, tomorrow might be worse than today. Mary met Kim's eyes and gave a small nod. The question facing us is twofold, Kim said. How long do we stay in Dundalk, and where do we go afterwards? Yes, there's the turbine, there's coal and peat at the waterfront. We have the remaining grain from the wreck, and we can fish. I don't think we'll find much more old-world food, but this was a town of thirty thousand or so. There are plenty of non-perishable, non-edible supplies. That's all on the positive side of the ledger. On the negative, in three days... We'll have used up all the ammunition Sholto brought us. In two or three weeks, we'll have used up all the ammunition we found in the barracks. Once it's gone, it's gone. There'll be no more from Belfast, and no more lucky finds in this corner of Ireland. If we stay here long enough for a hinder to fix the turbine, we'll be defending it with machetes and knives. The question is whether that's worth the risk. The rains come and it's washing away the snow. She sighed. I liked the snow. My hands are cracked and bleeding, but you could see footprints. We could tell if the undead were ahead of us. It deadened sound. It was our friend. Rain's better than a dry, hot day, but if it's a cold night, the slush will freeze and turn to ice, and that'll be more treacherous to us than to the undead. So you want to go to Belfast? Pete called out. No, Kim said. Personally, I don't. Like I said, there's two questions. How long we stay here, and where we go afterwards. I used to think that whether we kill the zombies now or later, we had to kill them. 
there are just too many. Even here in Ireland, will killing a few hundred more really make our lives easier? Will that make it safer? I thought we might stay here until the grain ran out. Well, that will last longer than the ammunition. If we go to Belfast without the grain, we'll only bring forward the day when they run out of food in that city. So, no, I don't think we should go to Belfast. I'd thought we might go to Dublin. I thought the EU military units might have left behind some ammunition and other gear. Now, I'm not sure. We found a few notebooks, diaries and journals, and we'll need some time to go through them. But I think that Dundalk was where they came, and I think they brought their remaining ammunition with them. In which case, we're unlikely to find anything in Dublin. And we know there's nothing to find elsewhere in Ireland besides... Winter's coming. The weather will only get worse. Worse than a snowstorm? Donny asked. Why not? Kim said. We have to assume it. So why don't we go somewhere warm? France, initially. We'll meet up with Nilda and George. We'll collect Bill and the others. And then we'll go south. We'll look for large ships along the coast of France and Spain. Who remembers getting oranges at Christmas? I remember Seville marmalade in January, Mary said. Seville's in Andalusia, Pete called out. That's the mainland. Then Sicily, Kim said. It was famous for its lemons, wasn't it? It's not much of a diet, Pete said. Lemons go well with fish, Donny said. And where there's a fruit farm, we'll find other crops, Kim said. And if nothing else, we'll stave off scurvy. Vitamin tablets do expire. Maybe it won't be Sicily. It could be Greece or Corsica, Tunisia or Florida. As long as it's somewhere closer to the equator, somewhere warmer than this. What about the people in Belfast and in Elysium? Donny asked. Saboteurs, Pete muttered, though loud enough to be heard. Let's leave them behind. We won't do that, Kim said but we can trust Siobhan, Sholto and the Admiral to find the guilty. Sholto's moved a satellite over the French coast. He's looking for Bill, but they're taking pictures of the coast too. They're looking for ships, ships larger than the New World. We'll find the ships and then live aboard them. We'll sail from place to place, taking what we need, but sleeping aboard where we know we'll be safe from the undead. And that is something for us to think about and discuss, Mary said. A decision on our final destination doesn't need to be made until we're aboard the ship, and we can't do that until we've secured our landing site at the depot. Too coincidentally for it not to have been pre-arranged, a bell rang in the kitchen. Dinner! Annette said cheerily. Is there anything else that needs to be discussed? Mary asked. Toilets and hygiene. Donny said, but if we're only staying in the college for a few more days, it's moot. Then we'll table it for now, Mary said. Let's see what feast Prudence has scared up. It wasn't a feast, but it was hot and plentiful. A thickly spiced barley porridge with odd green lumps that were, apparently, tin spinach. Afterwards, Kim leaned back in her chair and eyed the growing stack of dirty dishes and used cutlery on the trolley by the door. They'd push that to an administrative building on the far side of the campus, along with a clothing too ruined to be worn again. It felt like a waste, yet it was more economical than washing. It wasn't just a matter of boiling the water, but also the use of detergent. Everything took time to find, and nothing lasted as long as it used to. Kim! Would you mind giving me a push? Mary asked. Of course, Kim said. She handed Daisy to Annette and then wheeled Mary to the door, joining the long line of people making their way to the latrine. Perhaps we'll give them a few minutes, Mary said. Why don't we take a look outside? I'd like to see if the rain is washing the snow away or simply adding ice to our list of concerns. Kim pushed Mary down the corridor in the other direction, to the reception area, where Mirabelle was on guard. Her clothing was sodden. 
You just back in? Kim asked. Can, Dee Dee and I are taking it in turns to be out there, Mirabel said. You really can't see much in the rain. It's bad. It's intermittent, Mirabel said. Savage downpours interspersed with brief moments of calm that last just long enough to make you think the worst is over before the clouds dump another ocean on your head. Have you eaten? Mary asked. Not yet. Go ahead and do that, Mary said. We'll keep watch here for a while. Mirabel smiled gratefully and slipped away. The clothes should dry overnight, Kim said. Fifty-seven people came back today like you, their clothing utterly ruined, Mary said. Mostly those who went down to the wreck. Lubricant and oil is leaking from somewhere. Oh, really? Only fifty-seven, and we're already out of spare clothes. If we're to become piratical scavengers... We'll have to develop a more systematic approach to drying and storage. And I'm sure we will in time, Mary said. Sure, the rain's really pounding down. The snow's almost gone. Well, that's a blessing deeply disguised. We'll manage getting to the ship far more easily. Kim glanced around, checking they were alone. The announcement uh, went better than I expected. Because it wasn't a fait accompli. Mary said. It's a better way of governing, don't you think? Holding the meetings in public? I suppose so. Although my worry is that we're not telling everyone everything. It grates keeping secrets from them. Even one so mundane as Siobhan coming tomorrow to search the ship for fingerprints. We'll tell them at breakfast, Mary said. But I was referring to holding the meetings just before a meal— it makes people hurry rather than argue for hours over insignificant minutiae. That's one thing about Anglesey I won't miss. One of the few things, really. Do you honestly think there might be one of the saboteurs here? Kim asked. No, Mary said. But if there is, then announcing we might not go to Belfast should keep them awake tonight. Tomorrow morning, telling them Siobhan is on her way should flush them out. Commander Crawley has selected his people as carefully as he can. If anyone volunteers to join his expedition, then we'll know for sure. Certainty in the trustworthiness of our comrades is a prize worth the price of withholding the information for a few hours. Still, I half wish Siobhan had come tonight, Kim said, but I suppose it's better this way. The sound of the rotors might bring more of the undead, and if there's to be another battle— I'd rather it was fought in daylight. Then again, could a helicopter be louder than that machine gun? Another question that time might answer, but which I hope it won't, Mary said. She rubbed her hand against her forehead. Are you okay? It's just a headache, dear, Mary said. One not helped by this draft. Do you think the barracks will make for a good home? For a night or two, Kim said. It's closer to the depot, and there are bunks and mattresses. More importantly, the barricades have already been built. That'll save us some effort. Burning the coal will, too. And in two days, maybe three, we'll all be aboard and ready to sail. Weather and fate allowing, Mary said. Them, too, Kim said. There's something else. Annette thinks that the soldiers who were here... The ones who left the barracks might have escaped by sea. Yes, she said while you were changing, Mary said, and she said it loud enough for half the canteen to hear. That's for the best. It'll give everyone something to think about other than the precariousness of our current existence. A light flashed in the darkness outside. That's the signal, Kim said, drawing her machete. Mary withdrew a small pistol, almost too big for her hands. Go on, dear. I'll keep guard here. Kim ran out into the rain. An hour later, sodden once more, she closed the door to the office in which she and the girls slept. Both were already asleep, curled up together on the mattress on the floor. The light had been left on. Annette had been writing before she went to sleep. Careful not to drip on the pages, Kim picked up the book. It was an account of the day's adventures. Hey, 
Annette said sleepily. You're back. And you should go back to sleep, Kim said, putting the book on the desk. And you're wet, Annette said. There were zombies outside. Only two of them. Oh, okay, Annette said, and closed her eyes again. The office shared a wall with the kitchens, so there was some second-hand warmth, but an inescapable chill seeped up through the floor. She tried to relax, but found it difficult. There had only been two zombies, but another five bullets had been fired. She unzipped her jacket and hung it on the back of the chair. In the end, her blade hadn't been needed, so the clothes were only wet. She picked up the light. It caught her shoes and the legs of her trousers. They were already as much mud-brown as luminous yellow. She sat on the chair, a finger hovering over the light's button as she watched the two girls sleep. Another few days, perhaps sooner, and they would leave. Except the sooner they left, the sooner she'd have to face the reality of what they'd find in France. It wasn't that she thought Bill was dead. She wouldn't allow herself to think that. It was that they would have so little time to search for him. Mary might say their final destination could be decided when they were on the ship, but once they were aboard, that decision would have to be made swiftly. The new world was a small ship, overcrowded with people. They would have room for perhaps ten days of grain. Fishing would supplement that, stretch it out by a day or three. They couldn't catch fish in a storm, or while underway, nor could they sail even such a large ship as the New World at night, not without satellite navigation and weather reports. Cholto would find some ships along the coast. Nilda and George would probably reach them first. Then the New World would arrive. Some crew would be transferred to complete whatever repairs were needed, along with some fuel from the ship's tanks. And then... And then the clock would be ticking down to the point that the food would run out. If none of the ships were repairable, that clock would only tick faster. Either way, there would be no time to delay. They would have to make for warmer waters whether that was the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, or the southern United States, it would be far from wherever Bill would look. She couldn't leave the girls behind, nor could she take them with her into the French interior, so she couldn't search for Bill herself. Nilda might look for Chester, but duty toward her son might cut that expedition short. Sholto, might search for Bill. In fact, he probably would. But that would just mean more people stranded in France, thousands of miles from wherever the rest of humanity had gone. She turned the light off, uncertain whether or not she hoped their departure would come soon. Part 2 Day 256 The 24th of November the Day of Reckoning Dundalk and Belfast Chapter 9 The Dying Ship Dundalk Technology College Annette stamped her foot. Careful of the mud, Kim said. I was testing whether the ground was frozen, Annette said. That field looks like a... Uh, what's the word beginning with M that means swamp? Morass? Mire? No, the other one. Anyway, that's what it looks like. Do you think the helicopter could land in all that mud? Land, yes. Take off again, I'm not sure. Commander Crawley thinks yes, and Bran agrees, so I'm happy letting it be the pilot's problem. She flexed her hands, then glanced over at the tree line where Donny and Mirabel were standing on the firmer footing of the path at the edge of the playing field. While Kim and Annette were watching for the helicopter, they were watching for the undead. And Siobhan will search the wreck for clues, Annette said. That sounds interesting. Educational, even. Nice try, but no, you're not coming, Kim said. You've got to help Prudence sort through which bags and suitcases we can use. We can't leave until we've packed, and we can't pack until we've got some bags to put our things in. 
I've been more useful on the expedition, Annette said. We have a rotor, Kim said. Fair's fair. Everyone has to take a turn at all the chores. Just be thankful you're not emptying the toilet bins. Yeah, yuck. I'll be glad when we're on a ship with proper plumbing again. Kim nodded. But there would be eight times the ship's normal complement on board. It wouldn't be any more sanitary. Annette would learn that soon enough. There were a lot of hard lessons in front of the girl. She'd grown noticeably reckless over the last week, and that was just one more reason they needed to get aboard the ship. I think I can hear it, Annette said. Yeah, there, see? Kim heard it first, but it was a long few seconds before she saw the helicopter flying in low over the horizon. Watch the helicopter, she said. I'll keep watch for zombies. In truth, she wasn't looking for the undead, but for the living. It would be minutes, if not hours, before any zombies that heard the rotors lurched their way to the field. Her fear was that some person might come trying to inveigle their way onto the expedition, thus revealing themselves as a confederate of the saboteurs. They hadn't before breakfast, nor had anyone appeared on the path while they'd been waiting. Even so, she wouldn't relax until Siobhan had finished her examination of the wreck. The sound of the rotors changed, becoming more high-pitched. Finally, Kim turned around and was in time to see the helicopter thump to the ground. It didn't bounce, but sank into the mud. It really is warming up then, Kim said, but Annette didn't hear. The rotors slowed, the doors opened, and Siobhan climbed out one side, the pilot the other. Siobhan trudged over while the pilot peered at the mud. Good to see you again, Kim said. And you, Shalto sends his love. I bet he didn't say that, Annette said. It's the sentiment that counts, Siobhan said. Which way to the ship? You don't want to get inside and warm up first. There's no time, Siobhan said. I should have come yesterday. Why, what's happened? Kim asked. Nothing, Siobhan said. That's the trouble. I've eliminated another two hundred suspects, but that still leaves me with over a thousand people on the list. Commander Crawl is waiting, Kim said. We'll go straight to the wreck. Then I'll stay here and guard the helicopter, Annette said. What? Someone has to. Okay, but then you're to go back to the college and help Prudence, Kim said. Together, Kim and Siobhan trudged across the field. How is it back in Belfast? Kim asked. It could get worse. Siobhan said, it might get worse. It probably will if we don't catch the saboteurs. They reached Donnie and Mirabel. Can you give the pilot a hand, then make sure she and Annette get back to the college? Kim said. You want me to trek through that? Donnie said with a smile. Do you know how much these shoes cost? They all looked down at the red and white ankle-high sneakers. If you show me the receipt, I'll pay you every euro, Mirabel said. Would you prefer cash or card? Come on. Is everyone as cheerful as them? Siobhan asked, as she and Kim continued along the path. No one is as ever cheerful as Donnie, Kim said, but by and large, yes. There's a lot of anxiety, of course, but the mood's pretty upbeat. We told them the plan last night, living on ships, heading south. I think it's helped that we have a few different options ahead of us. I've got some good news on that score. When Callie called to say that the helicopter was on its way... She said she'd just found some ships off the coast of France. She has. Well, that's something. I don't think she's moved from that computer since yesterday, but I was expecting the search to take weeks. Charlto's going to the airport this morning. Did Callie tell you? He wanted to come here himself, but that expedition is more important. If we can get more of the aviation fuel back to Belfast, we can ferry the coal back to the city by air. That'll cut down the amount of firewood we need. Are you running out? Kim asked. Only due to inefficiency, Siobhan said. With too many people spread across too many warehouses that are just too difficult to heat. With fires for light and more still for cooking. Worse, the buildings in the harbour are mostly made of steel and cladding. The houses close to the checkpoint have been stripped down to the floorboards and we've ripped up most of those too. We've enough wood for the next week. But within two, we'll have to venture far beyond the checkpoints, and that brings risks of its own. The coal would be a godsend. It would be solidly good news. 
something tangible people could feel in the heat it gave off. There's another issue you need to be aware of. Another? The Admiral's facing a mutiny in her ranks. Some of his sailors, mostly the original American crew, along with some of the Marines, want to go home. Back to the U.S. And they're prepared to take one of the ships to do it. With a new world here in Dundalk, that means the Amundsen. The Admiral has placed more of her people on board, but since the trouble comes from her people, it's impossible to know if that's helped or simply added to the mutineers' ranks. How serious is it? Kim asked. At the moment, it's just an increasingly vocal grumbling. The danger will come in a week or three, if it seems like they're never going back to the U.S. There'll be a confrontation, and I don't know whether her people will fire on one another or whether she'll let them take the ship. Could they be connected to the sabotage? I don't think so. And I don't think they'll harm any of the civilians, though it's increasingly difficult to tell which of us belongs to that group. There might be an accidental death or two if it comes to a head. My real concern is for the children. If you've taken the New World to France, and if the Admiral sends the Amundsen North for more fuel and to keep it out of the way, then that leaves the John Cabot as the most likely ship for them to take. And the children are all aboard. It's the safest place for them, Siobhan said. There's nowhere else for them to go. And there's nothing you can do, I know, but I thought you should be aware of quite how fraught it's all becoming. So much for going to Sicily, Kim said. They turned the corner and saw Commander Crawley waiting in the car park. Kim did a quick head count, but there were no new volunteers. Crawley saw her gaze sweep over his team. Everyone I've selected is here, all present and very much correct, he said. Detective? Just call me Siobhan. Where's the crime scene? Commander Crawley led the way, but his team were just as familiar with it, having made this journey many times during their brief stay in Dundalk. Kim and Siobhan brought up the rear. This is almost pleasant, Siobhan said. It is? Kim asked. Compared to Belfast, I didn't notice the smell of that place until we left. The fresh air is doing me good. Cold smoke will be a real improvement. You think that will work? Ferrying coal to Belfast? Siobhan glanced ahead. You haven't heard from Chief Watts? She asked quietly. Heard what? He's off the coast of Anglesey with Miguel and Sophia Augusto. The power plant is leaking. Radiation is spilling into the Irish Sea. They've had to move back twenty miles. Twenty miles? Already? Give it a few months and we'll have a band of radioactive seawater stretching from Ireland to Wales. Siobhan said. Now, whether it's north of the Isle of Man, to the south, or whether that island takes the full brunt of the leak, time will tell. It'll also tell us how much radiation is leaking, and whether it's a danger worth us worrying over. Considering how many bombs fell earlier this year, could one power station really make much difference? They're advising we avoid fishing in the area and avoid using the Irish Sea as a passageway up to Svalbard, at least until spring, possibly summer, and maybe a lot longer than that. So, a couple of weeks and we'll have no choice but to leave Dundalk. In no longer than a month, Siobhan said, yes, we'll have to leave the Irish East Coast. Belfast might be habitable for a little longer, perhaps a little less depending on the currents. That's why we're concerned about the coal. In Elysium, they don't have the luxury of houses to rip apart. They felled most of the nearby trees, but green wood is a poor source of heat. The turbines are providing them with electricity while the wind is blowing, but they've been having too many cold but windless days. They need the coal more than Belfast. Does the helicopter have the range to reach them? Not for a return journey, Siobhan said carrying aviation fuel there by air, just so we can then fly another mission carrying coal, rather makes a mockery of the whole business. Sholto's taking a specialist with him, who'll inspect the other helicopters parked near the airport. Perhaps one of the larger vehicles can be repaired. If not, we'll have to consider moving the coal by sea. Using the Amundsen? Perhaps. Or Heather Jones could bring some of her smaller boats up around the coast. That raises a question of how much time it would take 
before it's no longer safe for them to travel up through the Irish Sea. An alternative might be to fly the coal west, to Malin Head, or perhaps straight to an island in Connemara. That's where the plans begin to get truly desperate. The logistics are a nightmare, and I can't see them improving. It's so complex, isn't it? And all for some coal. Heating isn't even our biggest problem. We've just got to hold on until March, Siobhan said, and to do that, we've got to survive the next few weeks. A flurry of movement came from the front of the column as a zombie staggered out from behind a wrecked van. As its outflung arms smashed into the dangling wing mirror, three bullets hit the creature, two in the chest, one in the head. Call out your shots, Commander Crawley barked. We can't waste bullets. Reload. Was he always like this? Siobhan whispered. He's still blaming himself for the shipwreck, Kim murmured. That, and he's not used to this type of command. His is a more technical background. Still, it's a style that works. Move out! Crawley barked. Siobhan paused when they reached the corpse and gave it a long second glance. You okay? Kim asked, wondering if Siobhan recognized the person the dead zombie had been. I'm weary, Siobhan said, but yes. With forced cheerfulness, she added, That's the first zombie I've seen today. And it was the last zombie they saw until they reached the shore. Fletcher, Hart, guard the road, Crawley said. You know the signal. The rest of you, watch your footing on the beach. Watch the corpses. Not all are our people. I don't know what I was expecting, Siobhan said. It wasn't this. The ship had run aground parallel to the shore, then tipped over, leaving the deck facing landward. Part of the superstructure had collapsed onto the rock-strewn and oil-coated shore. Railings, wires and deck plates had followed, with a giant fissure running along the deck from prow to stern. The ship creaked. A monstrous wail was followed by a rumbling splash as some hidden part of the keel fell into the sea. As it did, a squadron of gulls took flight from the uppermost side of the deck. Two flew inland, while the rest circled before returning to their perch. Kim turned away from the ship to watch the birds flying inland. They weren't heading to the college. Now she considered it, she couldn't recall seeing any birds there. Perhaps it was the snow. And again, the wreck was surely more exposed than some inland perch. So why were the birds here? And then she realized. The water surrounding the ship was dark with oil. Successive tides had dragged the foul liquid onto the beach where it had coated the hundreds of corpses. Dead passengers, survivors who'd never made it off the beach, the zombies they'd killed when they'd first come ashore and those they'd fought when coming to collect the grain. They were indistinguishable from one another. The birds had come to feast on the dead passengers, and there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. Is it safe for anyone to go inside the ship? Kim asked, and her words broke the spell. There was a sudden shuffling of feet, a rising and lowering of weapons, and a muted clearing of throats, collectively indicating how utterly still the group had been. In turn, their immobility showed how much the wreck's appearance had changed since their expedition to the ship the previous afternoon. It's safe enough, Commander Crawley said, then immediately gave the lie to his reply. Only the detective and I will go inside. Siobhan took out a smartphone and took a quick panoramic picture of the wreck. Evidence, she said, for the trial and there surely deserves to be one. Go, Kim said. We'll keep watch out here. Eyes went to the corpses, and she decided to channel the commander herself. Eyes out! Watch the approach, and I'll watch the dead. She regretted that almost immediately, when a shallow wave washed against a body. Its arm rose, and she was only half certain the motion was caused by the incoming tide. She slipped on the rocks, as she staggered towards it, and managed ten paces before she saw that its skull had been crushed. Spread out, she said, further up the beach, away from the dead. They were dead, every last one. She repeated that to herself 
as she slipped and splashed from rock to puddle to pool. If they were alive, if they were undead, they would have heard their party approach. Zombies would certainly have heard the ship tearing itself apart. She repeated that over and over to herself, as a distraction from the broken limbs, the crushed bodies, and the familiar faces of those she'd known on Anglesey, though too often only by sight. She staggered and slid over the rocks, seaweed, limbs, and metal. She tripped on the once prized possessions that had spilled from the suitcases and bags that survivors had so carefully packed and repacked. Her feet sank ankle-deep into the salty, oily, bloody brine, until a rending clatter echoed from the ship. Reflexively, she jumped back and nearly fell as her foot caught on a dismembered arm. She caught herself and looked up in time to see one of the on-deck ventilation pipes topple sideways, then down, slamming into the lid of the open hatch through which Siobhan and Crawley had climbed. Move another ten metres from the ship, she called. No, make it twenty, quick now. As fast as she could, she picked her way over to the side of the ship. The water grew deeper, the bodies more numerous, the seawater thicker with oil. A low rasp of tortured metal came from deep within the ship, then a sharper, metallic ping as rivets burst. There was a clattering bang as a metre-square plate burst from the ship, splashing down on the water and bodies below. Above, the birds took flight, this time in a far larger flock than before. Hundreds of the creatures took wing, circling high above the wreck. Siobhan! Commander! Kim called as she neared the hatch, knowing they wouldn't hear. The ship was tearing itself apart. She'd have to go in, find them, and pull them out. Ignoring the sheer impossibility of that, she reached up and was about to haul herself up to the hatch when Siobhan's head appeared in it. Kim jumped down and back, giving the woman time to clamber out. Crawley was just behind. Move! he said but Kim didn't need the encouragement. Even more heedless than before, she ran over rocks and the dead away from the wreck, slowing only when she was above the high oil mark. Did you get what you needed? she asked Siobhan. Hard to say, Siobhan said. Have to get the evidence back to the lab. That remark was more for the rest of the team than for Kim, but she knew full well there was no lab not this side of the end of the world. Back off, Crawley said. Back up, all the way to the road. Kim was about to ask why, but then she heard it. Rather, she realized that the sound had been there all along, a low rumbling vibration that had been slowly building in tempo. Run, Crawley said, just as the broken ship screamed. Rivets burst, plates fell, and the second fissure appeared on the ship, running across the deck from port to starboard. In two pieces, the ship collapsed onto prow and stern, and then it was still. A solitary bird detached itself from the circling flock, tentatively landing on the edge of the gaping fissure between the two sections of ship. Almost as soon as it had set down, it took flight again, beating its wings twice before, again coming to settle on the wreck. One by one, the other birds returned to their precarious perch. O oh, hear us when we cry to thee, Crawley murmured, for those in peril on land and sea. The sound of the gunshot was a whisper. The sound of the bullet hitting brick was a sharp crack that echoed down the flooded street. Hold your fire, Crawley called. I said hold your fire! Though he added, turning around to face the unfortunate man who'd missed his shot. You and I'll be having words about accuracy and aim when we get back to the college. The young man was a new recruit, one of about half in their group, but they were quickly becoming indistinguishable from the old hands. Crawley turned around again and joined everyone else watching the zombie. Five minutes after they'd stopped to search a row of terraced cottages for usable clothes, 
the zombie had staggered out of a narrow alley that led to the cottage's rear gardens. Since then, the creature had shambled a further five feet. Its shoulders had shivered, its head shook, and its mouth shuddered. But other than its feet slowly sliding through the muddy mulch coating the flooded roadway, it didn't seem able to move. It might be dying. It might not. But I think that's long enough, Kim said. She fired. The zombie sloshed into the overfall gutter. A banging clatter came from inside a house behind her. Sorry! A shout came, and was followed by a loud splashing, before a woman appeared in the doorway. The ground floor is entirely flooded, the kitchen's ruined, but, uh... She held up a battered suitcase. I got clothes! Fall in, then, Crawley said. We'll wait for the others. We've the same problem back on Anglesey, Siobhan said. It makes me worried what it'll be like next year when the homes have collapsed and the clothes are nothing but rotten sheets. Ah, well. Kim checked that no one could overhear, but the sentries were watching either end of the street, while Crawley was watching the buildings into which the rest of their group had gone, searching for clean clothes to replace their now oily rags. Honestly, she asked, do you think you found anything useful on the wreck? Truly, I can't be certain until I've had a chance to examine the pictures, Javon said. At best, it's a couple of fingerprints and a few tool marks. That doesn't sound like much to go on. Not really. What was more useful was Commander Crawley showing me what damage was done and explaining how. That paints a picture of the type of person I'm looking for, if not precisely who. And? The damage to the ship was not done by a professional sailor. She said, an engineer, yes, someone who could work out the theory from first principles, but not someone familiar with a ship's systems. That's why you were fortunate enough that it ran aground before it sank. The plane is an entirely different matter. Destroying it would have been easy. Ensuring that it was able to get a lot required a pilot at the very least. One familiar with that variety of plane, if not that specific machine itself. I think they wanted that plane to take off and then crash, so that a search party would be sent out to find it. Because our more capable fighters will be sent on the rescue mission? I think so. We'd have been divided and distracted, Kim said. Well, we are. They got what they wanted. But the plane is key, Siobhan said. Finding someone with experience in aeronautical engineering is less of a needle in a haystack and more like looking for a thimble in a dark room. Mary had a list of pilots during the summer, Kim said. And it might not be a pilot, Javon said, and not every pilot might have come forward. It'll be a start. It's not much of a lead, but it's good enough. I'll need a week, maybe five days. We'll find them. Kim nodded. She hoped Siobhan would, and didn't want to think what might happen if she didn't. Crawley checked his watch. Time's up, he called loudly. Everyone out with whatever you found. Kim turned her attention back to the road, almost grateful for such an easy task as keeping watch for the undead. Chapter 10 All That Was Sought Belfast Harbour Siobhan's helicopter has just taken off, Sholto said closing the command center's office door behind him. Take it off safely, too. She should be in Don Dock within the half hour. Good. Callie, call Kim, the admiral said. Let her know Siobhan is on her way. In a moment, Callie said. When an admiral gives an order, I I is the only acceptable response, Whitley said. In a moment, Callie said again. You need to see this first, all of you. See what? Shalto asked before Whitley had a chance to explode. I found ships, Callie said, opening up the laptop. A lot of ships. Where? Shalto asked. France, Callie said. See? The Admiral, Shalto and Whitley all leaned forward to peer at the screen. I would call those boats rather than ships, Whitley said. Is that vessel the largest? It's an eight-crew trawler. He leaned closer to the screen. Its home fishing grounds are probably the North Sea, 
but it wouldn't venture too far from the shore. I doubt it would survive an Atlantic crossing. That yacht might have done once, but most of the keel is missing. Have you counted them? There's fifty-seven ships on this stretch of beach, all dragged up above the high tide mark, Callie said. It's hard to gauge how long that beach is, but I'd say we can see about three hundred meters in that picture. And it's France? the Admiral asked. Not just France, Callie said. That's Dunkirk. I'm almost positive. Well, that section of beach is about a mile south of the town, but I think there are ships, okay, boats, all along that stretch of coast. There's still too much cloud to be certain how many, but there are a lot more boats than you can see on that photograph. I would say at least two hundred. Possibly five times that number. But possibly not, Whitley said. It's always dangerous drawing conclusions about hostile territory from a single image. The other photographs are obscured by cloud, Callie said, but the wind seems strong. The clouds are moving. We'll get clearer pictures as the weather improves. The wind brings change, not necessarily an improvement, Whitley said. Can you zoom in? No, not on the ships, on the water. The shallows? Thank you, yes. And move seaward. Hmm. I thought so. Are they wrecks? The Admiral asked. It looks like it, Whitley said. They dragged as many as they could onto the sand, but ran out of room and left the rest in the shallows. Well, they ran out of time to drag them ashore, the Admiral said. It was a flotilla then, Shalto said, like the ships that ended up in Anglesey. Or pertinently, they're too small, the Admiral said. Heather Jones already has a fleet of small vessels, and we know they are seaworthy. Just because those boats have been dragged above the high water mark doesn't mean they've been protected from the elements. The opposite, in fact, Whitley said, assuming that France had as hot a summer as Wales. So they're useless to us? Callie asked, unable to keep the smirk from her face. Not useless, the Admiral said. If we have time and if we have need, we know where we can salvage parts and perhaps a small hull or two. Our immediate need is for far larger ships than these. And you know that, don't you, Callie? Shelter said. So why are you smiling? Because it's proof, Callie said. Siobhan's always saying that a theory is just a story until you find the evidence, but that evidence never falls in your lap. Well, here it is. Here's the evidence. This is where all the boats from England went. To Dunkirk? Shelter said. That's obvious, really, Callie said. Didn't Bell say that there were no boats along the Thames? And when the vehement searched the coast, they found all the docks were empty. So where did the ships go? To a place that everyone who's read a history book knows has a shallow beach, the Admiral said. Although this only explains where the small boats went, not the larger vessels. Look at her smile, Shalto said. She hasn't finished. You haven't, have you? Nope. Callie said. Her grin grew even wider as she enjoyed the moment. You have a radio call to make, Whitley said. Right, sorry, Callie said. So the beaches around Dunkirk is where the small ships went. And if you were the captain of a big ship, and all the little ships had gone there, where would you go? Dunkirk itself, Whitley said. It had a thriving port. No, the port's gone. The entire town, too. That's been utterly destroyed. Callie said, her newly returned enthusiasm undiminished. Finding the port was how I know where the satellite is above. Dunkirk is a ruin, and it had to have been obliterated right at the beginning of the outbreak, because that's not where the big ships went. She brought up a different window. On the screen, partially obscured by clouds, were a dozen large ships inside an artificial harbour. One, moored close to the sea wall, even had a gangplank leading down to a jetty. Where's that? the Admiral asked. The port of Calais, Callie said. This is the best picture, but there are at least two more ships beneath that swatch of cloud. John? the Admiral asked. Hmm, yeah, possibly. That's a Norwegian postal freighter, carried the mail and passengers through the fjords. It'll have a reinforced hull, reasonable fuel storage, but storage capacity for fresh water is as much of an issue for us as fuel or food. 
I would say it has a maximum capacity of 500 souls. Okay, so what about this one? Callie said, pointing at a larger and far sleeker silhouette. That's a military ship, right? That's a Russian destroyer, Whitley said. Norway and Russia, I think that suggests these didn't come from England after all. Oh, well, that doesn't matter, Callie said. The destroyer is large enough, isn't it? We could fit a few thousand people on board. One thousand, maybe, Whitley said. But the ship's system software will be encrypted. I'm sure our hackers in Dundalk could crack it, Shalto said. Do they speak Russian? Whitley asked. Well, this one, then, Callie said, frustration returning. It's a cruise ship, yes, a massive one. With berths for about five thousand passengers and about half that number of crew, Whitley said. Then that's more than big enough, Callie said. It's listening to port, Whitley said. Do you see the shadow cast by the bridge? Compare the angle with that of the radio mast on the freighter. You mean it's sinking? The Admiral asked. Probably partially flooded below decks, Whitley said. What about that one? Callie asked, pointing at another ship. That's a car ferry, Whitley said. It's not suitable for the open sea. Ah, so, so this won't do? Callie asked. I'm, I'm not sure, Whitley said. But I'm not sure we want a cruise ship either. We need something with a large fuel tank. Cruise ships were built to spend only a few nights away from port. Space for a fuel tank was space that you couldn't sell to paying passengers. Fuel you don't need is extra weight, and so a burden on your bottom line. Out of all the ships there, I'd put the cruise ship just above the car ferry, but still at the bottom of the list. The destroyer, that's more our kind of vessel. It'll have a large fuel and fresh water storage capacity, and an equally large store for munitions. We could use that space for food or even hydroponics. I thought you said it won't do because its systems will be encrypted, Callie said. He's saying that we shouldn't get our hopes up just yet, the Admiral said. But I think we found a location to send Leon and George to investigate. We should keep this to ourselves for now. Is the satellite still overhead? Over Cali, yes, Cali said. But it's so cloudy. Get some more images, the Admiral said. Not just of the ships, but also the city and the roads leading from it. And some of the port in Dunkirk, Whitley said. Why? Cali asked. I told you it's a ruin. Because someone sailed those ships into Calais and left them there, Whitley said. It's possible that their captains and crew died. It is even possible that they are all still alive, living in the town in a more secure redoubt than we are. It is more likely, however, that the reason they didn't return to those ships is that they burned the last of their fuel to reach Calais and found the fuel tanks there already dry. But Dunkirk if it's such a ruin that no ships can approach, might still have an intact fuel store. That's a long shot, Callie said. But okay. Aye, aye, Whitley muttered. And you need to call Kim first, Shalto said. Let her know the helicopter is on its way. Yeah, okay. I'll call them now, Callie said. Speaking of which, Shalto said, I should get moving. Your team is ready? The Admiral asked. Ready and waiting, Shalto said. He delayed their departure so he could make sure the helicopter took off safely. It was under constant guard, and the mechanics had spent half the night checking every system, and the rest of the night rechecking each other's work. Even so, he'd not wanted to leave until he was sure the helicopter was on its way to Dundalk. He glanced again at the screen. That's a helicopter there, isn't it? on the rear deck of the destroyer. And isn't that another one there, on the dock side? A Sikorsky S-92, Whitley said, barely glancing at the laptop. Take photographs of the helicopters near the airport anyway, the Admiral said. If we say five days for Leon and George to reach Calais, another five for a ship to be sent with a repair crew and oil, and then three to return here, we're looking at another two weeks here in the harbor. Heather Jones can expect to remain in Elysium for at least one week beyond that. We need that coal, and we can't afford the time, ships, or people to ferry it by sea. 
No. We need that aviation fuel. And if we're to be here at least another two weeks, then repairing a helicopter would be a welcome distraction. Then I'll see you this evening, Sholto said. Good job, Callie, he added. I think you just saved the human race. He closed the door to the cabin, glad that he was no longer deciding the satellite's positions. If he had been, and if he'd found the ships in Calais, he would have immediately begun the search for Bill. Except that finding the crashed plane didn't mean finding his brother. Even if he found a building with a painted message on the roof, as they had in London, that wouldn't mean Bill was rescued. Only after Nilda and George reached France, only after they found ships with watertight hulls and repairable engines, could a search party be dispatched inland. It would take days to reach the crash site, and by then, Bill would have begun his long journey home, in which case, surely Bill would head for Dunkirk or Calais. Surely. Maybe. Perhaps. It was that uncertainty that made Sholto want to drop everything and move all three satellites over the French interior. Yes, it was a good thing he wasn't sitting at that laptop. The warehouse buzzed with conversation, though the volume was kept low in deference to the handful of guards resting after a long night's shift. Colum, Leo Fennick and his sister, Judge Nicola Kennedy, stood by the breakfast table. It was an optimistic name for a box of economy brand tea, instant coffee, and a row of mostly empty thermos flasks. Colum had tried to brighten it up with a bright blue plastic cloth and a chalk board with a joke of the day, but no one wanted to be cheerful after a meagre breakfast of fishy gruel. Thanks to the rainstorm, they had water. Thanks to the need to keep people occupied, they had firewood to burn. Thanks to the rising discontent, they weren't even attempting to ration tea and coffee. Ah, Thaddeus, Fenwick said, catching Sholto's arm. Has the court finished for the morning? Sholto asked. It was a quiet docket this morning, Kennedy said. Another divorce, but also two requests for marriage licenses. Marriage licenses? Oh, that's good news, Sholto said. Not for me, Kennedy said. I spent half the night trying to remember what they should contain. It has their names and that of the witnesses. That was sufficient for them. So I think it will be sufficient for us. At least that was a simple problem to solve. And speaking of problems, how goes the search for ships? Sholto didn't need to look around to know that the off-duty sailors were listening. He chose his words carefully, knowing that what he said would spread quickly around the harbour, but that if he said nothing, it would spread even faster. I'd say we can be quietly optimistic, he said. There are hundreds of sailing and fishing boats on the beaches of Dunkirk, pulled up above the high tide mark. We think they belong to people who fled England. Of course, we won't know if they're seaworthy until George and Leon get there in a few days. But what about larger ships? Fenwick asked. Ships large enough for all of us. If before the room had been quiet enough to hear a pin drop, now it went quiet enough to hear that pin rust. There's a lot of cloud cover, Sholto said, stalling to give himself time to think. So I won't say anything until the clouds have cleared and we have a few more pictures. Then you have found something, Fenwick said. We've got to wait on the clouds, Sholto said. And even then we'll have to wait until George gets there, and Leon still hasn't reached London. It'll be four or five days before we know anything for sure. So with that in mind, there's work to be done. You're after the airport? Colum asked. The industrial site, where the fuel tankers are parked, yes, Sholto said. We don't need to go to the airport itself, and won't, unless we're running ahead of schedule. But that'll depend on the weather as much as the undead. Doesn't it always? Colum said. Within the room, the background noise rose again, as the sailors realized that nothing more would be shared. Fenwick seemed to sense that, too. He lowered his voice as he spoke addressing his sister. Tell him about the rumor. It's nothing, 
Kennedy said, giving her brother a glare. It's just something I've heard a couple of times from suspects and witnesses. I wouldn't give it any weight. Well, now I am intrigued, Charlto said. What is it? In that journal of his, Kennedy said, your brother wrote that in Elysium he'd found a list of safe houses and a set of codes. Palace Kenry was the only safe house he named, but he wrote that there were more. The rumour is that there are enough supplies in these places to keep everyone alive for a century, and that you and the Admiral are deliberately not sharing it. There's another rumour, Fenwick said, two, actually. One is that you have the list and won't share it with the Admiral. The other is that she's taken it and won't share it with anyone else. Bill should have learned from his time in England. Chalto said. He should have stopped writing that wretched journal. You mean, there is a list? Fenwick said. A list of places just like Palace Kenry, Chalto said. According to Locke, they had a few weapons, sometimes a bit of food. It was somewhere for her people to go for a night or two, but no longer. I asked her. Well, that list can't help us. Only we can do that. But I'll take as my cue. Colum said, putting his mug onto an already full tray. I wish I was going with you, but Siobhan wanted me to stay here in the harbour while she's down in Dundalk. I've gone over the route with Dean and Lena. You shouldn't have any troubles, but if you do, I want to hear all about them this evening. Safe journey. He picked up the tray, nodded, and left. And I need to take the evidence to the armoury, Kennedy said. And that's something else we should discuss. What evidence and records we need to keep and for how long. I might have had a light docket this morning, but I filled three boxes with papers. We've too much paperwork? Sholto asked. That's the kind of problem I like to have. Sholto went over to his bunk to gather his gear. It was just where he'd left it. But who would steal it? He picked up his rifle and then his day pack, opening it to check the contents for the third time. Spare magazines, water bottle, torch, rope, collapsible spade, flares, matches, bolt cutters, bandages, and glue, because they had no other medical supplies. He hadn't packed any food, but Private Petrelli was collecting that. The most bulky item in the bag was the other empty bag. That was there in case they came across anything worth looting and that really said it all. He had another bag, a duffel containing his worldly possessions, but that was even emptier. It contained a diminishing collection of spare clothes, a few books he'd spent the last thirty years promising himself to one day read, and a few photographs of his newly found family which he'd taken during that long, hot summer. There was an exercise book, too, in which he'd attempted to write an account of his life in America, before the outbreak. It began with the happier memories, of the time he'd hitched and hiked to Crossfield's Landing, of the summer he'd spent in Portland, and the winter he'd spent in Austin. Each time, though, he'd stalled. Each remembered conversation came with the realization that those he'd known were surely dead. He pushed the duffel bag under his bunk, slung his day pack over his shoulder, and left the warehouse to collect the rest of the expedition. Chapter 11 Lost Friends Belfast Dean and Lena were waiting on the harbour side of the checkpoint with Gloria Rycroft, and the way the former actuary was awkwardly holding Lena's bow, and the way that Dean was trying not to smirk, they were halfway through an archery lesson. Sholto waved and slowed his pace. He'd have preferred Colum as a guide, but if anyone knew how to keep peace on the waterfront, it was the boxer. They just needed a couple of days of calm, long enough for Leon to reach London, and then George and Nilda to reach Calais. Even if the engines on just one ship could be repaired, that might give enough hope, enough confidence, enough calm that the entire community wouldn't collapse. More personally, it would give Leon time to send a team inland to find Bill. Yes, if they could just hold on for a few more days, if they could find one ship that worked, if the undead remained few, the weather improved, 
the fish plentiful, and the sabotage quiet, then they all might live long enough to see Christmas. After that, the struggle would begin again. Are we ready? Gloria asked. Cholto patted his rifle, then his water bottle. I just need to get my bike. You? Gloria handed the bow back to Lena. Ready enough? Ostensibly, Gloria Rycroft was joining the expedition to double-check the amount, and thus the weight of aviation fuel left near the airport. That was a task anyone could do, but Siobhan thought she was reliable, a potential leader in their flattened hierarchy. From what Sholto had seen during the battle on the motorway, he agreed. More pertinently, as Gloria had been in Belfast while the sabotage was taking place on Anglesey, she could be trusted. Where are the others? Sholto asked. Theo's gone ahead to check the barricades, Gloria said. Luca is collecting our food. Specialist Thelonious Toussaint and Private Luca Petrelli were the military escort for the mission. Really, that was two more than could be spared. The front between the harbour and the mainland was narrow. Their defences incorporated the walls of warehouses, the fences surrounding them, razor wire reclaimed from inside the harbour, cement from the aggregate depot, and rubble from the many ruins. They'd set up checkpoints at the road junctions, that by rights should be called fortresses, and fitted them with searchlights powered by car batteries. Even so, it required two hundred personnel on duty at any time, operating in four shifts per day. More were required to act as sentries for the groups gathering firewood, clothing, crockery, and other supplies from Belfast. They were able to reduce that number slightly by sending out daily patrols deep into the city to hunt down the undead that drifted in from the countryside. All told, over a thousand people had taken up arms, and for most, it was for the first time since the chaos following the outbreak. They were stretched beyond thin, but they hadn't seen a great number of zombies since the exodus from Anglesey. Not yet. They only had a few minutes to wait for Petrelli. He arrived pushing a bicycle, on which was slung a backpack, the same style as the one Sholto carried. Like the blue and grey trousers and jackets that had become their uniform, the bags had been found during the search of the shipping containers on the John Cabot. Did you get the food? Sholto asked. Lunch and dinner, Petrelli said, unless we get hungry. Guess what a group ripping up the floorboards in Duncan Gardens found. Tin raspberries. My vote is we follow their example and see if we can't find something similar. Yeah, that's not a bad idea, Dean said. I'm getting sick of fish and barley. Malin head, Lena said. Straban, Anaskillen, Kalair, Kilcormac. Yeah, okay, Dean said. I get your point. What point? Gloria asked. She's reminding me of the places where I wished I'd had anything to eat. Even fish, Dean said. I, I never used to like it. Sholto smiled. There was a lesson he used to give candidates before they'd attempt their first town hall debate. You can only lead people where they want to go, so make sure to pick their destination before you begin. If we see anywhere promising to loot, we'll look, he said. We need a safe road route to get the fuel from those tankers back here. Assuming they're still there, Dean said. Assuming that, Shalto said. But the tankers were there when they went to collect the plane. Who would have moved them since? We need a route we can bring a tanker back, or perhaps a couple of hundred people on bikes, each carrying a jerry can. I don't know which will be safer, but this is a task that needs to be finished quickly and safely. One day and done, I like that, Petrelli said. What about the helicopters? We're to take photographs of the engines. He hesitated, but he could see no purpose in hiding the truth, certainly not from these people whom he trusted. We've found a ship or three in France. Whether they'll still work is another matter. On the photographs, there are a couple of helicopters, too. We might only need spares and fuel from near the airport, though we're at least five days away from when we'll have people in France who can perform a, a manual inspection. Either way, we will need the fuel. 
Everyone ready? We should reach the tankers by one o'clock, and be back here by five. It's only a forty-mile round trip, and the rain seems to have washed away the snow. Assuming there isn't too much ice, we should make good time and have some to spare for looting. But only if we don't dawdle. Let's move out. Hang on a bit, Petrilli said. I just need the latrine. Ten minutes later, and already behind schedule, they met Specialist Tucson to the checkpoint itself. The ten guards were alert, watching every direction except the harbor. The corpses of the undead had been pushed aside, clearing a route for the scavengers and patrols going into Belfast. But there were too many corpses to bury. Each day, despite the patrols that walked the distant streets of the city's far boundaries, more zombies found their way to the noisy, bustling harbor. Each day someone was injured, though usually in the course of a day's normal labor. Every few days someone would die. Occasionally from injuries sustained during combat with the undead, but usually due to the long-term effects of radiation poisoning, or from a mundane infection, untreatable without antibiotics. It was a slow attrition that had begun in the summer and for which the handful of births couldn't compensate. The harbour was doomed, but Sholto had known that within a few hours of arriving. If it wasn't for the sabotage... He, he wasn't sure what they would have done, or where they would have gone. Perhaps he'd have taken the plane, but perhaps Scott Hickson would have refused to fly. Perhaps the Admiral's plan would have carried the day, and they'd have gone to Connemara. But they would have exchanged the dangers of the undead for islands with scant cover and fewer resources. Did that make Kim right about living aboard ships? Would that life be any better? Wasn't it just kicking the can down the road, drifting from one wild scheme to the next, hoping to hold everyone together long enough for the undead to die, for spring to come, and for some miraculous future to arrive? Perhaps. But perhaps the lesson of the last nine months was that that was all they could hope for. They reached Duncairn Gardens and got a resentful glare from the work gangs ripping up the last of the floorboards. It was work that had to be done. They needed fuel for heat, for cooking, for boiling water, and had already consumed the meagre stores of coal and peat found in the city. They sorely needed the coal from Dundalk, but at least finding firewood kept people occupied during the day and exhausted at night. Without the work, would boredom set in? Would that then turn to resentment, and then to revolution? It was made worse by the guards, dressed in their blue and grey uniform, while the work gang were dressed in the looted clothes they'd recently found. They looked more like prisoners than volunteers. And they were volunteers. There were some in the harbour who refused to do any work. Even Leo Fennec had joined those advocating issuing food for work but that would only precipitate a mutiny. Policy is easy, Sholto muttered. It's implementation that's hard. What's that? Gloria asked. I was just reminding myself why I never became a candidate, Sholto said. They soon left Duncan Gardens behind. Cliftonville Road became Old Park Road. They went down Ballysillen and then up Ligonil. The roads were mostly ice-free, but as the snow had melted, it had washed the mud to the gutters. With the drains long since blocked, the roadside was flooded, while the median, now clean of dirt and debris, was revealed to be cracked and potholed. They passed a burned-out church and a parade of smashed windowed shops. Outside a three-aisle supermarket, they paused so Petrelli could find a tree. They didn't need to go inside the store to know it had been looted down to the shelves. A quarter mile beyond that, on the very outskirts of the city, they saw their first zombie of the day. The creature's lurid pink shorts were a bright contrast to the sloughing grey skin of its legs. Its shoeless feet splashed through the puddle of icy snowmelt. Rivulets of rain had cut deep fissures through the season of mud coating its chest. 
exposing a checkerboard of unhealed cuts beneath. Its face was a rotting death mask of paper-thin skin, broken teeth and sightless eyes. It was, in short, pitiful. Not even when it lurched towards them, arms swinging, did he know even the briefest moment of fear. They'd all stopped at the sight of the zombie. Dean and Lena had drawn their bows, but Petrelli looked at Toussaint, while the specialist looked to Sholto for the order to expend a precious bullet. Before he could tell them to save the ammunition, Dean fired. His arrow sung through the air faster than Sholto's eye could follow, sinking deep into the creature's chest. The zombie staggered a pace sideways before continuing on. That's the bike, Dean said. I can't fire from the saddle. As he finished speaking, Lena let loose. She'd been an archer before the outbreak, a local hero the community hoped to send to the Commonwealth Games. Feathers sprouted from the zombie's skull as her arrow broke bone and pierced its brain. Show off, Dean said. Lena gave a nonchalant shrug. That zombie wasn't dying, Petrelli said. By the look of it, it should have been. Give it a couple of months more, Chalto said. So, Dean, where are we? That's Devis up there, Dean said. And what's Divis? Toussaint asked. The mountain, Lena said, pointing westward beyond the row of narrow terraced houses. Those are the Belfast Hells, Dean said. Are there roads running through them? Petrelli asked. Because we'd see the zombies coming for miles from up there. And have nowhere to hide, Gloria said. Personally, and this is just me, but I vote we stick to the firmer roads. Shortest route and fastest way back. There are tracks and paths up in the hills, Dean said. That's what Colum said. Probably not wide enough for a truck. That's why we'll take the Balliatoag Road around the hills. Where's that? Toussaint asked, taking out his map. The A-52, Lena said. Ah, so we follow that to Nut's Corner? Toussaint said, running a finger along the crumpled map. Then head up to the airport and coming back. We'll take the scenic route, Chalto said. To wit, we'll cut east then south, following whichever country roads aren't blocked by trees and mud. Lena raised her still-strung bow, tapping Dean's arm with it. What? he asked. Elizabeth Rosen, Lena said. Who's that? Chalto asked. A girl at school, Dean said. Lena extended her bow, pointing at a small windowed three up, two down. That was her place? Chalto asked. I thought you went to school in the south of the city. Lizzie moved a few years ago, Dean said, but she was with us when we left the gym. You know, after the outbreak, she, uh, she, she disappeared, Lena said. Yeah, Dean said. She was there with us in the morning when we left, but, but then she wasn't. No one saw her go or anything. Just one minute she was there, the next she was gone. Chalto checked his watch. It's still early, and we're making good time. He kicked the stand out for his bike and left it propped on the road. Keep watch. I'll take a look. He paused by the house's front door and knocked his crowbar against the wood. He had a machete at his belt, but the blade was too much like a sword, and that was too archaic for his tastes, emphasizing how much was yet to be lost. There were footsteps behind him. Dean and Lena had followed him across the swamp-like front garden. You don't need to come inside, he said. That's fine, Dean said. This isn't the first time we've gone looking for, well, for people we know. It's too narrow inside for bows, Shalto said. Though he doubted anyone or anything was inside, he was right. Upstairs, the cupboard doors were open. Discarded clothing lay rotting on the bed. She must have come back for clothes or something, Dean said. That's got to be it. That's why she left. She came back for something thinking she could catch up. When you left the gym, you were heading to Loch Ney, weren't you? Sholto asked. That's what Colin told me. Yeah, Callie had this idea about the Loch. That we'd be safe on boats or something, Dean said. We didn't get there. So you came down this road, 
Not this road, Dean said. I, I'm not sure what roads we took. I'm not sure we knew even then. We just, we just kept moving, Lena said. And we should do the same now, Sholto said. It was impossible to know whether Elizabeth Rosen had returned to her home, but nor was there any proof that she'd died. Dean and Lena would have that hope to replace guilt over that she'd been lost, or whatever succor that offered. Back outside, the private was missing. Where's Petrelli? he asked. Behind the tree, Gloria said. Is he okay? Sholto asked Toussaint. The specialist shrugged. Ask a doctor, but we can't do that until we get back. Any more zombies? Sholto asked, while they waited. Nothing but the birds, Gloria said, or a bird. A robin came and pecked at the mud we disturbed. Must be worms down there. No zombies, Dean said. Do the patrols come out this far? No, Toussaint said. They stay within two miles of the harbor. Then maybe we got them all, Dean said. Lena raised her bow, pointing to the dead zombie in the lurid shorts. Most of them then, Dean said. My advice, Toussaint said, the advice I got from every decent NCO I served with is to assume the enemy is behind bush and tree until you're back behind your lines. And speaking of trees... Petrelli ran back onto the road. Let's move out, Cholto said. Chapter 12 Bags, Nuts Corner, County Antrim In one fluid movement, Lena's feet hit the ground, and she flipped her already strung bow from around her chest. She drew and notched an arrow before Sholto had pulled on his brakes. He spotted the waving branch just as the zombies staggered out of the shallow tree line onto the road and straight into the path of her arrow. I didn't even see it, Petrelli said, clearly impressed. Lena shook her head, though not at his comment. We shouldn't have come this way, she said. Why not? Sholto asked, dismounting from his bike. We're having a breather, Gloria asked. Wonderful. Dodging the potholes reminds me of riding through Clapham Common. I've forgotten how draining cycling could be. If we're taking a break, Petrelli said. He didn't finish the sentence, but kicked out his stand, dismounted, and hurried towards a bush. Check for zombies first, Toussaint called, in a deliberately loud voice. But all was still, the loudest sound that of water running slowly along the ditch. Why shouldn't we have come this way? Sholto asked. We're still on the A-52, aren't we? No, we're where we want to be, Dean said. That's Nuts Corner up ahead. And that's the roundabout? Gloria asked, looking at the map. Then the southern edge of the airfield is about three kilometers to the northwest. We've got two routes we can take from the roundabout. We can continue north along the A-52 until until, well, for about two kilometres, until we get to a road that doesn't seem to have a name, uh, but we'll approach the airport from the south. That's Cross Hill Road, Lena said. Right, Gloria said. Or from here, we go north up the A26 and approach the airport from the east. Which is why I thought this was a good route, Dean said. The fuel tankers are parked in that industrial site off Cross Hill Road. We'll pass them on our way to look at the helicopters. Lena shook her head again. Why shouldn't we have come this way? Sholto asked. The supermarket, Lena said. Yeah, well, I thought we might have time to look inside, Dean said. What supermarket? Sholto asked. That's just up ahead, Dean said, more or less on the southern edge of the roundabout. We came past here back after the outbreak. Someone was already there, you know, Luton. They chased us away. They shot at us. Lena said. Yeah, but they won't be there now, Dean said. Maybe they left some of the food. You said we could do a bit of scavenging if we had time. I'm not sure that we do, Sholto said. We're already an hour and a half behind schedule. The roads are more pothole and tarmac and as much ice as asphalt. It's not that I begrudge having stopped at Elizabeth Rosen's house, but we wasted nearly an hour at that industrial unit. An hour? 
Thirty rounds and ten arrows, Gloria said. And all for the discovery of a heating oil depot whose tanks were already empty, Cholto said. But that was the most zombies we've seen today, Dean said. And they were all trapped behind that gate. I think most of the zombies around here ended up in Belfast, and we've killed them. Any the others will be like those at the industrial unit, trapped behind gates and fences. Gates can break, Gloria said. Exactly, Dean said. Killing them today will save us time when we come back for the tankers. And how long will it take us today to reach some figures off a tanker's fuel gauge? A good point, Cholto said. Let me see the map again. Right. Hmm. Well, we're unlikely to find a road in a better state than this one. The vast majority look narrower, more winding, more likely to be washed out or blocked by fallen trees and collapsed hedges. Despite our good fortune with the undead today, we can't assume that we'll be this lucky when we bring the tankers back. We'll need to plan for detours and take the time to clear the route. I'm mindful of what happened when we were clearing the motorway so the plane could land. Now, this is the best road we'll find today, and I wouldn't want to drive a laden fuel tanker along it, not with so much of it flooded that it barely qualifies as a single lane. We'll have to take the fuel back to the harbor by bike. You sure, sir? Tucson asked. Are you volunteering to drive a tanker along that road? Shelter replied. Never volunteer, sir. That's the second lesson they teach you. But we'll need a few hundred people to carry the same volume of fuel as one tanker. That'll be as noisy as a vehicle's engine. Do we have that many bikes? Dean asked. And Belfast? Lena replied. Right, yeah. Okay, Dean said. Shalter took one last look at the map. Neither option is ideal, and both are fraught with danger, but I think bicycles will be quicker. Certainly it'll be quicker to organize. We can have the job done by tomorrow night, and since we'll need a secure location in case something goes wrong, why not spare a half hour to investigate that supermarket? When Petrelli returned, they walked their bikes slowly to the roundabout. Though they were alert for the living or the undead, they only saw a solitary raven perched on a sign. Since that sign was pointing down Dundrod Road towards the supermarket, Sholto took it as an omen. He wasn't sure what to take from the bodies lying in the road leading to the car park. They were people, not zombies, Gloria said. Peck nearly clean, Petrelli said as Toussaint picked up the submachine gun lying half-buried in the mud. East German made, the specialist said, back in the late 1960s, I think, magazines empty. He let the weapon fall. It clattered to the road. The raven cawed. The bird's looking for its next meal, Dean said. But these people didn't die recently, Gloria said. So what has the raven been eating in the months since? Leo, you're with me. Shelto said. We'll take a quick look inside. Everyone else watch the road. Keep the bikes ready for a hasty escape. Considering the relative remoteness of the location, the supermarket was surprisingly large. A thin mulch of leaves covered the scattered bones, leading down the access road to the car park. The raven overtook them, landing on the wide roof of the warehouse-like store. Toussaint's rifle moved left and right, down and straight ahead, as he swept their approach. Do you see those station wagons? The specialist said. How the trunks are open, facing the supermarket's entrance? It's the way you'd park if you came here expecting to make a quick getaway. Clearly, they didn't leave. Sholto kicked at a stray labelless can lying on the road. It rolled a few inches before coming to a halt. The can was full. He crossed to the station wagon and wrapped his hand against the rusting door as his eyes fell on the skull at his feet. There was no sign of the torso, but the bone had been pecked nearly clean. Only a few tufts of hair remained attached to a solitary patch of scalp at the temple. Looks intact. Probably human, not zombie, he said. There's food in the trunk, Toussaint said. Three trays of, uh, of broad beans, I think. About sixty cans? He picked up a tattered fragment of label. Three hundred and fifty grams per can. What's that in real money? 
about four portions per can? Depends on the size of the portion, I suppose, Sholto said. Before I enlisted, I worked in a grocery store, Toussaint said. Oh, yeah? Sholto asked, turning from the vehicles to look at the entrance. Can't say it was the reason I joined up. Can't say it made me second-guess my decision. Reckon these cans were on special offer, on display near the doors. Old stock they were trying to clear out. There's a date on the tray. April of last year? Two months after the outbreak. Might still be edible, then, Cholto said. One of the wide glass doors was lodged open. The other was smashed, as were the windows next to it. On the ground in front lay a dozen spent shotgun cartridges and a discarded saber, pitted with rust. Cholto took out his torch and unclipped his crowbar. As Toussaint slotted his light into his carbine, inside they found more evidence of a long-ago battle. Shelving units were wedged around and between the registers, creating individual forts. Each was ringed by the slowly decaying corpses of the undead. Inside those last-ditch defenses were the remains of a defender. In two cases, they were undead. In three, they were the picked clean remains of the immune. The zombies are dead, Sholto said. Someone came back to finish them. Maybe the people who chased Dean and Lena away, Toussaint said, shining torch and carbine deeper into the store. They found too much here to carry when in search of cars. Found the station wagons, but the sound of the engine summoned more of the undead. Some people fled. The rest tried to fight to protect their hall. They died. Those that fled returned, finishing their undead friends, but didn't want to risk taking the cars. That lesson learned, they took what they could carry and ran. Maybe. Sholto picked up a double-barreled shotgun and cracked it open. The cartridges inside had been spent. But did it happen before Locke left Belfast? Was it before Jasmine Carter arrived there? Is she the answer to the question of what happened to the people who survived this fight? He dropped the shotgun on the counter. In reply came a rattle of metal from deeper within the supermarket. Toussaint aimed gun and torch into the gloom. Blight glinted off broken glass and fractured metal, marking where shells had been pulled down in someone's last attempt to escape. The sound came again, and from beneath the fallen shells, growing louder as they approached, but then abruptly stopped. Cholto shone the light down and onto the creature. It lay buried beneath the thin metal, one arm extended, the hand clawing towards the light. Its mouth hung open, seemingly unable to close. I think it's dying, Cholto said. He clipped the crowbar back on his belt. There wasn't room to swing. Instead, he drew his long hunting knife and plunged it down to the creature's eye socket. Not that it means much. Dying doesn't mean dead. He gave the fallen shells a kick. Silence came back from inside. What do you think? Are there more? Hard to say, so I'll assume yes, Toussaint said. There's some bottles here. Lime and... What kind of fruit ends with an N? Lemon? Too much of the label is missing. The contents will be mostly sugar, but there might be a vitamin or two in there. Chalto played his light along the aisle. There's a lot of stock still here. Might be worth checking the back. Perhaps we can find something to enliven our lunch. I'm sure there's a rule that says people who go out into the wilds get first choice of what they find. We'll run out of time, Toussaint said. Not if we split up, Chalto said. We don't all need to go up towards the airport. You take Gloria and Lena. I'll keep Dean and Petrelli. Hmm. Looks like some toilet paper still on that shelf. I doubt the private will mind staying in one place for a few hours. Go to the tankers. Check the fuel level and take the photographs for the Admiral. You know what to look for. Then do the same for the helicopters. Half an hour in each place, then come back here. I'll see if we can get a fire going. You might as well check some of this food is still edible. Right, sure, Toussaint said, distracted. 
So, listen, do you really think we'll get a helicopter flying again? In time, I mean? In time for what? Sholto said. Before we leave for America. I don't know when that'll be, Sholto said. A few weeks is what I heard, Toussaint said. And from who? Sholto asked. Oh, you know, Scuttlebutt, Toussaint said. A couple of weeks, one way or another, we'll be leaving. One way or another, Sholto said. That's what I heard, Toussaint said. I also heard that some people think there's a chance we'll stay here in Ireland. That if the zombies are dying, it'll be safer. That's what some people are saying. These people, do they want to stay in Ireland? I couldn't speak for them, sir. What do you think? Me? I think we should stick together, Toussaint said. I also know it's a long time since I saw a paycheck from the U.S. government, but I'm still taking orders. I don't mind while the emergency is underway, but no emergency can last indefinitely. Sholto picked his words carefully. You think a lot of people feel this way? Increasingly so, Toussaint said. Good to know, Sholto said, taking the warning for what it was. Well, a couple of weeks should be long enough. Either we can get a helicopter fixed in an afternoon, or we can't get it fixed at all. It's much the same with the ships. It won't take long to know if they're seaworthy. That will take time getting our best sailors, our best engineers from here to France. Two weeks? That should probably do it, and probably be enough time for us to get ready. We don't want to rush off into the unknown, leaving half our supplies behind. We don't want to leave our doctors behind, either. And most of them are down in Elysium. Do you think people can... can wait that long? Two weeks? I hope so. Toussaint said. When they returned to the road, they found another corpse in the ditch, and Lena cleaning gore from an arrow. Change your plans, Sholto said, scanning the tree-lined road for more movement. There's food inside, so we'll split up. Lena, Gloria, you're going north with Theo. Dean, Luca, we'll search the supermarket. Get a feel for how much is here and how many people we'll need to bring it back to the harbor. Uh, hang on, Gloria said. Our lunch, the private still got it in his bag. You got an entire supermarket to choose from, Petrelli said. Food? In rusting cans? No thanks, Gloria said. And an over-private quick now, Toussaint said. Petrelli unclipped the clasp of the saddlebag, opened the flap, peered inside, and froze. Sir, he hissed. What? It's a bomb. Chapter 13 Roadside, Nuts Corner, Belfast That's a claymore, Toussaint said. He carefully unclipped the bag from the bike and placed it on the roadway. As Dean, Lena, Glory and Petrelli stepped back, Sholto stepped forward and peered into the bag. It's attached to a semicircular plastic case, Sholto said. Three inches wide, too deep, I think. A travel alarm clock? Not to say with the case closed. Can't be a motion sensor, since our jostling journey would have triggered a detonation. You know much about explosives? I know enough to leave them alone, Toussaint said. What about you? I've said a few in my time, Sholto said. Take the others. Take the bikes, go up to the roundabout, get a safe distance, and wait. The specialist didn't argue. You heard him. Move. Charlto again looked into the bag. The plastic case had been taped to the claymore. He assumed the plastic case concealed a timer, but maybe it didn't, or maybe it wasn't a travel clock. That flattened plastic circle with a rectangular base had been a staple of his travels in the age before smartphones. But that was a decade ago. What were the odds of finding something like that lying around a city like Belfast these days? Perhaps it wasn't a timer. But it certainly was the trigger. With wires leading from it to the Claymore, where they disappeared under a mass of masking tape. The wires were all the same length, 
all coated in identical green plastic. There were six wires in total, but only two were needed. Were the others simply dummies? Were they a crude anti-tamper device or redundancies? He drew his knife, reached in, and saw a seventh wire hanging from the black plastic case. No, not a seventh, but a pair of wires running in parallel. Teeth gritted. He reached a hand in and followed the pair of wires until they disappeared into the bag's lining. Sweat dripped down his forehead, running onto his nose, as he traced the wires up the bag's lining until he found where they'd come loose, near the seam that joined the flap to the bag. Three seconds later, he'd found the odd-shaped piece of metal in the bag's flap itself, where the circuit should have been completed. He pulled his hand from the bag and stepped back. A timer is the backup, he said, shivering now as the wintry breeze evaporated the slick sweat coating his face and hands. The real trigger is the wire running to the flap. The device should have detonated when the bag was opened. He took out a battered smartphone it brought to take pictures of the tankers and helicopters. The photograph's a photograph, he muttered, but this time he got a reply. Branches snapped as a zombie pushed its way through the tree line twenty meters down the road. The creature slipped as it reached the asphalt, falling flat on its face, but immediately squirmed and rolled, thrashing its way back to its feet. Reaching into the bag, Sholto pressed the phone's screen, taking a hundred quick photographs. As the zombie reached its knees, Sholto took a step away from the bag and towards his bike, unslinging his rifle as he moved. The zombie reached its knees. It fired. It thumped to the ground, dead, and he grabbed the bike's handlebars, kicked the stand up and quickly mounted. Thirty seconds later, it reached the others. Did you disarm it? Gloria asked. No, Sholto said. I'm not sure I can. There's too much tape covering the wires, except for a pair of wires that lead into the bag seam and up to the flap. The device should have detonated when the bag was opened, but that wire came loose. You were lucky, Private. We all were. Lucky, Luca, Dean said. I think you got yourself a new nickname. Seriously? It was meant to explode when I opened it? Petrelli said. Wish we'd known that before we checked the other bags. You checked the other bags? Shalto asked. They're all clear, sir, Toussaint said. There are no more devices. Didn't you check the bag when you were issued with it? Gloria asked. Of course, Petrelli said. The quartermaster opened it in front of me and she checked the contents against her list. Six standard issue rations twice. I tried to get her to add a bit extra. But clearly the device wasn't in the bag then, Sholto said. When was it out of your sight? It wasn't, Petrelli said automatically. Well, I went to the latrine, but I was only gone for a few minutes. I left the bag hanging on the bike. A few minutes, like two or three or more like ten, Sholto asked. Maybe five, Petrelli said. It's all this oatmeal and gruel, there's nothing solid to eat. But a bomber couldn't have known Luca would have gone to the loo, Dean said. Petrelli reached for his water bottle. Sholto's eyes narrowed. He snatched the bottle from the private's hand. Hey, Petrelli said. Nature's called you quite a bit today, Sholto said, unclipping his own water bottle and handing it to the man. Maybe there is a way someone could guarantee you'd leave that bag unattended. They, they poisoned me? Petrelli asked. Drugged you with a diuretic of some kind, Shalto said. We don't find many medicines left these days, but how many people would want to loot a drug that makes you do that? Shalto raised the private's water bottle, turning it back and forth, but it looked no different to any other. It's dangerous to infer too much. But one bag is much like another, and we've got a couple of hundred of them back in the harbor. Everyone who goes out gets issued with the same type of bag, the same type of rations. Maybe we were deliberately targeted, or maybe we were just the first and easiest target they saw. Pass me the sat phone. 
We have to call this in. Gloria fished the phone out of her bag. Cholto dialed. Callie answered. Is the Admiral there? Cholto asked. She's gone to meet Shavorn and the helicopter. Why? What about Whitley? Sure, he's around. Is he there? Not here, here, Callie said. He's up on the roof. Okay, listen carefully, Sholto said. Someone swapped the bag of food that we got from the quartermaster. There was a bomb in the bag we brought with us. It's an improvised device made using a claymore with a primary trigger attached to the bag's flap. There's a secondary trigger, I think, is a timer. I think... I think it's possible they've dosed Petrelli with a diuretic, so he'd relieve himself often enough the bags could be switched. I might be wrong about that. You need to tell Whitley. Tell the Admiral, Siobhan, and Colum. But no one else. Tell them we don't know if there are other bombs given to the other people who've left the harbor today. You got that? There was silence at the other end of the phone. Callie? Did you hear what I said? I... Yes. Yes, I understand. Good. Go. I'll call back in a bit. He ended the call. You think there might be more bombs? Dean asked. I hope not, Sholto said. But are we the target? Gloria asked. And when I say we, I don't really mean me. You mean me, Sholto said. If someone wanted me dead, they could have shot me from a distance. Or murdered me while I slept. No. This isn't an assassination. So what is it? Petrelli asked. Call it sabotage, Sholto said. Call it terrorism, but it amounts to the same thing. Are we waiting here, sir? Toussaint asked. Just until the Admiral calls back, Sholto said. Luca, did you see anyone hanging around the stores or near the bikes? No one who shouldn't have been, Petrelli said. There were Marines, sailors, the usual people. Civilians don't come to our part of the harbor. They're too afraid they'll be volunteered for work. And the bag was ready to be swapped the moment they saw an opportunity, Sholto said. The decision to go to the airport had only been made in the late evening after the call came from Dundalk, reporting the discovery of the coal depot. The plans for the expedition hadn't been widely shared, though nor had they been kept a secret. That's the saboteurs, isn't it? Dean asked. I'd say so, Sholto said. We don't know if we were the target or the only target. We'll have to... And then the claymore detonated. Everyone ducked, but the explosion, muffled by distance, shook the trees more than the ground. As the roar of the detonation faded, it was replaced with a sound of ball bearings tinkling to the roadway, branches falling into the overflowing ditch, and partially frozen dirt landing in the field. Sholto straightened. Everyone okay? He checked his arms, his legs, his chest, and then he checked the time. We're two hours behind schedule. If we were running to time, we'd be at, hmm, maybe at the tanker park, maybe standing next to the helicopters, possibly on our way back. They wanted to destroy the fuel. Dean asked. Maybe, Sholto said. Maybe not. Let's get moving. The zombies will head towards that sound. He took out the sat phone and called Belfast. Callie answered. The bomb went off, Sholto said. Tell the Admiral. She's still not back, Callie said. Lieutenant Butler's gone to check the armory. Well, if there were more IEDs, they've probably detonated too. Did you hear anything? Nothing, she said. Then maybe ours was the only bomb, Shelto said. We're going to complete the mission. We'll call next time we stop. We're continuing? Dean asked. Yeah, Shelto said, because someone doesn't want us to. Chapter 14 Evidence Examined Cliftonville Road, Belfast after leaving Nut's Corner, they headed north. Despite the noise of the explosion, they only saw eight zombies before they reached the tankers. There, they came across many more, but they were all dead, killed during Higson's expedition to collect the plane. 
Gloria recorded the fuel levels in the remaining tankers. Cholto took photographs for the access road. Blina killed the one creature that staggered across the field towards them. Within five minutes of arriving, they left. At any other time, the helicopters would have been quite a sight. Police vehicles, news choppers, a rescue vehicle, an Apache. Those were obvious despite the rust, but there were others that must once have been privately owned. There were too many for them to have come from nearby. Some must have been flown in from the Republic, or the Isle of Man, perhaps even from Wales, brought there following some now forever unknowable order, for an equally unknowable purpose, abandoned in fields into which they had sunk. There were seven Chinooks in the wide car park of a meat processing plant. It was those that they hoped to repair. Again, they took a few hasty photographs. The specialist examined the engines, and though he wasn't certain any would ever fly, he was able to determine what tools they would need to find out. As they cycled swiftly through County Antrim's narrow lanes, Cholto mentally counted the number of zombies they'd seen that day. Ignoring those trapped behind the fence with a looted fuel depot, it was under twenty. He wasn't sure whether he should also discount those summoned by the explosion. Either way, it wasn't many. Reading between the lines, it was a similar situation in Dundalk. Yes, Kim and the others had faced over a thousand in the battle at the hotel. Yes, according to the call last night, yesterday they'd found a similar number just beyond an old barricade. But if they were ignored, and if he just thought about the undead wandering the roads or motionless in fields, it did seem far less than they'd faced in England or Wales. It was far, far less than during those nightmare weeks when he was escaping the United States. Of course, that was to be expected on the island of Ireland, with its far smaller original population. On the other hand, they were finding an increasing number that appeared to be dying. If they'd had time to make more of those crossbows Rohinda had designed, to find a better redoubt than Belfast Harbour, to train civilians to become fighters if not soldiers, then maybe Ireland could have become their safe haven. The sabotage had prevented it. Another piece of the puzzle slotted into place. That was the purpose of the sabotage. Anglesey would have worked for years, perhaps as many as five. Belfast should have worked at least until spring, but only if they'd arrived together, all three ships, and with the plane. The plane could have been sent across the Atlantic, and though it only had the range to reach Canada, that would have forestalled any mutiny. The mutiny. He didn't know the details, but it clearly wasn't an outright rebellion, simply an overwhelming desire to cross the Atlantic. A sailor Longing to return home was commonplace to the point of being a trope, strengthening that desire until it became an exigent need wouldn't be difficult. Or was he now letting paranoia overtake reason? That someone had just tried to kill them suggested not. They didn't travel directly to the harbour, but to a primary school on Cliftonville Road, to a rendezvous they'd agreed with the Admiral over the sat phone. The Admiral and her small party were already there. Siobhan was the only civilian among a group consisting entirely of U.S. service personnel. As Sholto dismounted by the metal gates, he caught movement on the rooftop. Another two Marines were on the flat roof above the entrance. This location is secure, but we don't have long, the Admiral said. This way, Mr. Sholto, the rest of you, wait here. <laughs> Dean muttered but offered no more protest than that. Sholto followed the Admiral and Siobhan up the path towards a low-roofed, open-sided shelter next to the playground. You didn't tell anyone about the bomb? Sholto guessed. No, the Admiral said. Ten claymores are missing from the armory. Ten? Sholto asked. You didn't say on the phone. I didn't want anyone to overhear that the mines are missing, she said, or that we know... They are missing. Great, Sholto muttered. So there's nine still unaccounted for. 
No others have exploded? No, and there have been no threats or demands as of yet, Chavon said. But if that bomb was supposed to explode while you were away from Belfast, then we shouldn't know about it until you failed to call in. We'd have sent a team out, but it's possible they wouldn't have found your remains before nightfall. We might have assumed you'd lost the phone and were simply trapped, surrounded, and not known the truth until tomorrow. Possibly, Chalto said, but the device was designed to detonate when the bag was opened. They couldn't guarantee when that would happen. They couldn't even guarantee we wouldn't open the bag before we left the harbor. But they could have surmised it, the Admiral said. I think they dosed Petrelli's water bottle with something, Sholto said. He had to relieve himself every half hour or so on our way east, and then he'd take a drink to avoid dehydration, giving himself another dose. That's diabolical, the Admiral said, though no more so than an IED. Can you describe the device? Chavon asked. I can do better than that, Sholto said, fishing in his pocket. I took some photographs. He handed the phone to Siobhan. So, right now, no one knows we're still alive. Not yet, the Admiral said. I can't see any advantage in pretending you're dead. We wouldn't be able to maintain the ruse for long, and it would involve allocating people we can trust to bring you supplies. Right now, we'll need them to locate the missing devices. Can I see the pictures? Thank you. She took the phone from Siobhan, glanced at the image, then returned the phone. It's a claymore. Safe to assume it's one that's missing. Is there anything you can tell us from the photographs? Sholto asked. Give me a minute more, Siobhan said. Sholto turned back to the Admiral. Has any ammunition been taken? Any food? It's too early to say, the Admiral said. Records were not as uh, thorough as they should have been. Our food stores are being double-checked. A few hundred rounds of ammunition might be missing, and the remaining rounds are currently being counted. However, the explosives were not stored in the same building as the ammunition. They were kept in a smaller facility behind the main building, along with records from the court cases here and from those investigations held on Anglesey. A regular inspection is required, but, uh, but the quartermaster was negligent in her duties. The only time that the facility was entered was when documents from the daily court proceedings were deposited. Even then, the quartermaster didn't give the shells more than a cursory glance. The claymores could have been stolen last night, or at any time since we arrived. What I can tell you is that the grenades are all accounted for, as are the other explosives. We have a small amount of C4, a box of detonators, and three remote triggers— Yet the bomber chose to steal the claymores from the box on the next shelf. Perhaps our bomber doesn't know how to use plastic, Siobhan said. Yet they know how to wire a claymore, Sholto said. What does that tell us? Nothing good, Siobhan said. These photographs aren't great. There are too many shadows. Ideally, I'd have a few more hours, a few texts, and a decent IT suite before I'd pass judgment— I certainly want to speak to some of your more experienced Marines and find out if they recognize this style of wiring from training or a battlefield. For now, I can't tell you more than the obvious. Which is? the Admiral asked. I'm approaching this from a policing point of view, and I'd like a second opinion from someone more familiar with explosives as soon as you can decide who to trust. The primary trigger is attached to the flap, this bomb should have detonated when the bag was opened. Plastic would certainly be a better choice for such a device. The six wires you can see, they're not wired to anything. They're just a decoy. The real wires completing the circuit are concealed beneath the tape, and that tape conceals a secondary circuit. Here, in this photograph, do you see? The decoys are to slow you down. The secondary circuit will cause a detonation if you try to cut the tape or pull the wires free. The small black box probably is a clock, but really it's an insurance policy. It's a timer in that if no one had opened the bag, it would have detonated anyway, destroying the evidence. Perhaps the person who stole the mines isn't the same person who wired the bomb, and they didn't know what C4 looks like. 
Perhaps they were rushed during the theft. More likely they've created a device like this before. Then there's nothing in those photographs that will help us, Sholto asked. What about in Dundalk? A few smudged fingerprints that might reveal something, Javon said. The real clue, I think, lies in the plane. I have a lead to follow there, but nothing concrete. Not yet. How long do you need? the Admiral asked. A few days, Javon said. This case will be solved by finding someone who saw someone doing something somewhere they should never have been, and that will take time. I'll be as circumspect as I can, but this won't stay a secret. That might be a problem, Shalto said. The specialist warned me that there's a, a simmering dissatisfaction among your original crew. He gives it two weeks before it bubbles up into a full-blown mutiny. I've heard the same, the Admiral said. There is little that can be done that we aren't already doing. A whistle came from the guards on the roof above, followed by the muffled sound of a shot. Zombies, the Admiral said. We've run out of time. Sholto barely noticed the ruins as they made their way back to the harbour. His mind was on the nine missing mines. The entire harbour was one giant soft target. Though the saboteurs would know where was safe from the blast, the chaotic panic that followed would bring injury and death no one could avoid. Even so, there was only one reason the other mines were taken. So how would the terrorists benefit? They wouldn't. Not unless their goal was to hasten the moment Belfast was abandoned. He was still mulling over the likelihood of that when they reached the checkpoint and discovered half the guards were missing. Where's the sergeant? the admiral demanded. It was Mr. Fennec, the corporal replied. He called for them to come and help. Help with what? Sholto asked. There's a riot, the corporal said. Chapter 15 Disorderly, Belfast Harbour I thought so, the Admiral said, as they reached the warehouse in which Marcus lived, and which was now being torn apart from the inside. It's not a riot, it's just another drunken brawl. Whitley had gathered two dozen troops, a mix of those who'd been finishing their shift when Sholto had departed that morning, and the more heavily armed who'd come straight from the checkpoint. Half of those now formed a thin cordon on the road, keeping back twice that number of curious onlookers. The rest corralled the brawling drunks as they staggered outside. As each lurched through the wide swing doors, a guard would grab them, drag them across the tarmac, and sit them down with their backs against the wall of the neighboring building. Report, the Admiral said. Marcus opened a new bar, Whitley said simply. This is the result. Where's Fennec? Sholto asked. The infirmary, Whitley said. You'll be fine. Just a nasty cut. There's another sixty drunks inside. I've sent for reinforcements and was waiting for numerical superiority before launching an assault. A man fell through the door, collapsed to his knees, and had to be carried to the subdued and dazed group by the wall. They almost looked like zombies. Sholto said. And it's barely sunset, the Admiral said. Are they armed? A chair smashed through a window. A moment later, Colum staggered through the door, blood dripping from his face. As he straightened, as Sholto and the Admiral took a step towards him, the warehouse door swung open again. A man with a greasy beard and lank fringe staggered outside. He raised a hand to shield his eyes, and then saw Colum. His hands dropped to his belt, fumbling with his jacket zip. As the coat fell open, Sholto saw the shoulder holster, but so did Colum. As the man reached for his gun, the boxer stepped forward and jabbed his left fist into the man's kidneys and then slammed his right in an open palm punch into the man's chest. Secure that man, the admiral barked. Whitley and four of his sailors ran over to secure the prisoner, as Sholto ran over to Colin. You all right? Sholto asked. The boxer wiped blood from his forehead. Cal is in there, he said. 
She tried to break it up. I told her not to. And then he ran back into the warehouse with Sholto close on his heels. Going from bright daylight into the dark interior, he was momentarily blind. His eyesight adjusted in time to see the chair sailing towards his head. He ducked underneath and then skipped a hasty step to the left as a fist sailed towards his neck. Shifting his weight, he swept his leg out, hooking his foot round his assailant's shins. The woman fell face first and hard, landing on the concrete floor with a crack of breaking teeth. Almost instantly, all fight went from her. She curled into a ball as her hands covered her bleeding mouth. Sholto stepped around her, his fists raised, trying to make sense of the chaos. It was a brawl, not a riot. There were no obvious sides or alliances, nor any obvious prize or perceived transgression over which the multi-sided battle was being fought. The third of the room furthest from the door was filled with trampled sleeping mats, broken camp beds and torn down sheets and curtains that had offered a modicum of privacy to those who'd called the warehouse home. A few of them, presumably sober, were still there, huddled in the furthest corner. About twenty, he thought, who'd not dared risk the dash through the melee to the building's only escape. The middle of the room was taken up with a mismatched collection of tables and chairs, half of which had been broken, and a quarter of which were now being used as impromptu clubs. Against the wall closest to the door were a quartet of trestle tables, arranged in a U-shape, on which were a smattering of still intact bottles and glasses. A guttural yell came from his right. Cholto turned and saw the man fling the bottle just in time to duck. As it sailed over his head, a woman jumped on the man, knocking him to the ground. Sholto took a step towards them, about to haul one from the other, when he sensed movement to his left. He spun around, but it was only Colum. Where's Callie? The bar, Colum said, pushing his way back into the melee and towards the U of tables by the wall. Now he was looking for, he saw her. The teenager stood inside the U, swinging her cane at head height but she was shorter than a trio of men shoving at the table, and her head only reached their shoulders. A cane slammed into a man's arms, and he brushed it away. She changed her grip, stabbing the walking stick up and forward, aiming at his skull, but this wasn't a zombie. The man grabbed the cane and dragged it from her, raising it up as Colum dived forward, arms wide open. His flying tackle knocked the man with the cane, and the assailant next to him to the floor. The man with the cane stopped struggling almost instantly, raising his hands in front of his face. The second man, though, had plenty of fight left in him. He jumped onto Colum's back. The boxer roared, reached up and around, grabbed arm and neck, and flung the man into the crowd, spinning around to face the third and last man by the bar, just as Sholto caught up. The third assailant stood frozen, immobile, his hands raised with a barrel of Callie's pistol an inch away from his left eye. It's all right, boys, she said. I've got this under control. But then, calm bravado gone, she yelled, Sholto, behind you! Sholto spun around, shifting his weight so the clenched fist cracked into his shoulder. His assailant winced, seemingly shocked by the pain. Sholto slammed both palms into the man's chest. He fell over and didn't try to get up, but began crawling away. This is weird, Sholto said, stepping backward until he had the bar behind him. What the hell happened here? Beats me, Callie said, ducking as a bottle smashed against the wall behind her. A moan came from near her feet. Sholto spared a quick glance around and down and saw Marcus. The barman was behind the bar, curled up in a tight ball, hugging a half-full bottle. This is your area more than mine, Colum. What do we do now? Sholto asked. But before Colum had to answer, the doors swung open and Whitley let the sailors and marines inside. 
They didn't fight. In pairs, they simply grabbed the closest brawling rioter and dragged them to the doorway, where they were passed to a second rank. Those people weren't in uniform. They were dressed in civilian garb. Either passers-by or onlookers, they'd become the Admiral's newest recruits. Ten minutes later, those who could stand had been hauled outside to sober up in the cold winter's air, with the more serious cases taken to the infirmary. Those who'd been cowering in the warehouse's far corner had been taken outside to give a statement. Aside from Marcus, that still left three unconscious inside. What happened? the Admiral asked Colum, as she knelt down to examine the nearest of the fallen. Pulse is weak, she said, addressing a corporal. Possible head trauma. Get a backboard. Colum? What happened? They got drunk, Colum said, as the Admiral moved to the next recumbent rioter, and the corporal ran to get a stretcher. The first vineyard bought it was half an hour ago, maybe forty minutes. That was when Mr. Fennec ran into the command center, his face covered in blood. He said there was a riot. Said he tried to stop it. He, he sort of took charge. He's shaping up that man. John had taken his people to... Colum paused, looking at Marcus, then at the medics by the three prone drunks. Lieutenant Butler had gone to secure the armory. Mr. Fennec went to the checkpoint to gather a few more guards. Callie and I... Came straight here. You ran into a riot alone and unarmed? The Admiral said. She turned back to the medic. This man needs his stomach pumped. Move him now. She stepped aside as her medics hurried the man from the room. The Admiral crossed over to Marcus. I had an axe handle when I first came in, Colum said. He shrugged. This isn't my first bar fight. When well, Mr. Fanick told us where it was... I guessed what the cause might be. The new Marcus had talked about opening a bar. It even asked me how he'd go about applying for a license. I told him to wait a few more days until things settled down. Clearly, he didn't want to wait. No, this wasn't my first bar fight. Though come to that, this wasn't a bar fight like any I've ever seen. They were really rupping into one another. Let me rephrase that. I've seen fights in bars like this. And I've seen fights like this, but not the two together, and not at this time of day. Even so, you should have waited for support, the Admiral said. Marcus will live. He should come in for observation overnight, and will have a few bruises to accompany a headache tomorrow. What support? Callie replied. You and Siobhan have gone into Belfast. Everyone else is busy looking for... Colum coughed. Everyone else is busy? Callie said. Whom should we have waited for? Fair point, Sholto said loudly before the teenager began a shouting match with the Admiral. When did it begin? About half an hour ago? It's been about thirty minutes since Fanuc came into the command center, give or take, Colum said. But by the look of them, they've been drinking all day. The Admiral crossed to the last prone figure. He's dead, she said, stabbed by the look of it. There's no sign of the knife. Where's Siobhan? Outside, ma'am, the corporal said, taking statements. Does anyone know this man's name? The admiral asked. Giovanni Marcano, Colum said. He was from Milan, just outside anyway. He was a woodcarver by trade. That's not what he called it, but that's what it came to. He made decorative surrounds for the interiors of luxury boats. That's how he survived the outbreak. The owner flew Giovanni out to his yacht, along with a few others from the shipyard. He didn't just want a crew, but people who could keep his boat afloat. What he forgot were supplies. When food ran low, Giovanni and all the others were thrown into a lifeboat and set adrift. But the vehement found them. And he survived all that to die here? The Admiral said. I need to be a doctor for a time. Corporal, get Siobhan. They get a stretcher for this man. I don't want it widely known that someone has died. Yes, ma'am. I'll help you with that stretcher, Colum said. Sholto went back to the improvised bar. Marcus still lay beneath it, clutching a bottle. Hey, Marcus, Sholto said. Time to face the music. Marcus, 
Marcus! Marcus groaned. Is he injured? Callie asked, having followed Sholto over. The Admiral doesn't think so, Sholto said. He's just drunk or insensible, at least. He had to tug to pull the bottle from the man's arms. He's only drunk half of it, and it's wine, not anything stronger. The door opened. Siobhan came in. She headed straight for the corpse and gave the deceased a brief examination. She took out the smartphone that Sholto had given her less than an hour before, took a string of quick photographs, but then put the phone away. There's not much we can do, she said, coming over. There's no point collecting DNA, since we'll never be able to process it. I think it was an accidental death. Someone threw a punch forgetting they had a knife in their hand. You could do a cast of the wound, can't you? Callie asked. Yes, yes, I suppose we could, but everyone carries a knife. A lot of people have more than one. It would be an utter nightmare trying to check each blade, and if the killer is aware of what they did, that knife will now be in the sea. If it was accidental, we'll get a confession. If it was deliberate, we'll have to rely on witness statements. Right now, those witnesses are all outside, and in no fit state to identify themselves, let alone anything they saw. They're that drunk? Sholto asked. He lifted the half-empty wine bottle he'd taken from Marcus. That drunk on wine? Just because it's in a wine bottle, Siobhan said, doesn't mean there's wine inside. Callie pointed at a tumbler, with an inch of liquid still in the bottom. That looks like wine. Red wine. A Beaujolais, according to the label, Sholto said. He pushed the tables apart, stepped over Marcus, and picked up an empty bottle. It's the same on this label. A little further along the improvised bar was a green plastic crate containing another ten empty bottles. Sholto picked up one, and then the next. It's the same on all of them. Looks like he scanned his torch left and right. Looks like twenty-two? No, twenty-three empties. Sixteen unopened. Two open and partially full, counting the bottle Marcus was hugging. But how many broken bottles? Callie asked. At least five, Siobhan said. Maybe ten. Most of the broken glass is clear, not tented. It's from drinking glasses, not bottles. Callie, check outside. See if there are any more empties in the rubbish pile. On your way back, grab the corporal. We'll need a couple of people to help carry Marcus to the, uh, to the infirmary, I think. Quick as he can. Callie left. Siobhan walked across the room, playing her light across the broken chairs and overturned tables, then on the bedrolls and bags in the furthest corner of the room. Sholto turned back to Marcus. The man had curled up, into an even tighter ball. Sholto picked up the tumbler with the inch of red liquid still inside. He gave it a sniff. This doesn't smell right. You're a wine drinker? Siobhan asked. Not really, Sholto said. But viticulture was a reliable icebreaker at a high-end fundraiser. I might not know much, but I know more than the people from whom I was trying to squeeze a donation. This smells far too chemical. He gave another, more tentative sniff. If I was served this in any bar, any restaurant, I'd send it back. Did you see that film a few years ago, The Enemy Among Us? Siobhan asked. The alien invasion thing? I saw the posters. Saw the trailer. Didn't have time to see the movie. Due to tax breaks, they filmed most of it in Ireland, there's a scene where the President's Chief of Staff is revealed to be one of the alien imposters. The scene takes place in the wine cellar beneath the White House, but they filmed it all in a golf club in County Cork. That was my patch at the time. In the film, the wine cellar was supposed to contain the most expensive and rarest wines, and the props people went overboard on verisimilitude. The bottles were an exact copy of the real thing. Label, cork... Foil. Now, a month later, when filming had finished, and they were closing the set, the props manager noticed that two hundred of those bottles had gone missing. Not much was made of it at the time. 
A report was filed so the insurance could be claimed, and then it was forgotten. Six months later, the police were called to a racetrack on the other side of the county, where a man refused to pay his bill. He'd ordered a bottle of the most expensive wine on the menu and said it was a fake. It was one of the props. The assistant who'd ordered the wine bottles for that particular scene had deliberately arranged for the overly accurate fakes with this fraud in mind. The original contents were water and red dye. She'd syringed those out and replaced the liquid with supermarket plonk and had been selling it for 500 euros a bottle. And how much was the restaurant charging? 2,000 euros a bottle. We recovered four more bottles from the racetrack, 15 bottles from the woman's home. The rest had been sold and drunk. An interesting lesson in human behavior, Cholto said, bending down. There's another three empty bottles here. Can't see any more, though. He stood, stepped over the now groaning Marcus, and across to Siobhan. I don't think the story is relevant to this situation. Who here would care if someone might once have paid five thousand dollars or only five dollars for a bottle? He wasn't serving anything other than wine, Siobhan asked. Not that I have found evidence of, Chalto said. Then the numbers are wrong, Siobhan said. We've under forty empty bottles of wine and sixty people in custody outside. When you factor in the wine spilled on the floor, and that surely some people left when the fighting started, that's less than half a bottle per person. She shone the light on the clear broken glass littering the ground. A lot less. No one kept drinking once the fighting began. So they consumed less than a third of a bottle per person, perhaps a quarter bottle. Sure, people's tolerance will have declined, but not by that much. Not if Marcus was running a pub back on Anglesey. Not when a good number of the bags brought back from the city clink with the sound of a salvaged bottle or three. But if collectively they'd only drunk that little, then individually they can't have consumed very much before the fight broke out. The only conclusion, then, is that it wasn't wine in the bottles. The wine was fortified? Adulterated is a better word. Siobhan said, if Marcus had access to spirits, why not sell them? In my experience, publicans usually water down their drinks, not stiffen them. A pair of marines carried a stretcher inside, with which to collect the body of the man who'd been stabbed. Sholto lowered his voice. I think Petrelli was drugged. Did I mention that something was added to his water bottle? You did. Two possible poisonings in one day. Siobhan said, that can't be a coincidence, but it's an odd choice of targets. A group that would be so far from the city their fate wouldn't be immediately known, and a barman whose reputation is so sour, I can't imagine his drinking companions would be much missed. Sholto walked back to Marcus. Where did you get the wine from, Marcus? Marcus! The man groaned, unclenched a little, but didn't reply. Cholto picked up an unopened bottle and turned it back and forth. It looks fine, he said. Let me see, Siobhan said. Foil looks intact, still tight. Pass me another unopened bottle. And a third. Tell you what, if you just lift up that crate, wait. But Cholto had already raised it onto the rickety tabletop. I was going to say that we should check for a claymore first, but never mind. Hmm, yes, look, there are five indentations in the foil. You see, these four, they're equidistant, forming a square. That's from where the foil was pressed onto the bottle. Do you see this fifth hole? In the center? Not quite, it's off-center, and in a slightly different position on each bottle. That might be simply a quirk of the bottling machine, or... It might be from a hypodermic. I'll have to check the cork, but... But how? I hate having the knowledge, but not the equipment. Marcus groaned again, and it'll be far quicker just to ask him. Siobhan added, He seems to be improving. I think these were his takings, Cholto said, picking up a canvas satchel from the floor. As he did, Marcus tried to uncoil, reaching a hand towards the bag. 
but he only managed to roll onto his back, then his side, and then he threw up. Yes, he seems to be getting better, Chiron said. What was he taking in payment? Batteries? A wind-up USB charger? A jar of cumin? A couple of boxes of matches? It's hardly the wealth of ages. Sholto leafed through the rest of the bag's meager contents. There's no ammunition, nothing of any real worth. You say there are hypodermic marks in each of those bottles. So let's say some of the wine was removed, it was replaced with something else. How long would that take? An evening? An hour or two? But only after you found the needle, the bottles, and the adulterant. It had to have been done before we left this morning, Sholto said. Which still leaves the question why, Siobhan said. Marcus, when did you get these bottles? No, it's no good. We'll have to give it another few hours. The door opened, and Callie returned with four sailors. Though four wore the blue and grey, Sholto recognised them as being seasoned hands from the Harper's Ferry. There were no bottles outside, Callie said but there were a few glasses, eight in total. Okay, good. Now take this man to the infirmary, Siobhan said. He's to stay under guard at all times and to be kept away from all the other prisoners, or victims. No one talks to him unless I'm present, not even the Admiral. That's not because I don't trust her, she added quickly. It's a matter of procedure for the trial. We need to do this properly, by the book. That got a round of understanding, if not approving, nods from the sailors. Unceremoniously, they hauled Marcus outside. You have a theory? Sholto asked. The wine was replaced with ethyl alcohol. Probably not pure. Probably something industrial. Red wine might have been chosen over vodka, say, because it would disguise the chemical scent. That's my working theory. But... I'll need more data before I propose a more detailed conclusion. You start on that side of the room. I'll start here. Work your way around the wall first. What am I looking for? If I knew, Javon said, we wouldn't need to search. Cholto shone his light into the corners, and then behind the trampled bags, and beneath the knocked-over tables. It doesn't make sense for Marcus to have known what he was selling, he said as he lifted a crushed sleeping bag. Broken glass lay underneath, but it was recognisable as having previously been a tumbler. Surely he'd know the side effects of drinking industrial ethanol. Would he care? Siobhan asked. I think so, Charlto said. Back on Anglesey, he handed in a bag of pills. They were mostly opiates the people had traded with him. He said... He was donating them to the hospital out of a sense of civic duty. Rachel said Marcus was handing them in because there was no profit in getting someone hooked on a habit for which there was no reliable supply. What a charming woman, Siobhan said. Oh, she was that, Sholto said. At the time, we misinterpreted the message behind her words, thinking it a warning against trusting Marcus rather than an indication of her true character. Even so, I think it says something about the man. He wouldn't have poisoned potential customers, not when he was so short on allies. Ah, hang on. What? I found the knife. Siobhan came over. She bent, shining her torch on the slim blade. A hunting knife, eight-inch blade covered in blood. Looks like a usable print, there, on the handle. That's something. Since we got the other drinkers under arrest, we can easily find a match, although I think that rules out one theory. That the murder was the real reason for the riot? Yes. If it were, then they would have thrown the knife in the sea. No, I think that death was another stupidly tragic accident. She opened the bag she'd taken to Dundalk and had been carrying since. Now, let's take that fingerprint, and if we get very lucky, it might match one of the prints I took from the rack. How long will it take? he asked, as she opened a tub of powder. Not long. Not. Aha, no. It's not a match. 
There's a void here, on the blade, do you see? The killer has a scar on their finger. That'll make it easier to find who wielded the blade, though I doubt it'll help us find who was responsible for the riot. An hour later, Siobhan stopped. That's it, she said. You found something? No, I mean we're finished. There's more to be found here, but we don't have time to do this properly. We don't have the people or the equipment. By now, some of the suspects will be sober enough to give a statement. I'm going to the infirmary to interview them. Will you take what we found back to the command centre? All of it? For now, we only need one of the empty bottles, and only one glass. Take all the full bottles, the knife, and Marcus's takings. I'll get a couple of sentries to stand guard outside. We won't let anyone back in tonight. If an interview ends with a lead... We can come back and search again. Sholto collected the evidence and left the warehouse, mulling over what they'd found and whether they'd really found anything. When he reached the command centre, he found something. He found his duffel bag was missing. He put the evidence on the bunk, knelt down and checked underneath. Then he checked the folding cots nearby, but it wasn't there. He stood looking around, confused. To him, the photographs of Bill and Daisy, of Annette and Kim, and the cramped selfie containing all five of them were beyond price. But to anyone else, they were worthless. When was the last time he'd seen it? It was in the morning, wasn't it? He replayed the events of an increasingly long day. Yes, his bag had been there. He'd moved it underneath the bunk just to make sure no one tripped over it. He knelt down again. Triple-checking exhaustion wasn't making him miss what was in front of his eyes. It was gone. He was sure of it. The beds were indistinguishable. Twice in the last week he'd found someone asleep in his cot. The duffel bag was a different matter. Back on Anglesey, when the other members of the collective had thrown themselves into knitting, Annette had taken a turn. Her attempt at a scarf had resulted in a two-foot-long, two-inch-wide pink and green streamer, which she'd given to him, and which he'd tied around the bag's handle. Someone had taken his bag. That begged two questions, but he thought he knew the why, and it might be an easy way of finding out the who. He walked over to the cabin. It was still locked. The main door to the warehouse swung inward as a pair of sentries came in. They stopped in the doorway, seemingly surprised to find the rest of the building empty. Where is everyone? one asked. It's been a busy day, Sholto said. Were you on the checkpoints? Guarding the grain ships, the woman said. Are you just back from the airport? The, uh, yeah. There was a riot earlier. Everyone's still dealing with that. Stand sentry on the door until the Admiral returns. He walked back to his cot and picked up the evidence. If his hunch was correct, then none of it would be needed. But he'd been wrong too many times before. Chapter 16 The Unconscious Clue Belfast Harbour They'd established the infirmary in a set of offices adjacent to the sea wall previously belonging to Belfast Harbour Maritime Conservation. Like most of the buildings in the harbour, it was a cladded steel prefab, but it was close enough to the anchor John Cabot that electricity could be piped ashore. The freighter's batteries were already working overtime, powering lights and the desalination gear aboard the ship. There wasn't much spare electricity, but it was more than enough for the meagre collection of medical equipment they'd salvaged. Since they had even fewer medicines, the ancient ventilator, decrepit defibrillators, and creaking EKGs offered little more than certainty as to the reason that a patient might die. In their few days of residence, the infirmary had been a place where cuts were stitched and wounds were sterilized. The more serious cases were shipped over to the John Cabot, where they usually died. 
but at least their last hours were spent in peace. It was a deep frustration for the Admiral and for her crew of war zone surgeons and battlefield medics that triage was as much as could be done. Transferring the terminal cases to the container ship was more a gesture for those left ashore. It was an illusion, a myth, a fantasy that the sick could still be cured, and that illusion had finally been broken. The infirmary was now full. The beds were narrow cots, the same style of folding beds as those in the command centre. Here they'd been laid on pallets, so that a recumbent patient was four feet above the ground. All the beds were occupied, as were the chairs in the waiting room. More of the poisoned brawlers were sprawled in the storeroom, where salvaged medical equipment was sorted before usually being dumped into the sea. Patients filled the pharmacy, where a new recruit was hastily clearing the mostly empty shelves of the few still efficacious medicines. The sick lined the corridors, but Sholto stopped looking at them and began counting the guards. They were everywhere. It was a necessity, of course, but was the purpose of the poisoning to remove the guards from their posts? He remembered the missing claymores. Was the purpose to move all the guards here? There were too many people present to search the building, too many places to hide an explosive. A pair of doctors dashed past, their expressions grim. As Sholto stepped out of their way, he caught sight of Leo Fennec, slumped in the corner, looking as worn and battered as the plastic chair in which he sat. Leo, what happened? Sholto asked. Ah, Thaddeus, Fennec said, his voice unsteady, his face ashen except where a neat bandage covered his left cheek. I, I heard you were back. What happened to you? Sholto asked again. A bottle, I think, Fennec said. I, I was, I heard the riot. I tried to stop it. They wouldn't listen. He raised a hand to the bandage. I tried to gather everyone I could. I didn't take too many, did I? The checkpoint. Are we safe? He made to stand, but Sholto laid a hand on his shoulder. It's fine. We're okay. It was Marcus, Fenwick said. He was running a bar. God knows what he was selling but it looks like he's poisoned everyone. Since he's in the same state himself, I don't think it was intentional, Sholto said. Rest up. It's going to be a long couple of days. He went to find the Admiral, but she was inserting a tube into a woman's stomach. He left her to it and went to find Marcus instead. Behind the office building, but in the same fenced depot, was a small garage containing eight forklift trucks, and a large lockable cage. They'd been using that as their jail, though it had principally been a place to hold the drunks overnight until Nicola Kennedy could pass judgment in the morning. Callie was outside, next to Toussaint and Petrelli, who were standing guard. Where's the bomb? Now this. What's going on, sir? Petrelli asked. Not so loud, Sholto said, looking around but no one else was within earshot. Whatever this is, it's coming to a head. Keep your eyes open, your weapons ready. Marcus is inside? With Siobhan, Callie said. Then come with me, Shalto said. He turned again to the two Marines. Safety's off. Seriously? Toussaint asked. Seriously, Shalto said. Leaving the guards more watchful than ever, he and Callie went inside. Marcus was alone in the cage. Siobhan sat at a battered desk, watching him. Sholto placed the evidence bag next to her. He didn't leave it in the command center, Siobhan asked. Sholto glanced over at Marcus, then gestured they should move out of earshot. Only when all three stood in the lee of a rusting yellow forklift did he speak, and even then he kept his voice low. My bag was gone, he said. It was underneath my bunk in the command center, and someone took it. Someone stole your bag? Why? Callie said. What was in it? Nothing much, Sholto said. There were some clothes, 
photographs, a couple of books. Nothing of value to anyone except me, but the thief didn't know that. Callie, you and Colum were the first to get to Marcus's warehouse? The first that didn't go inside and have a drink, she said. Tell me what happened. Start with this morning, just after we left. I was in the command center looking through the satellite images, she said. No one else was there. No one who didn't belong. Lieutenant Butler was floating around most of the time. Colin popped in when he was passing, A Mr. Fennec was in and out. Some of the guards from the night shift were asleep. A couple more tried to sleep and then went out again. I didn't see anyone unusual, but it wasn't great looking. And if you were looking, you would have seen people dressed in blue and grey, Trevon said. Anyone could have donned that uniform, walked in and taken that bag. When did you leave the command centre? When I got the phone call about the bomb, Callie said. I left the cabin, but I locked it. I made sure to do that. Then I went to find Lieutenant Whitley. I saw Colin first, and sent him to find John, and I went back inside to wait by the phone. I was only gone for a few minutes. I, I don't think anyone was inside the command center. I looked around, and I thought I was alone in there. The sailors had been asleep. I think they'd all woken and gone out by then. I might be wrong. We have a guard roster. Siobhan said, we can check. If we have time, Shelto said. If we have need, what then? I stayed by the phone in the cabin, Callie said. I wasn't able to concentrate, so I was just looking out the window at the rest of the warehouse. I'm sure I would have seen someone take you back. The Admiral came back with Siobhan, and then you went to meet Shelto in Belfast, while Lieutenant Whitley went to search the armory, check on the guards, and... And I'm not sure what else. That was about the time I said I needed some air. Gollum didn't want me to go out. I guess he was worried there'd be another bomb somewhere, but I'd been in the command centre all day. I know I'd locked the door to the cabin, and there were sentries outside. Two of them. Um, then Gollum and I went for a walk. We saw a lot of people, and he seemed to know them all. He's good at learning people's names, Siobhan said. We didn't see anything, Callie said, not until Alexis Keegan ran up to us. I think that's her name. You should ask Colum. I sort of recognized her face, but I don't think I've ever spoken to her before. Keegan, you sure? Siobhan asked. What did she say? That there was a fight in the warehouse, Callie said. Colum and I went there. He said I should stay outside, but... She shrugged. That's about it. A few minutes later, you arrived. There were no guards in the command center's door when I got there, Shalto said. Not that I think that matters. The only thing of real worth in the command center is the satellite uplink. The doors to the cabin were locked. I didn't check the laptops were still there, but their password protected. I suppose since they managed to hack into that green ship's navigation system, they might be able to hack my laptop. We should check. But I don't think that's why my bag was stolen. They'd planned that I'd be dead by then, dead or injured thanks to that bomb. That might be the reason that our group was chosen as the target, or at least one of the reasons. Why, I thought you said there was nothing in the bag, Callie said. It's not what's in there, but what someone thinks is in there, Shalto said. And they thought it was worth engineering a bar fight to acquire it? Callie asked. It wasn't a bar fight, Siobhan said. It was murder, mass murder. Two people died on their way to the infirmary. One of them had seemed absolutely fine. She was walking, talking, though her speech was a little slurred. She collapsed halfway here. There is a good chance that more will die. This isn't someone trying to sell cheap booze to a pub. We're dealing with a mass and deliberate poisoning. And that's the fourth crime today, only counting those we're aware of. We've got the theft of the mines, the planting of that bomb, the theft of your bag, and now this. I'm going back to the command centre. I want to check whether anyone broke into the cabin. Did you turn off that camera you had on top of the warehouse? Sholto asked. What camera? Callie asked. I was recording who came and went from Marcus's warehouse. It's still there, Siobhan said. 
or it was this morning. Will it have recorded who went into the command center? Chelto asked. It didn't have the angle to show the doors, but it should have recorded who walked along the road. If you knew the camera was there, you'd be able to avoid it. But from Callie's reaction, she didn't know about it. Does anyone? As far as I know, it was just you and me, Siobhan said. Can you check on it discreetly? We might get lucky. In the meantime, I think I'll have a word with Marcus. Marcus lay curled in a fetal position on six inches of cardboard. His eyes were half open, and his legs were half covered by a clean red blanket. Sholto ran a hand across the wire mesh. It was a pitiful sight, and a primitive jail, held closed by a new padlock and plastic-coated chain. Do you have the key? Here, Callie said, fishing it from her pocket. Siobhan didn't think he'd be able to escape, but I don't think it's worth taking risks. Wise, Sholto said. Marcus didn't move as the padlock was undone, but his eyelids flickered and firmly closed. Do you want me to get a bucket of seawater? Callie asked. That might wake him up a bit. Considering what the seawater is like these days, I think that would count as cruel and unusual. After what he did to all those people in the bar, I think he deserves it. Tempting as that is, better not, Sholto said. Marcus? Marcus, can you hear me? The barman rolled his head back and gave them a look that might have been baleful if he'd been able to stop blinking. Where did you get the wine from, Marcus? Sholto asked. War wine, Marcus replied. Then he leaned forward and vomited over the floor. Sholto sighed and unclipped his water bottle from his belt. Here, he said, unscrewing the cap. It's water. Just water. Not much, but enough for a rinse and spit. He had to help Marcus tilt his head back. A good portion spilled over the man's face. Even so, Marcus spluttered and spat over Sholto's uniform. Oh, well. I needed a clean one. All right, Marcus. Can you tell us what happened? Do you remember? Bamble a lot, he mumbled. Do you remember opening a bar? No law against that, Marcus said. No law against selling a few drinks. His words rang with self-righteous anger, which had the benefit of making him coherent. No, you're right. There isn't, Sholto said. You're not in trouble. We just want to know where you got the wine from. Oh? Oh, Marcus muttered. With that, he seemed mollified. His head dropped back to his chest. No, no, don't sleep yet, Sholto said. The wine was poisoned, Marcus. Do you understand? You've been poisoned. Poison? He slurred. Where did you get the wine from? Rachel, Marcus said. Rachel? She's dead, Sholto said. For the briefest of moments, he wondered if she might somehow be alive. But no. Bill had shot her, and Sholto had come into the bar in time to see the blood spill onto the dark floor. She liked poison, Marcus muttered. That begs a lot of questions, Sholto said. They'll have to wait. Where did you get the wine from? Didn't drink much, Marcus muttered. Can't be a good barman if you drink your profits. No, Sholto said, playing along to keep the man talking. And you are a good barman, I'll give you that. Are you selling anything other than wine? Only to people who'd finished their shift, Marcus said, half answering the question. Told them. Asked them. Said, you can't drink before work, only after. Told them. Yeah, and I bet you didn't actually check, Callie said. Not my job to check, Marcus said. Should have been. Should have been leader. I won. Last candidate standard. Standing. St standing. Should have been me. Snot. 
our people paying? Sholto asked, not caring about that particular answer, but just wanting to keep the barman talking. With whatever they had, Marcus said. Batteries, matches, don't care. Not about profit, about business. Good business. Can't give away for free. Can't charge much, no one has much, not now. No me. Have to build up the business. Rebuild the brand. Hey! And suddenly he was alert. Where's my takings? It's okay. It's fine. No one's touched them. They're under lock and key. You can collect them when you're feeling better. Right. Right, good. Marcus murmured, his head beginning to loll once more. No, you can't sleep yet, Shalto said. Where did you get the wine from? Just sold a few glasses, that's all. Didn't take bullets, told him. Hand them in. I don't want bullets, don't want trouble. Just want quiet life. Shouldn't have run for mayor. Didn't want to. Rachel's idea, Willis, said it was smart. What did he know? Said he was sorry. Came to me this morning. Said the wine was an apology. You got the wine from Willis? Callie asked. Sholto waved her into silence. An apology for what, Marcus? Come to Anglesey. You'll be safe. Work and you'll be rewarded. Stand and you'll be elected. Wasn't safe. Wasn't any reward. Told to leave. So we left. Came here. But why? For what? No farms here. No food. Nothing but rain. Nothing but zombies. It's all a waste. All pointless. Lost everything. Lost Willis. Said he was going his own way. Where's he gonna go? Thinks there's a bunker. There's no bunker, I told him. If there's a bunker, Wright would have gone there. Wouldn't have sent us here. There's no bunker. There's nothing. The wine was an apology, Sholto prompted. For leaving. Took everyone with him. It's fine. Can get more people. More muscle. That's all he was. I don't need him. Everyone wants a job. Wants a purpose. Said mine was to be barman. Gave me the wine. Said it was a peace offering. Said it was vintage. Worth a hundred pounds a bottle. It's not. It's just cheap. Cheap, cheap, like a bird. Time was running out. The man was drifting out of consciousness. How many people did he take? Chalto asked. I should have kept birds, Marcus said. I liked birds, but Dad always said pigeons were a man's best friend. People go away, but pigeons always come back. Sholto sighed. I think that's all we'll get for now, he said. Was any of that useful? Callie asked. I think so, Sholto said. He led her back to the cage door. When they were outside, he locked the door. Then they walked away from the cage. So, are you going to tell me what you think? Callie asked, when they were out of the semi-conscious man's hearing. Give me a moment. Sholto said, I just want to go over what he said. I think we have all the pieces now, but I need to be sure. We have to be sure, because we'll only get one shot at this. Is your gun loaded? Callie's hand went to the holster at her belt. I, I think so. Why? Because I think they just wanted to kill Marcus, not everyone else. They must know he's still alive. They might try to finish the job. Probably not until nightfall, he added. That's less than an hour away, she said. Siobhan returned ten minutes later, and with the Admiral. As the door closed behind them, Sholto caught sight of the skyline. The sun was already setting. As the Admiral went to examine Marcus, Sholto met Siobhan's eyes and gave a small shake of his head. Her hand was already halfway out of her pocket. She put it back in. When she did take it out, it was empty. You'll be fine, the Admiral said, coming to join them. 
I don't think he drank much, and what he did, he threw up. He'll need observation and fluids, and he'll feel like death for a week, but he'll live. Did he talk? Siobhan asked. Cholto nodded. He'd had time to think, to put the pieces together, and he knew what to say, and what to keep to himself. He said the wine came from Willis, that it was an apology, and that Willis thought the bottles were worth a hundred pounds each. Who's Willis? the Admiral asked. Marcus's former henchman and bodyguard, Sholto said. His full name is Eustace Charles Willis Green, Siobhan said. He's a former sergeant in the Royal Marines, honorably discharged on medical grounds. He then took a job with a mercenary company. They operated shipping and logistics in Iraq and Afghanistan. It's there he met Marcus. Marcus was a truck driver. From what I can gather, Marcus wasn't military, but entirely civilian. He met Willis by chance after the outbreak. Willis was traveling with a group of twelve other mercenaries and somewhere between eight and ten civilians. For some reason, Willis was happy to let Marcus play the officer. They got to Anglesey, and the rest is history. I should add that my principal source of information for this was Willis himself, from the transcript of an interview Kim undertook back on Anglesey after he left Marcus's, uh, let's say, employ. Some or all of that might have been made up. Back on Anglesey, Willis shot Rachel, Sholto said. Bill fired too, but so did Willis. At the time we thought it was Aya. Irritation, anger at having been betrayed. That's what the man said. And since it counted as self-defense, we left the matter there. We had no reason to doubt him, because we thought Rachel's death brought that matter to an end. Of course, now we know we were wrong. He killed Rachel to stop her from talking. A few weeks before that, Rachel killed Paul for the very same reason. After we confronted Paul in that pub, after Paul ran, after I gave chase, Rachel shot him so he wouldn't talk. This group aren't imaginative. Paul was wanted for murder, for poisoning David Llewellyn. That was staged like a zombie attack, but the man was drugged first. In that case, it was with adulterated beer, not wine. But it's the exact same M.O. When Sarika Locke came to Anglesey, Rachel gave her a drugged drink. Like I said, they're not imaginative. But Rachel is dead, Javon said. She is, isn't she? Yep, Sholto said. Any idea what they drank? Not yet, the Admiral said. My hypothesis is that there are two compounds, an intoxicant and a poison. Red wine was chosen as the delivery mechanism due to its strong scent and flavor. My initial theory was industrial ethanol and a cyanic compound. Neither would be rare in a working city like Belfast. We lost another patient half an hour ago. Cardiac arrest. That is consistent with cyanide, but... But I'm not confident with that diagnosis. I think this was something considerably more toxic. Then there's no reason to assume there won't be more poisonings, Callie said. There's no reason to assume that more of those who've been poisoned won't die, the Admiral said. I see, Siobhan said, and we still don't have any leads as to the whereabouts of the missing claymores. Did Marcus say when he was given the bottles of wine? This morning, Shalto said. I'll say this for him. He's not someone to let the grass grow when there's money to be made from cutting it. And he'd already taken over that warehouse, more or less, Siobhan said. Was he the only target? That's my theory, Shalto said. Willis told him that the wine was worth a hundred pounds a bottle. Give most people a crate of those and they'll try a glass or two. If you knew Marcus, you'd know that he wouldn't drink much more than that, so you'd overload the dose to make sure that a single glass would kill. But even if he was the only person poisoned... Wouldn't it be obvious what had happened? Callie asked. Perhaps they planned to stage the scene after he died, Siobhan said. Let's not speculate too much, as it'll distract us from the evidence. 
Okay, Tally said. So all the bottles were poisoned because they didn't know which bottle he'd open, right? Then why not just give him one bottle? Because Willis knew Marcus better than most, Shalto said. Give Marcus only one bottle of an apparently expensive wine, and he'd trade it. Give him a few crates, and he'd obviously open a bar. And Willis abandoned Marcus? the Admiral asked. After the election, yes, Chabon said. Because Marcus was no use to him anymore, Chalto said. The man was his front, just like Marcus had been for Rachel, and like I think Rachel had been for... for Willis. He's behind all of this? the Admiral asked. Including the sabotage? Why don't we ask him? Chalto said. You know where he is? the Admiral asked. I know where he was, Chavon said. There's a container park next to the aggregate depot on Herdman Channel Road. There isn't much there except some shipping container offices. I thought it a strange place for him to take over, except now I realize what he wanted. That place is a very short sprint to the checkpoint that runs between Seal Road and Dargan Road. So, if we do this wrong, he could disappear into Belfast, the Admiral said. Give me ten minutes. I'll get the people we need. Sholto bit his lip, waiting until she was gone before he turned to Siobhan. Did you get the camera footage? he asked, his voice even lower than before. She nodded. There's no one unusual on it, certainly not Willis. No one unusual. That was what Sholto had feared. Chapter 17 Night Arrest Belfast Harbour Half an hour later, night had truly begun to settle, and the harbour was more subdued than on previous evenings. News of the brawl and the subsequent hospitalisation of so many had spread, but no official explanation had been given. Earlier, following the discovery of the missing explosives, the Admiral had recalled the patrols and scavenging teams that had ventured into the city. Again, no explanation had been given. Added to the uncertainty over their immediate future, most people lurked inside, where rumour and fear were creating facts of their own. The community was at breaking point, yet they might still avoid disaster if dawn brought a trial, justice and hope. Otherwise, those whispering rumours would turn outward, while fear turned inward, and a few dozen mutinous sailors would be the least of their troubles. Despite that, the harbour was far from quiet. Pans rattled, chains clinked, footsteps echoed. Water dripped from a broken pipe onto the masonry at Shalto's feet. A shell had reduced the building to a maze of shattered concrete and twisted steel, but it was the closest cover to the depot Willis had occupied. Next to Sholto, behind the jumble of rubble, were Chavorn, Toussaint, and half a dozen other veteran marines. Three rangers and a marine sniper had set up overwatch positions on the opposite side of the depot, ready to offer covering fire. Sholto hoped that four would be enough, as he waited for Lieutenant Whitley to return and give the order to advance. His fingers rolled around the handle of the bolt cutters. That was to be his duty in this arrest, a task that would keep him out of the way of the professionals. He understood the logic behind that. He might have seen action in the last year, but that wasn't the same as war. In his life before, he'd avoided violence, though it hadn't always avoided him. He smiled at that conceit. In truth, it was giving the authorities a reason to ask questions that he'd avoided. This time, he'd be the one asking the questions, though he already knew most of the answers. One minute, Whitley whispered, his tone clipped. Charlto hadn't even heard the man approach. There were no guards outside, the lieutenant continued. No sign of movement. Inside, there were three containers, stacked one on top of the other. There's an external staircase at the southern end. Two lights are shining from the topmost container. 
Before that, there are two abandoned trailer rigs and two trailers without rigs. Might be hostiles inside the cabs. Two containers in the northern corner might be hostiles there, too. Make for the containers, secure the high ground, but watch your six. Thirty seconds. They stretched for an eternity. Go! Cholto sprinted from cover, the heavy footsteps of the assault team close on his heels. He slipped on the pitted concrete, slick from rain, ice and sea spray, nearly twisted an ankle in an unseen pothole. But he didn't stop until he reached the gate in the chain-link fence. It took him a full second to find the padlock, another to position the bolt cutters around the steel, a third to cut through. By then, the rest of the assault team were breathing down his neck. As the padlock fell to the ground, they pushed through and spread out into the compound. Cholto soundlessly placed the bolt cutters on the ground, though surely Willis had already heard them approach. He unslung his rifle and followed Siobhan through the gate. Immediately in front was a trailer detached from a rig. He ran around its side. Beyond, there were the bulky shadows of the two rigs, and then the three containers stacked one above the other. Guttering ran along the topmost container, with a pipe leading down to a recently installed water butt. Each container had two windows, three feet square. The two in the topmost container were curtained, with a dim glow coming from behind each. Between the windows was a door, and outside was a narrow walkway, more akin to scaffolding than a balcony. That walkway led to a metal staircase that ran up the side of the containers, and up which now ran the assault team. Heavy boots pounded against metal as they ran up the stairs two at a time. Lights pinned to chest, head, and rifle jerked upwards, creating dancing pools of light that gleamed off exposed steel. Dully reflected off container walls, then shone against the cracked glass of the container's curtained windows. The container's doors didn't open. The curtains didn't twitch. No lights came on. The Marines had split into three teams, and they reached the container doors almost at the same time. Whitley, standing where he had a view of each team, yelled, Go! Shalto held his breath as the breaching teams pushed their way inside. No shots came, nor did any explosions. Dim light came on behind the curtained windows of the lower two containers, and then came a word from above, which was then echoed from below. Clear! Clear! Clear, sir. Toussaint added. You better come and see this. Cholto and Siobhan followed Whitley to the lowermost container. Cholto turned on his torch, but scanned the doorway for tripwires before he stepped inside. The danger of those was quickly forgotten as he looked around the container. Three armchairs ringed an unlit but smoke-blackened barbecue. Wind-up LED lights hung from the ceiling. Further along, three hammocks hung between the walls and above a row of sealed plastic crates. On the floor below a narrow table lay a mosaic of broken crockery. Amid the shards was a corpse. A woman, in green army surplus, shot once in the chest, once between the eyes. In her hands was a suppressed SA-80. Opposite her, in a threadbare brown armchair, on the other side of the doorway was the body of a man. Again, shot twice, again, with a gun in his hands. Whitley stepped outside and turned his head upwards. Status? He barked. Dead, sir, came the call from the container above. It was echoed a moment later from the topmost doorway. They're all dead. Get everyone out. Secure the perimeter, Siobhan said. Touch nothing. Fine. But remember the missing explosives, Whitley said. I better get the admiral. You better do something about them, Sholto said. He pointed to the gate, where four people with lamps in hands and fishing rods over their shoulders stood, gawping. Hey! Whitley called. 
running over to the onlookers. I hope he remembers their civilians, Siobhan said. That's a problem for later, Sholto said. You heard the officer, he added, addressing the sailors and marines, but speaking loud enough for the onlookers to hear. Secure the perimeter. Touch nothing in the crime scene. Crime scene? Isn't that just the case? Siobhan murmured, her hands patting her pockets. No gloves. Fine. Let's take a look. I mean, I'll take a look. You stay here. She walked to the stairs. Cholto looked back towards the gate. The crowd was growing. There would be a problem, but there was a more pressing one. He played the light over the ground, then across the depot. He walked over to the nearest rig, clambered up the steps, and checked inside the cab. He found a blanket, a few books and a pair of discarded bottles, but they'd contained stout, not wine. It had the look of a place someone might come to get a few minutes of relative solitude, not somewhere they'd sleep. He jumped down and returned to the containers. From the torchlight, Siobhan was in the middle container. Sholto climbed the stairs to join her. Three dead, Siobhan said, all have guns in their hands, and at least two bullets inside each. I know him, Sholto said, pointing at the young man furthest from the door. I don't know his name, though. He was in Marcus's pub back on Anglesey. The barman attracted a mixture of ex-military and the impressionable young. I know her, Siobhan said, pointing at the woman lying face down on the floor. That's Lexi Keegan. The woman who told Callie about the riot? Except she called herself Lexi, not Alexis, but yes. I'm sure it's the same person. Lexi said she was a former search and rescue pilot. She volunteered her services to me a few days ago, said if we needed a helicopter pilot, she'd like to help. Before we went to Dundalk, so before we decided to go back to the airport, Sholto asked. Yes, but everyone knows about the fuel tankers, Siobhan said. It's not a great leap to assume we'd send an expedition there. She didn't put her name for it early in the year, back on Anglesey, when Mary was looking for pilots. Sholto said. Perhaps he wasn't a pilot. Perhaps he just wanted to be part of that expedition so she could sabotage it. Perhaps, when no expedition was quickly forthcoming, that's why they stole the claymores. Or perhaps he was genuinely trying to get out from under whatever this was. It's dangerous to let our imaginations race ahead of the evidence. But she was someone I wanted to speak to. After seeing the wreck and Dundalk, and considering the company she kept, she was at the top of my list of leads. Cholto shone his light around the room. We're supposed to think they shot one another, yes? I don't know, Siobhan said. You've seen crime scenes, haven't you? When people are shot, they usually drop their weapon. These two are holding theirs. The exception is Keegan, lying face down. Her sidearm is next to her hand. Yes, it's possible that someone might think they killed one another, but I certainly don't. A torchlight settled on two enamel mugs on a scavenged wooden side table. She played the light across the floor until she found a third mug. Three mugs. Opposite, she said, that these people aren't imaginative. She picked up a mug from the table. There are a few drops of clear liquid inside. It could be something. It could be water. It could be they contained something and then were rinsed out. There's a damp stain on the rug here. Hard to tell what it is. Go and check the container below. See if there's any mugs, cups or glasses that have been recently used. Cholto took one last searching glance around the container, then headed to the door. The stairs, then the container below. Inside, there were two tumblers on a table between the armchairs. Both were empty, save for a small splash of clear liquid. He raised an empty glass to his nose and sniffed, but all he could smell was the room. He lowered the glass and sniffed again. The most potent smell was that of death, but beneath it 
was a chemically floral scent. Now he considered it. There had been the same smell in the container above. Was it air freshener, or was it something else? In his time, he'd seen more crime scenes than most. He'd even staged a few, but nothing quite like this. There were too many clues and too much evidence, and it was all contradictory. And that he realized was the point. With guns in their hands. But without bullet holes in the walls, it was unlikely that Willis's people had shot one another. Unlikely, but not impossible. Chavorn might be able to test whether the bullets in the bodies came from the guns on the floor, but it would take time. The glasses, with a splash of clear liquid, could have contained a sedative, or perhaps a poison, or perhaps it was water from when the glasses had been rinsed out. There were no bottles close to the glasses. If the poison was self-administered, then someone had to have collected the bottles. But in which case, why leave the glasses on display? From the admiral's uncertainty over what was in the wine bottles, it was unlikely that they could test any samples. Would they send an expedition to the police station or to a forensics lab to bring equipment back? Perhaps not. But they could be expected to spend a good few hours discussing it. He checked the nearest corpse. It was cold, but the blood was still tacky. He wiped his hand on his leg. Clever, very clever. They'd been killed within the last few hours. It was after he had taken his team to the airport. The question was whether these people had died before or after it had become clear. Marcus was selling the wine rather than simply poisoning himself. The admiral would ascertain a more accurate time of death, but even that would only narrow it down to within a few hours. Yes, there was too much evidence, so much that any investigation would drag on for days, perhaps weeks, and with the results remaining inconclusive. Yes, clever, but too clever. It was, more or less, the confirmation that he needed. Chalto, Chavorn called from above. He hurried upstairs. Willis had lived in a topmost container, but there were two separate metal framed beds, both with neatly squared away sheets. It was safe to assume that the second bed belonged to the man slumped against the wall, a shotgun in his hands, a bullet hole in his forehead. Willis sat in an armchair, a pistol in his lap, a bullet hole in his chest. But the shot clearly hadn't come from a shotgun. I think the plan was to stage a shootout, Chalto said. I think they were drugged and were expected to be in the same container. Fire a shot into each, and then empty a magazine or three into the container walls, relying on the sound of gunfire to bring so many people the crime scene would be contaminated. When Willis's people were discovered split over these three containers, a plan was changed. They opted to confuse the situation. Maybe. Javon shone her light under one of the beds. Take a look. Careful, it's the claymores. I can't see any wires, but but just be careful. Chalto eased past her and knelt down. A tan-colored canvas bag lay under the bed. Carefully, he lifted the unclasped flap and opened the bag. One, two, three. I can't see how many more without moving the bag. Can't see any wires, no tape, no detonators. I don't think they're alive. I think the bag was left there so we could find it. Chavorn said. Willis was ex-military, and so were some of his people. He'd know how to use plastic explosive. He'd know how to use a remote detonator, and from the gear they've scavenged, it had no qualms going out beyond the checkpoint. And he managed it without being spotted, Shalto said. That's worrying in itself. But okay, if he wanted to blow us up, he'd have done a better job of it. And if you wanted to frame someone as a bomber, how'd you do it? Chavorn said. 
How many people would recognise plastic explosive if it doesn't have wires in it? That's why the claymores were taken. It was so whoever discovered them would instantly recognise what they found and draw a line between Willis, the missing explosive, and the bomb that had killed you. Not quite, Cholto said, drawing his knife from his belt. Carefully he ran it between the top of the bag and the bottom of the bed. Then, just as carefully, he reached around, probing what lay beyond the bag. Nothing above. Help me move the bed. He stood. What do you mean, not quite? Siobhan asked. I think the claymores were taken because our thief didn't know what plastic explosive looks like. Do you have an idea who's behind this? Do you have a name? He told her. Seriously? Who else? It has to be someone who can enter the command center unseen. Someone who knew what was in the armory. Someone with access to information. Someone with authority. Lift. They raised the bed, flipped it over, and laid it on top of the other bed. Cholto bent down again, checking the bag. No wires. He eased the knife underneath the bag, then carefully lifted it. No traps. We're supposed to think that Willis planted the bomb, Siobhan said. I think he did. He wired it anyway. I don't think he planted it himself. People would have noticed him hanging around the command center. Then, let's see. What did they hope would happen, Siobhan said, taking a step away from the bag. The bomb was supposed to go off when Petrelli's bag was opened. They had no way of guaranteeing when that was, but they probably expected it to be before lunchtime. Nor could they guarantee that all of you would die. They would expect someone to come back. The armory would be searched, and it would be discovered that the claymores were missing. A search would be conducted, and Marcus would be found dead. Would they have returned to his body and shot or stabbed him? Would they have removed the bottles, or left them there for us to assume poison? Either way, we would have looked for his previous associates and come here. They wanted us to find these bodies, and then the claymores, and then... Then what? What are we missing? Because none of that makes any sense. Yes, it creates fear, anger, terror. But how does that benefit anyone? We're missing the last act of this little drama, Sholto said. But I can tell you how it began. They had a plan but it involved the grain ship sinking, not running aground in Dundalk. I suspect their plan also didn't involve the new world being sent down there. That changed things, and it's why they stole the mines. What changed today is that Cali found the small boats in Dunkirk, and the larger vessels in Cali. We found a salvation. There is hope. Enough hope to even quell a mutiny. And don't you think it's odd how talk of a mutiny has grown so vociferous? Out of all that's happened, that's the easiest piece of this chaos to orchestrate. And now we've found the ships. They need to act before we retrieve them. I'd say they're clearing up loose ends, Sholto said, or finishing up that task, because they began it before Callie found those ships. They want Marcus dead because he was in that pub. When I questioned him... He said something about poison, so he clearly learned more from Rachel than what he's told us so far. Willis and these people, they were the foot soldiers, the muscle. They were in the pub to watch Marcus and to watch Rachel as well. You see, Keegan was a helicopter pilot. I bet she knew how to sabotage a plane, and I'm sure that among them they knew how to wreck a ship. No, they were loose ends. They had to die. So now we arrest them, Siobhan said, except we don't have evidence. No, we have evidence. We have a ton of it, but nothing concrete. Nothing that won't count as circumstantial. It doesn't matter, Sholto said. There won't be a trial. But there might be justice. We need to... The explosion echoed across the harbour. The container shook. Outside came screaming, but more in fear than pain. As Siobhan ran to the door, Sholto grabbed the canvas bag. 
heedless of any potential traps, he emptied it onto the floor. There were only six claymores. His mind went blank, momentarily unable to complete the simple calculation. There are two more missing, he said. Two more. But Siobhan had already gone. Cholto took two steps towards the door before he doubled back, gathered up the claymores, and scooped them into the bag. That in hand, he ran to the door, out onto the walkway, and to the stairs. He'd descended three steps when a second explosion rent the air. He paused, foot raised. One more. Only one more. He descended another two steps before the final missing mine detonated. He jumped down the remaining stairs and sprinted to the gate. Toussaint was there, but he was alone. The lieutenant's gone to investigate, Toussaint said. Sounded like the explosion came from near the checkpoints. And Shabon? Gone to get the admiral, Toussaint said. Not that she'll need a warning. Everyone will have heard that. A piercing scream came from the direction of the explosions. It's not just people who will have heard it, Chalto said. The zombies will too. Come on, we'll help. The lieutenant told me to guard the crime scene, Toussaint said. There's no point, Chalto said. We won't have time to collect the evidence, let alone process it. No, there's no point now. Here. He thrust the canvas bag into the specialist's hands. The claymores. There were six of them. Then that's all of them accounted for, Toussaint said, slinging the bag over his shoulder. Let's hope so, Sholto said. Together, they ran towards the screaming. Chapter 18 Fighting Retreat Belfast Harbour The narrow tongue of land they'd fortified jutted into the Irish Sea at a forty-five degree angle. To the south was the Victoria Channel, blocked by the sunken wreck of a cruise ship. South of that, across the water, were the rubble-filled craters that had been the city airport, and the industrial units that turned to farmland and villages as Belfast diffused into the Ards Peninsula. Two roads led from the harbour into Belfast itself, Dargan Road in the north and Seal Road in the south. Between them ran a narrow flood channel, filled with a brackish mixture of runoff rain and overspilled seawater. That channel and the narrow width of the two roads was what gave the harbour its security. To the south of their temporary home, where Seal Road met the mainland, and turned into Herdman Channel Road, was a narrow front, one hundred metres long, between an aggregate depot and a chemical processing plant. It was from there that the screams came, until they abruptly stopped. At first glance, the checkpoint appeared intact. Gloria Rycroft knelt in the road, a marine's head in her lap. The rest of the man's body was a shredded ruin. Sholto sped up, but it was already too late. Gloria closed the man's eyes and gently lowered his head to the ground. What happened? Sholto asked. I feel I should ask you that, Gloria said. I stayed here when you went to deal with the rioting. We got word that the riot was just a brawl and then, then, I don't know. She looked down. I don't even know his name. Chuck Branford, Toussaint said came from money. Signed up as a private three years ago to prove something to his parents. Proved something to himself, and proved himself to his comrades time and time again. Poor man, Gloria said. It was a bomb, yes? Another claymore? Yeah, Cholto said. Can you tell me anything about the other two explosions? Gloria shrugged. Other than they came from over there, and that's the direction Lieutenant Whitley went, no. Sir, with your permission? Toussaint asked. Of course, Sholto said. Do what you can. Gloria picked up her rifle and followed the specialist into the nightmare. A quick examination of the checkpoint confirmed his first impression. Illumination came from rechargeable flashlights rigged on long poles like lanterns, and most of those had been knocked out of position. 
They cast more shadow than light, but it was enough to tell that the mine had done little damage. To build the barricade, they'd stripped the sheet metal cladding from the wrecked warehouses, supported it with girders, then concrete, then filled the gap between with rubble and rubbish until it formed a wall that was ten feet high and four feet deep. It would take more than a landmine to blast a hole through it. Even the gate, an outward-pointing V formed of two sections of sheet metal, had sustained little damage. The razor wire cemented to its top had suffered even less. He glanced behind, then around, shining his torch on one body and then the next. Had the mine been placed on top of the gate, it might have blown it open but the bomb had been set some twenty metres behind the barricade, by the side of the road. What do we do? a voice asked from the darkness. Sholto turned around and saw a thin crowd. None wore the blue and grey, but most carried a tool if not a weapon. Half of you stand guard, he said. The rest? Look for the wounded. Take them back to the infirmary. With that, he climbed over the gate and went to look for Whitley and the other two blast sites. Where the checkpoint was heavily reinforced, the rest of the narrow front between the harbour and the mainland was not. Zombies followed sound. They followed people. The undead did not attack the weakest point. People did. And Sholto hadn't considered what their weakest point was until he reached the group of marines standing in the road a dozen metres back from the orange glow of a spreading fire. What happened? Sholto asked, though he saw the answer before anyone needed to speak. The line of their defences followed an access road. On their refugees' side was an aggregate depot that had become the fuel store. On the hostile city side of the road was a chemical works. The heavy-duty fence, the sheet metal wall, and the side of the warehouses had been co-opted into their defences, though it was the checkpoints deeper in the city that kept the undead truly at bay. One of the explosions had ripped a hole in the sheet metal wall of the aggregate depot. The other mine had started a fire deep within the depot. That wouldn't have mattered, except that they had been using the mostly empty space to store the furniture, floorboards, roof beams and other salvaged wood. Our wood store is burning, Whitley said. The fire was burning quick and hot, with flames leaping six feet above piles of timber stacked twenty feet high. The smoke was billowing citywards, and it was a quickly growing plume. Three explosions, Whitley said slowly. The checkpoint, the wall, and the wood store. We found the claymores in Willis's container, Sholto said. There were six. Counting the device planted in our bag earlier, they're all accounted for. The claymores may be, Whitley said, but that fire wasn't started by an anti-personnel mine alone. From further down the road, beyond the fire, came a familiar shout. Zombie! A moment later came another shout. Clear! That was too loud, Whitley murmured. But what does it matter? The zombies will have heard the explosion. The checkpoint was far closer than Sholto had realized. Due to the daily procession of people coming back and forth with salvaged wood, the construction was not as formidable as the barricade where the first bomb had detonated. Salvaged wood was brought into the depot through a gate on the shore side. A gate on the harbour side was used when the firewood was collected. In theory, the two gates should never be open at the same time. They'd had many arguments over whether that was enough protection against the undead. Arguments that were now moot. Zombie! The warning was yelled out of the darkness. They've heard the explosion, Whitley said. Come on, we're doing nothing useful here. Whitley said no more, but led his marines towards the undead. Cholto took a step after them. Given a choice, he'd rather face a foe he understood how to kill. He didn't have a choice. Yes, the undead would be summoned by the sound of the explosion, but they'd had patrols out in the cities searching for the creatures. The undead would come. They always did. But not in such great numbers that his rifle would be needed. Not yet. He crossed to the wide hole 
in the side of the depot. From inside came a metallic creak, and then a crash, as a giant awning collapsed. A dozen of those flimsy corrugated roofs, standing on two-story high girders, dotted the site. They offered some shelter to the wood stored beneath. Enough shelter from the recent snow and rain that the timber was dry enough to easily burn. This was the real target, Siobhan said. Sholto hadn't seen her. She stood with her machete in hand just inside the gate. Is there anything we can do? I'm police, not fire, she said, but I would say no. I've sent for hooks and chains, for axes and shovels and for the pumps, but they're on the ships. We won't get them in time. There's too much wood, and we stored it. We didn't store it. It was just dumped where people carried it in. They were exhausted after a day of labour and just wanted to get their trough of washing water, and then to their bowl of gruel. What a life we created here. What a paradise. And now it will burn. Another rickety roof collapsed. As it fell onto the flickering flames below, embers flew away to where they could start new fires, deeper in the depot. I counted the mines. Three were missing, he said. I heard you shout, she said. You think this was the target? he asked. You saw the barricade, she asked. That mine was set up on the road, on their harbour side, our side. That's hardly subterfuge. No one would notice people walking around there, nor would they notice people coming into the wood store. Hundreds of people go through here every day. The first explosion ripped a hole through that wall. The second started a fire. It was over there, in the far corner. That's where it began. I try to get close, but there's too much dumped furniture. A mine alone wouldn't do this, Sholto said. Not start a fire like this so quickly. No, they added an accelerant, Siobhan said. Maybe something commercial, maybe something industrial, who knows? If we had fire engines or a helicopter with a scoop, or— Oh, she sighed. We don't stand a chance of putting this out. You understand what I'm saying? I do. Another rumbling crash was followed by a plume of flame as a third awning collapsed onto the metal wall, bringing down a twenty-foot wide section. I'd like to examine that bomb that went off by the checkpoint, Siobhan said. I bet it was on a timer, and I bet that timer malfunctioned. I bet that they intended the first explosion to start the fire, the other two to detonate a few minutes later, when people came to tackle the blaze. Perhaps I'm wrong. Maybe I'm just seeing the worst, but it doesn't get much worse than this. It's time this was over, Sholto said, but I'll need your help. What with? He told her, barely finishing before they heard footsteps on the road. It was Whitley and the Marines, but there were more that had set off with him a few moments before. It's the smoke, the lieutenant said. You can't breathe, you can barely see. I've had to bring everyone back from the checkpoint. The barricade is still secure, but we can't leave people out there. And if the wind changes direction, Siobhan said, the smoke will be blowing towards us. Not if, Shalto said. When? There were more running footsteps, this time coming from inside the harbour. It was a large group. The Admiral was in the lead, but Leo Fennec was gamely trying to stay abreast of her a fire-axe in his thin arms. Colin was just behind, and another hundred marines, sailors, and civilians were behind him. Sit, Rep? the Admiral demanded. Three explosions, Whitley said. One at the checkpoint. We saw, the Admiral said. The other two? Here. One ripped that hole through the wall, the other. He was interrupted by a crashing crescendo and fountain of sparks from inside the depot. The other started the fire. The Admiral looked at Whitley, Siobhan, then at the fire, then at Sholto. Her shoulders slumped an inch. Why are we all standing here? Fennec asked. We have to act. We have to put it out. The pumps are on their way, the Admiral said. I don't think the hoses will reach, Whitley said. No. No, they won't, the Admiral said. We have to try, Fennec said. I pulled back the people from the checkpoint, Whitley said. I don't understand, Fennec said. 
It's the smoke, Siobhan said. It's always the smoke that kills you. The fumes are toxic and will only grow more dense, more deadly, as the fire consumes laminate and plastic, paint and varnish. Fine. Then we pull back into the harbour, Fenwick said. It'll be uncomfortable, but only for a few days. At present the wind is dragging the smoke towards the city. What if the wind changes direction? The Admiral asked. It's over, Sholto said. Belfast is finished. Without our wood store we won't be able to cook breakfast. We won't be able to boil up drinking water. We can get more, but that wood came from the closest buildings to the harbour. We'll have to go further afield. Time travelling is time not scavenging. We all know that. We'll spend more time expending more bullets to gather less wood. And all for what? For what? To live, Fenwick said, turning to face the crowd. To survive one more day, and then the day afterwards. That is our life. And yes, it's not the life we hoped for. But as long as we are alive, we can't give up. We have no way of extinguishing the fire, the Admiral said. Maybe it'll rain, Fenwick said. Not soon enough, the Admiral said. Not heavily enough. Then what's the alternative? Fenwick demanded. We leave, Shalto said. Between the John Cabot, the Amundsen, and the two green ships, there's enough room for us all. Not to get to America, Fenwick said. No, but we can reach Dundalk, Shalto said. It'll be worse than the crossing from Anglesey, but we'll survive. There's grain in Dundalk, a river for fresh water, and there's coal. We know there aren't many undead left in the town. It will do as a safe harbour for a few days. And what if the saboteurs strike again? Fenwick said. What if they sink another ship? They're dead, Siobhan said. It was Willis and his people, and they're all dead. All the explosives are accounted for. That particular nightmare is over. We need to leave here before the next one begins. Admiral? Sholto asked. At least two days until the fire dies? Two days breathing toxic fumes? Two days trekking into Belfast in search of wood? Also, we can put off the day we must leave. No. It is time to leave. We'll pull back, blow the ships, and prepare for departure. It might be tonight, it might be tomorrow. Perhaps it will rain, and we will have a little more time for our preparations. Perhaps the wind will change, and we'll have to leave within the hour. Time will tell, but the decision is made. The other side of that wood store, there's that warehouse with the tires, Colum said. If the fire spreads to them, we'll have some really toxic fumes in our hands. Give me fifty people, and we'll move them out the way. That'll buy us another hour or two. Mr. Shalto, can you help Colin take care of that? The Admiral asked. Sorry, no, Shalto said. Why not? Shalto looked around the group, then at the shadowy figures behind. There were at least a hundred and fifty people now within earshot. His words would spread, and quickly, so he chose them with care. It's a long story, he said. It comes down to this. Locke left a server here in Belfast. It's password protected, embedded in concrete and impossible to move. She couldn't remember the code. But on the server, among other things, are the locations of Kempton's safe houses throughout the world. I didn't say anything because we know the safe houses aren't here in Belfast, and Locke said none of them were as large as Birmingham. I've had a portable power pack running a laptop that's using a brute force algorithm to find the code. As of yesterday, I was still unable to unlock it. If we're leaving, I'd like to destroy it in case any more of Kempton's people like Carter or Rachel come looking for it. Fine, whatever, the Admiral said. Callum, take care of the tires. John, we need a new line of defense. I'll organize the loading of the ships. Cholto slipped away into the night. There were obvious holes in his lie, but he hoped the saboteur wouldn't spot them. No, he hoped that they would follow him, because that way there wouldn't be time for them to bring some new ruin upon humanity. If he guessed right as to their motives, they would follow. And if he was wrong, then the night's terror was only just beginning. 
Chapter 19 The Saboteurs Belfast Chalto jogged through the growing plume of smoke, trying not to inhale the increasingly heavy fumes. He paused by the now abandoned checkpoint, but it was truly deserted. The ladder had been moved and laid against the gardener's shed the sentries had used to shelter from the rain, sleet, and snow. He set the ladder in place, climbed over, and saw the corpses. He'd only heard the guards call out twice, but there were well over thirty undead gathered by the barricade, all recently killed. Just to the edge of that ring of recently dead was a steel trolley, the bodies of the eight zombies killed during the day piled on top. That gave him pause. Had the saboteurs summoned the undead to the harbour? No. How could they? Willis might not have minded going into the city, but the people responsible did. Assuming his guess as to their identity was right, of course. If he was wrong, then he would die tonight, and so many others would die soon after. He picked his way through the corpses and to the edge of the pool of light cast by the lamps rigged to the checkpoint. Unlike those at the checkpoint deeper inside their perimeter, these have been taken from two PSNI Land Rovers, powered by car batteries that were charged from the John Cabot's engines. Beyond, though, was the dark city. Cholto slotted his torch onto the end of his rifle, hoping that was enough light for his pursuer to follow. As he prowled into the dark night, he shone rifle and torch left and right, deliberately reflecting the light off broken wing mirrors and cracked windows. Thirty paces from the barricade, he heard the creak of the metal ladder. He smiled. The first part of his trap had worked. Success had brought overconfidence to the saboteur, and now they were on Sholto's heels. This was more his game. This was more his speed. This was something he truly understood, acting alone, double-dealing, triple-crossing, all for the sake of humanity. That had been his life over the last few years, and it was his life once again, though the stakes were oh so much higher. He moved slowly but purposefully, until the light caught the lifeless eye of a walking corpse. The pale orb appeared milky white, while the empty eye socket glinted where the desiccated skin had peeled back from the bone. As the creature lurched forward, Sholto fired, barely waiting to see gore spray from the back of its skull, before shining the light left and right, up and down, off windows and twisted metal. He didn't check behind, and hoped that wasn't too much of a giveaway. On balance, he hoped that no zombie would attack his pursuer, it would be a poetic fate for the saboteur, but Sholto didn't want that. Not yet. Not until he had some answers. He headed onward and into the city. Smoke tinged the air, a growing irritant. But in the pitch black it was impossible to tell how dense the cloud was, nor how quickly it was growing. Weeks of rain had rinsed the streets, turning leaves into mud. The melting snow had washed the decaying litter into the already blocked storm drains, where shallow swamps had now formed. He heard a soft splash behind him, then another, and a third. The footsteps were too rhythmic to be the shambling gait of the living dead. Hoping that assumption was correct, and only a human pursuer was behind him, he trekked on. Ahead, a downpipe had come loose from its bracket. As the wind surged, the pipe banged against the wall. Reflexively, he shone his light to the left, and so almost missed the zombies staggering towards him from the right. He heard the dragging splash of feet in water, and swung rifle and light around to illuminate a one-armed zombie fifteen feet away. As the light fell on the creature, it lurched forward, slipped on the mud and slime concealed beneath a six-inch deep stagnant pool, and fell to its knees. Cholto slipped the safety onto the rifle, and made a pantomime of raising the weapon and being unable to fire. As the zombie thrashed its way to its feet, he detached the torch from the barrel, 
slung the rifle, and drew his crowbar. As the zombie stood, he slammed the metal into its skull. Everything was now set. The trap was ready to be sprung. He played the light on the sign, the houses, the road. He was twenty meters from a junction. The street sign was too covered in mud to be legible, but on the corner was a pub, and he recognized its sign well enough. He'd gone inside on a brief looting expedition a few days before. They'd only needed five minutes to confirm the pub had nothing left to take. And if he remembered correctly, yes, the windows were boarded up. That wouldn't do. The pub marked the beginning of a short parade, with a general store next to it, the door of which hung wide open. Next to that was a café. The waste-to-ceiling window was cracked but still intact, and the door was held closed with a clasp and screwdriver. On the ground, almost buried in an inch of leaves, was a cut-through padlock. This had been one of the properties that Jasmine Cotter had searched and then sealed. It was perfect. He pulled the screwdriver free and went inside. He quickly shone the light under the tables before moving to the kitchen. The café was empty. He took the rifle off his shoulder, slid the safety off, and laid it down, balancing it so the grip and trigger were over the edge of the counter. He pulled out the smartphone he'd taken back from Siobhan, turned the voice recorder on, and placed it face down next to the till, but with the microphone pointing toward the door. Finally, he propped the torch so that the light bounced off the mirrored glass to one side of the serving board. He gave the faded writing a brief glance, and then a slightly longer inspection. Half the items were served with beans, and all were served with chips. The memory that came back to him was one he'd almost forgotten. Forty years before, but four hundred miles to the east and south, he'd gone with his father to such a place. It was one of his dad's brief returns home. The trip had been unexpected and unusual. Looking back on it, his mother must have instigated it, sending father and son to spend some time together. Certainly there didn't seem to be any destination in mind. They'd walked into town, sat in awkward silence on a park bench for twenty minutes longer than was comfortable, then gone to a café. Again, they'd sat in silence, and it was then that he'd realized that they always would. That quiet companionship was as much as his father could offer to his son, as if reading his mind on their way back, his father had said, I do love you, son. Sholto sighed. Now wasn't the time for such memories. He turned around, set his back to the door, and waited. This was the dangerous part, the moment when, if he'd misjudged his foe, he could expect a bullet. He'd never misjudged them so far. Even so, his hands itched. But he kept them half-raised, pretending he was doing something at the till. Time stretched into seconds that seemed like hours. He could feel the eyes watching him, almost hear the breath being held. He didn't turn around, not until he heard the door open. He knew he needed to act surprised, but there was no need to pretend because he was genuinely shocked when he saw who entered. Nicola Kennedy? He said, I'll admit I didn't think it'd be you. I came to see if you needed help, Kennedy said. She held a semi-automatic pistol in her hands, though with the barrel pointing at the floor. No, I know why you're here, Sholto said. I'm just surprised that it's you. Not your brother. I suppose you want him to play the hero, valiantly struggling to put out the fire in an attempt to save humanity, right? She swung the gun up to point at his head. You know, she said. How did you know? He smiled. The trap had been sprung. It had caught its prey, and now humanity had been saved. That left the small matter of his getting out of the café alive. You went overboard on the evidence, he said, and over the top of the sabotage, not to mention the murders. There were too many clues. 
Is that a trick you picked up as a solicitor? Something a client once did? In your defense, the list of suspects was hardly extensive. So, do you want to tell me why you and your brother did all this? Isn't a confession a little clichéd? She said. Where's the server? In the back, Sholto said. You were a solicitor before the outbreak, weren't you? Did you do any criminal work? Was it all civil? You understood some procedures, but you also understood the limit of your knowledge. You stole the explosives because evidence was being kept in the armory. Rather, I suspect it was your idea those records should be kept there. Trouble was, you didn't know what C-4 looked like. Is that why you took the claymores? Or did you take them because you wanted to make sure people knew exactly how many bombs they were looking for? Does it matter? A provincial solicitor wouldn't see many cases involving explosives, Sholto continued, as if oblivious to her question. Whether you knew what C-4 was, you didn't know how to wire a bomb. Nor did you know how to sabotage a plane or a ship. That was Willis, wasn't it? And that was why he had to die. You killed him. But you drugged him and his people first. It was safer that way, wasn't it? You wouldn't dare get into a stand-up fight with them. Nor could you dare let them live. They knew too much. And you knew you couldn't control them. Not now everything's changed. We're all going to America, right? We're all sailing off into the unknown, and you realized your brother could become leader in a far more conventional way. Yes, Willis was the muscle, and you were the brains, because it certainly wasn't your brother. Do you have anything else you want to say? She asked. Just a couple of questions, Sholto said. Do you want to guess what they are? Oh, some variation on why, I suspect, Kennedy said. Not really, he said. I'm curious, sure. It's always interesting to know whether the justification a criminal tells themselves is the same one they tell the world. The reason, the motivation, is power. It's always power, people like you, crimes like these. It's not that you want to lead, but you can't stand the idea of other people telling you what to do. You expected the grain ship to sink, not run aground in Dundalk. You were trying to reduce the population, but you weren't trying to preserve the food. There's only one conclusion to be drawn. You wanted to take the Amundsen and the New World across the Atlantic. Without those ships, we wouldn't be able to follow you. But taken with everything else you've done, I can guess your route. You would have gone to Svalbard and destroyed the fuel reserve, making sure that even if we repaired the Harpers Ferry or found another ship, we'd never be able to pursue you, yes? As to your final destination, I don't even need to guess. Your brother told me. He did? Kennedy said, curiosity overwhelming feigned indifference. Earlier today, Sholto said, he mentioned a rumor about my brother and the list he'd found in Elysium. You come in here, thinking there is a server that confirms it. There's no list? She asked, and sounded genuinely confused. Your brother wrote that he found one. He put it into that account. Rachel said there was a list. A list of addresses of inner city redoubts, and the codes to enter them. That's why she told Rob to volunteer to— She stopped. There's no list. There never was, Sholto said. Well, no, there was a list of addresses of places like Palace Kenry. Places with a few guns and enough food to keep a few dozen people alive for a night. There are places located halfway between one of Kempton's corporate offices and the coast, or an airport. Kempton made more detailed preparations than that, Kennedy said. Rachel was certain. She knew. Kempton had a protocol in place— she planned for the end of the world, in Virginia, twenty miles north of Roanoke, at a— Why are you laughing? I'm sorry, Sholto said. That's what Rachel told you? That's where? Perhaps she believed it, or maybe she just didn't know. Know what? Kennedy snapped, the gun trembling in her hand. It's a corporate retreat. 
Sholto said, concealed amid mountainous woodland. Sure, on a map it's a likely spot to survive a nuclear war. Even up close, it almost convinced me. I went there two years ago, certain that she was using the place to conceal something. She wasn't, unless you count middle-aged board members playing paintball. You're lying, Kennedy said. There were codes for a vault door. Rachel knew it had been designed, knew it had been ordered, knew it had been shipped to Roanoke. It has an internal power supply that will last for a century, shielded against a nuclear blast. There's nothing there, Sholto said. Let me rephrase that. Kempton built safe houses like at Palace Kenry. She built redoubts like Elysium and storehouses like Birmingham. Hey, maybe she concealed some supplies beneath those luxury chalets in Virginia. But it won't be more than enough to keep people alive for a few months. I went to Roanoke. I saw it for myself. If you ask me, I think that was the whole point of that place. It was designed to keep me and people like me off the scent of what she was a part of. Think about it. She planned for a nuclear war that was being used as a screen to orchestrate a global coup. They didn't expect the undead. Kempton expected, best case scenario, to get onto the new world and weather the worst of the fallout at sea. The gun lowered a fraction, but then it steadied. Kennedy smiled. You are lying. I almost believed you. If there was nothing there, then why were the codes to that vault hidden in Elysium? Your brother found them. He even wrote as much. You can't lie about that. Yes. In Elysium, Rob found a list of codes, and Bill took them off his corpse. They weren't the codes to some mythical treasure. They were the protocols and passwords to access Kempton's satellites. The same satellites we've been using since before the mission to Elysium was launched. Those codes have been useless since just after the outbreak. I changed the passwords back before I left the U.S. Oh, and I don't know what instructions Rachel gave Rob. I don't know what Rachel told you, but Kempton didn't hide those codes. They were left in plain sight in case all her people died, in case all her plans failed. It says a lot about her, doesn't it? That the only time she'd care about the species is if she's certain she'd be dead. But, but the journal, that's not what your brother wrote. And you know why? He got into a lot of trouble with that journal back in England, and he got into trouble again on Anglesey when Annette distributed copies. He learned from his mistake, though not as quickly as he should have. He thought Rob might be working for or with someone. He suspected Marcus, and so did I. We laid a trap. All we did was omit the precise nature of what he'd found. In doing so, we implied a mystery that would entertain and intrigue the populace at large, but which would gnaw away at someone who thought they were in the know. Then we invited anyone who wanted into our home to look at the images from the satellites, we set up those screens in the downstairs of the terrace, but we set up cameras as well. We watched and we waited, expecting to catch Marcus raiding Bill's office. But he didn't. Nor did anyone else, not until today, when you stole my bag. I want my photos back, by the way. But if you wanted Bill's original journals, you'd have had to go to Dundalk. Annette's got them. Is that ironic? that you almost sunk the ship which was carrying the treasure you sought? We didn't know about Birmingham back then, of course. We didn't know that Locke was alive. We didn't know that you'd already sabotaged the power plant. You had, hadn't you? Kennedy said nothing. I'll take that as a yes, Sholto said. You couldn't leave Anglesey as a thriving community with abundant electricity. Even if you'd destroyed Svalbard, you couldn't risk us finding more fuel. You couldn't risk that we'd repair more ships. You couldn't risk us coming after you. Because, above all, you were terrified of being caught. That's why you've been getting rid of the loose ends. Willis? Marcus? Before them was Rachel. There was Paul, too. How many others have there been? No, Kennedy said. You're lying. 
Rachel saw the purchase orders. She knew what Kempton bought. He was watching her eyes, her shoulders, her hands, and he knew he was running out of time, and so far, while she'd said more than enough, she hadn't said the one thing he was waiting to hear. Did Rachel really know? He asked. Or did she just tell you what you needed to hear, so that she would remain as the person with the most power in the relationship, the person with the most valuable information, the person you couldn't kill? until she was exposed and so you or Willis had no choice. Kennedy took a deep breath. Her hand began to shake. No, she said, there is a warehouse, and we will reach it. The zombies are dying. Within a few weeks they'll all be dead. One year, that is their lifespan. Time had run out. Another myth, he said. Tell me, when did you first begin to sabotage the nuclear power plant? Chief Watts was initially under the impression he could keep it running for years, yet things kept breaking. Whose idea was that? What about all that grain we lost to mold? Was that you? All to guarantee we'd leave Anglesey where we had electricity, food, shelter, safety, and the chance to build a new and better society. Whose idea was it? Yours? Rachel's? Whose? I don't believe you. Kennedy said. You say that the journals are in Dundalk. Then that is where I shall go. First, though. He didn't hear the shot. But he heard the plate glass window shatter. Blood sprayed from Kennedy's head. A corpse fell to the floor. The door opened. Siobhan stepped in. Sholto grabbed the rifle, flicked off the safety, and fired a shot into the wall before, just as swiftly, grabbing the phone and turning the voice recorder off. What was that for? Siobhan asked, baffled. So there were two shots on the recording, Sholto said. She fired first. I wish you hadn't, Siobhan said. The truth must be told, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Otherwise, why bother having laws and rules? No police officer should be in execution, but she was our judge, she sighed. And she was about to shoot you. I had a few more minutes, Sholto said. I have done this before. So have I, Siobhan said, and more often than you, I think. You had seconds, if that. Fair enough. Thank you. Here. He handed her the smartphone. Did you hear much? Some, not all. I arrived a little late. It was hard following her in the dark. Your light told me where you were, but I had to track her by sound while not making any of my own, and while keeping one ear out for the undead. Did she name anyone? No. I think only her brothers left. Willis, Marcus, they were loose ends. And was it like you thought? They wanted to steal the New World and the Amundsen, and take them across the Atlantic to a storehouse bigger than the vault in Birmingham— that's what Rachel told us she'd find there. As it became likely we'd all cross the Atlantic together, she decided to kill anyone who could identify her. We can get the rest of the answers from her brother. You can't be certain it was just the two of them, Siobhan asked. Not absolutely, Sholto said, but I won't lose any sleep worrying there are others. Fine. We'd get the rest of the details from Fennec. We should go. There are zombies out there. One almost got her as she was following you. Would have done if I'd not shot it. She looked down at her gun, then at Sholto's rifle, then at the pistol on the floor. I really wish you hadn't fired that shot. Two suppressed shots. Her pistol doesn't have a silencer. Who'll ever know, Sholto said, bending to pick it up. He quickly searched her pockets for ammunition. Thaddeus, is there a warehouse in America? I honestly don't know. Rachel told Kennedy it existed. Locke implied there was. Perhaps there is. But if it's not near the coast, how would we ever reach it? Before we left Anglesey, I considered taking the plane, taking Locke and going to take a look. I was doing so more out of hope than faith it would be our salvation. I wanted to give everyone something to rally behind. A grand mission, 
an expedition with a far-off goal, something to distract from the nightmare that was life in Belfast. I feared that Kempton and her people would still be there. It's more likely that it's just like Elysium or Birmingham, a bunker with enough supplies to keep a few people alive for a few months, and like Elysium, those supplies have been consumed. Even if they haven't, we don't need them anymore. What we need is land we can farm in peace. Once we plant our first crop, we'll be tied to that land, united forever, and that's the only chance for our species. Then, Mr. Sholto, let us get back, deal with Fennec, and then deal with the far more pressing issue of the fact that the harbor is on fire. A splash came from outside, as undead feet staggered through the overflowing gutter. And there's still the undead. Chapter 20 One Minute to Midnight, Belfast Harbor The trek back to the harbor was far more fraught than the journey into the city had been. The glowing orange haze above the inferno was a more useful marker than the street signs, but the city was filling with sound as much as it was with smoke. The distant roar of burning wood intermingled with a crack of tortured metal and charring rubber as the fire spread. Much closer, Sholto heard feet splash through the flooded gutter behind him. He spun around, sweeping rifle and torch left and right, seeking their unnatural pursuer. A lanky creature in a tattered skirt staggered into the light, swiping its hand across the torch's beam. He fired a three-shot burst. The zombie slumped onto a foot-deep drift of mud. Where left? Siobhan called. With his back to her, he didn't know if she meant his left or hers. He spun around as she fired, and the zombie splashed into the overflowed gutter. Was that zombie wearing blue and grey? Sholto asked. No time to find out, Siobhan said. Can you hear it? More zombies? No, he said, again sweeping his torch in a quick arc as he scanned their surroundings. No, the fire. It's getting louder. The reflected glow is getting bigger. The flames are spreading. We need to hurry, or we'll be cut off from the harbor. The checkpoints were still deserted, at least of the living. Three undead clawed and pushed at the barrier. Cholto shone his light quickly from one to the next. The first wore a green waxed jacket. The second wasn't just nearly naked, it was nearly skinless. The third wore what was either a woolen dress or possibly a massively stretched jumper. None wore the blue and grey. He fired a three-shot burst, then another, and the hammer hit an empty chamber as he fired the last bullet in the magazine. He ejected it, inserting a fresh. Smoke's getting thicker, Siobhan said, as she ran to the barrier. It hung in front of the still-illuminated checkpoint lights, a darkening shroud that cut visibility. But he didn't need the growing pall to tell the fire was growing. He could hear the roar of the flames now. He didn't hear the zombie on the road behind him. As he was climbing over the barricade, Siobhan swung her rifle to point over his head. He didn't turn to look. Too far away. But hurry, she said. When he was inside the barricade, he looked back along the road. There were four zombies now, lurching slowly towards the checkpoint. He gave an up-jutting length of rebar a shove. It didn't move. The cement, tires, razor wire, wood and rubble would hold the undead. For now, it would have to be for long enough. Feel that, Siobhan said, the heat. I think so, he said. He wasn't sure if he could or if he was imagining it, but the harbour didn't have long. If the next few hours went wrong, then neither had humanity. New defences had been thrown up deeper within the harbour, between the partially dismantled fences separating the warehouses Tables and chairs, furniture and junk had been haphazardly piled. It wouldn't hold back the undead, but it would slow them. It slowed Siobhan and Sholto as they forced their way through. The rear guard slowed them too. Half were in the blue and grey, 
and only half of those carried rifles. The rest were as often armed with tools as machetes. A barrage of questions was thrown at them, but none were about the fictitious server. The defenders only wanted to know about the fire and the undead. On that score, neither Siobhan nor Sholto had good news to give. The harbour was a chaotic frenzy. As many people were running into the warehouses as were leaving them, often with more than they could carry, and just as often carrying it loose in their arms. It was only when they reached the infirmary that they found some semblance of order. Two lines had formed, either side of the access road. The line on the far side of the road was made of individuals and groups clutching whatever they'd managed to salvage, and that was little enough. The other line sneaked back inside the infirmary itself, with medics and volunteers helping the injured, sick and recently poisoned. More held plastic crates containing the hastily packed medicines and equipment, and they were holding them, not carrying them, because neither line moved except when someone tossed an unwanted item onto the road as being too heavy to carry, and some less encumbered person darted out of the line to pick it up. Most people, though, were watching the tableau in the middle of the road, where an angry Leo Fenix stood inches from an exasperated admiral. Column, looking bemused, stood to one side. It's a democracy, Fenix yelled. Yes, yes. The Admiral said, I heard you the first dozen times, but now's not the time for debate. We can't leave the food, Fenwick said, we'll starve without it. There's food in Dundalk, we'll catch fish, the Admiral said. We'll find a way, but if we stay here, we'll die. Sholto slowly eased his way through the crowd, barely able to keep the smile from his face. Fenwick was trying to exert himself, to show he was in charge but the man had picked the wrong end of the wrong fight, and this one was already over. Fenwick just didn't know it yet. We'll die of starvation at sea, Fenwick said. I don't know, Sholto said, loud enough for his voice to echo. Despite everything you and your sister did, despite the bombs you planted, the people you killed, we're still alive today. Sholto enjoyed watching the man's face freeze. He saw the look of confusion spread from his eyes to his forehead, then freeze, then saw the man's face drop. Fenwick spun around, looking for an escape, while also trying to reach into his buttoned coat. Stop him, Siobhan called. Toussaint and Petrelli moved from the infirmary door, but Colum moved faster. He leaped, tackling Fenwick as the man still vacillated between fight and flight. Fenwick landed hard the boxer on top. Colum pushed him down as he pushed himself to his knees, one either side of the prone conspirator, then spun him around, pinning his arms. Does someone want to tell me what's going on? the boxer asked. Him and his sister were behind the bombings, Shalto said, pitching his voice to carry far into the crowd. And they were behind everything else, starting with sabotaging the nuclear power plant, finishing with all that happened tonight. They had Willis and a few others working for them, until they murdered them. Kennedy's dead. Tried to kill me. But we got a confession from her. A recording. It's over, you mean? The Admiral said, her own voice just as loud. We can expect no more danger? Yes, it's over, Siobhan said, her voice the loudest of all. There's no more danger here except for the fire and the undead. Then a longer explanation can wait until we're aboard, the Admiral said. Specialist, take the man into custody. Everyone else, keep moving. Out of the ships. Move! Sholto looked up. There were no stars in the sky, but he didn't think it was cloud obscuring them. He sniffed. In the moment, he'd forgotten the fire. But that smell permeated the harbour, replacing that of the sea, of dirt, of decay, of thousands of people crammed in too small a space with little water and less soap. When he looked down, Toussaint and Petrelli were already hauling Fenwick to the storage building behind the infirmary. Come on, Colum said, brushing dirt off his clothes. Move on, everyone. Onto the ships. 
Sooner we're aboard, sooner we'll get to Dundalk. We'll have coal fires and grain, and like the Admiral says, there'll be time for an explanation when we're all aboard. The line shuffled forward as Colum cajoled them onward, but even so, people moved slowly. Sholto nodded to the Admiral, and they moved to the side of the building, out of earshot, but not out of sight of the two columns. It was Fennec? the Admiral asked. More his sister, I think, Sholto said. The actual sabotage was done by Willis. I see. Why? Power, Sholto said. Not just to be the people in power, but so that no one would have power over them. But there's no one else? No more bombs? I'll have a word with Fennec to make sure, but I don't think so. Then nothing has changed, the Admiral said. We still need to leave. Yeah. There's no server? She asked. No. And no prospect of any salvation from anywhere or anything except that which we can find for ourselves. Keep the rhetoric for later. But you'll need to make it better than that. People will want an explanation, and they'll want justice. First, we've— But she was interrupted by Gloria Rycroft, sprinting out of the smoky darkness. Zombies! Gloria said. Zombies! Hundreds of them! Chapter 21 The Final Defense Belfast Harbor Within seconds the Admiral began issuing orders. She drafted some civilians to replace those helping the injured, while enlisting just as many to defend the harbor. The first eight were given to Gloria and told to follow her back to the breach. Siobhan and Sholto accompanied them, running through the potholed alleys covered in mud, littered with discarded clothing, filling with smoke. Far too quickly, they came to a halt. Reg Caffney and two others stood seaward of a thin line of furniture that was more a trip hazard than a barricade. Made of wheelie bins, a pair of tables, and a smattering of plastic chairs, a zombie lay sprawled atop it, its skull cleaved in two. Beyond, shot, were the corpses of three more of the undead. I thought you said there were hundreds, Sholto said. That was closer to the harbour entrance, Gloria said. What happened, Reg? There were too many of them, Caffney said. Far, far too many. We had to pull back. Get tables, chairs, anything you can from that warehouse, Siobhan said, as Sholto shone his light into the gloom. Either side were chain-link fences, and beyond those were depots in which some survivors had lived until a few short hours before. The pocked tarmac car parks were covered in circles of plastic picnic chairs, clusters of wooden trestle tables, and giant oil drums with plastic sheet funnels for collecting rainwater. Goalposts had been painted on one depot's loading bay doors, with the less functional outline of a basketball hoop painted above. That joke, the furniture, and the multicolored bunting hanging between the depot and the neighboring warehouse were the first homely attempts in turning the harbor into a home. All now wasted effort. Come on, Gloria said. Quick now, our lives depend on it. Isn't that the truth? Sholto muttered, as everyone else ran to gather what they could, leaving him and Siobhan alone on the firing line. The smoke's getting thicker, Siobhan said, tracking torch and rifle left and right, right and left, in a short arc that covered the road. Can't see more than twenty meters. How long do you think we have? he asked. Before the fire reaches us? Or before the movement there? A light settled on the zombie as it staggered out of the haze. They both fired, and the creature collapsed. Next time call out our shots, yes? Sholto said. How much ammo do you have left? Siobhan asked. This is my last magazine, he said. You? About forty rounds, I think. That zombie's smoldering, do you see? Sholto swung his light down from the gloom onto the corpse they just shot, then turned the light back onto the dark shadows further along the road. Steaming, maybe, he said. There's no chance of rain, is there? I doubt it, she said. Not enough, not in time. You ask how long we had, 
Ours, and not many of them. Where do you want these? Gloria asked, hauling one end of a picnic table with a marine corporal carrying the other end. Zombie, mine, Siobhan said, firing before Sholto could answer, and before he saw the ghoulish shadow coalesce into a lurching, clawing figure. Dump the furniture in a line here, Sholto said. We just need to slow them down. Buy ourselves enough time to get everyone aboard the ship. Right. Good. You heard him, Gloria said, dropping the table in the middle of the road. Come on. She ran back into the warehouse. Mine, Sholto said, seeing the zombie first, though no one could have missed this creature. Flames licked across its legs and chest, licking upwards around its neck like a collar. It fired. The zombie fell, but the flames kept burning. Ours. I hope we have ours, he said. You see the smoke? It's shifting. Blowing north now, not west. The wind's changing. Zombie! Mine! This creature wasn't ablaze. Nor was it alone. Another four zombies staggered along the road behind it, and one wore blue and grey. A dark, damp stain spread across the front of her chest from a wound in her neck. It was the quartermaster, he fired, watched the undead woman fall, and then shifted aim. Calling out his targets, the Siobhan did the same until the road was empty. This is the last stick of furniture from outside, Gloria said, dropping a plastic chair as Reg dumped a rusting barbecue next to it. It's not much, is it? she added. It's a wall, more than a barricade, and hardly even a barrier. Shall we go inside and get something more substantial? We could, but there are no lights inside. We'd have to use torches, and we've only got three between us. Leave it, Shalto said, the fire spreading fast. That will stop the zombies, and this will slow down any that make it through. You sure? Okay, good, Gloria said. She breathed out and seemed to relax. What a day, what a day! She rubbed her hands down the sides of her mud, gore, and smoke-blackened clothes, unslung her rifle, and aimed the light into the darkness. Fennec was really behind the sabotage? Reg asked. That's what they've been saying. Fennec and his sister, Sholto said. You mean Judge Kennedy? Gloria said. Seriously? Why? Power, Sholto said. They wanted to rule, and thought they could do a better job than anyone else. Yes and no. Siobhan said, it's more complicated than that. They got in too deep. Too deep with what? Gloria asked. With their co-conspirators, Siobhan said. Back on Anglesey, they must have recruited Rachel and Willis. Rachel knew about Kempton and some of her plans. To stay in control, to maintain their authority, Kennedy and Fennec had to up the ante, turn conspiracy into murder. I think Rachel went rogue and Bishop lost all grip on reality, and Fennec and Kennedy kept killing in an attempt to regain control. Knowing Willis and Rachel were watching them, they kept digging their hole, hoping if it got deep enough, it wouldn't become their grave. We got a confession from Kennedy, Chalto said, a recording. And we'll get some more answers out of Fennec, Siobhan said. Nothing he can say will help us now. No explanation will give us comfort. Understanding won't put out that fire. Belfast could have worked, Gloria said. It should have worked. There's no server there, no secret warehouse. Once again, Sholto found himself choosing his words with care, knowing what he said would spread around the community. No. There are places like Claverton Industrial Supplies Depot and the Shannon Estuary. We'll find the precursors for fertilizer and the like, but... Nothing we can eat, nothing we can plant. There are a few other places like Birmingham and Elysium. Well, there were, but that amounts to a few days of supplies when spread around our community. No, there's nothing that can help us immediately, nor anything that could have forestalled this disaster. A zombie lurched out of the smoke. Mine, Gloria said, firing before Sholto got a proper look at the creature. It wasn't wearing blue and grey, but that was all he could tell. It was all he needed to know. 
A wisp of smoke rose from its corpse, joining the pall that hung heavy over the harbor. We need radios, Shalto said. Radios and spotlights. A balloon, even. Like Quigley had in Northumberland, Gloria asked. Now that'd be a good idea. The next time, we should turn each warehouse into its own fortress. A loud retort echoed from somewhere to the south. Shotgun, I think, Siobhan said. Is that the signal to fall back? Gloria asked. Or are they just out of rifle ammo? Good question, Sholto said. Who's got ammo? Does anyone have any spare? I've got two magazines, Gloria said. Give one to Siobhan, Sholto said. Reg, Corporal, go back to the harbor, find the Admiral, and find out what the signal to retreat will be. We'll hold this position until we hear it. Then find Toussaint. He had the remaining claymores. Bring those or some C4. If ever there was a time so desperate it's worth trying to blow the undead up, this is it. Go! A trio of zombies staggered out of the darkness. Siobhan fired. So did Gloria, but both missed. It took another four bullets to down all three creatures, and behind them came a dozen more. I'm out, Sholto said searching his pockets for another magazine. All he found was the sidearm he'd taken from Kennedy. He drew his crowbar, watching the undead approach, watching them fall, watching them shudder as misaimed bullets hit shoulders and chests. Take your time, he said. Call out the targets. On the left, tall, bent double, Gloria said. On the right, on fire, a sailor called. The descriptions were too vague. Two bullets hit the same zombie. The first, in the shoulder, caused it to shudder sideways, so that the next shot took it in the neck. Sholto took a half-step forward, picking the gap between two trestle tables as the best place to make his stand. The tables were, by far, the sturdiest part of the barrier, though that wasn't saying much. Between the trestle tables was a mound of plastic chairs. It would only take a good push to shove them aside. That shove would bring the chairs towards him, though. He lashed out with his foot, and far more easily than he'd expected, they scattered across the road. Why'd you do that? Gloria asked. Here we stand, Sholto said, and I want some room to swing. Chavorn fired. A zombie fell leaving only two other undead creatures lurching along the road. She fired again. I'm out, she said. Gloria fired. The last zombie fell. Anyone got any spare ammo? Siobhan said. Then who's got a rifle but never fired it before they arrived here? Right. Give me a weapon. Thanks. What a day, Gloria said. I... But her words were lost in the sound of an explosion. Then another both coming from the south. Fennec, Gloria said. No, Shalto said calmly. No, that's us. Someone else had the same idea as me. It's Claymores and C4, that's all. You think? Gloria said. I'm certain, Shalto said, with a confidence he didn't truly feel. So am I, Siobhan said. It's to the south, away from the ships. The noise will draw the zombies there. Is that the signal, then? Gloria asked. If it is, Reg will come back to tell us, Sholto said. We hold this line. Everyone else will be holding theirs. He hoped. Visibility improved as the wind grew, sucking smoke high up into the sky. It was sucking the flames up, too, creating a towering wall of roaring orange-black death. They didn't need their torches now, as the inferno brought a mockery of dawn turning night into day eight hours too early. A spark landed on the plastic chairs, then another. Sholto ignored them, focusing on the jumble of shadows, moving and undulating as the inferno grew upward and spread outward. A larger ember landed on the wooden table. He reached forward, brushing it away. When he looked down the road, he saw a moving line of fire heading towards them. No, not a line of fire. Zombies, he said. Zombies on fire. The creatures lurched closer, inhuman torches 
barely recognizable, walking pillars of flame. Eight. No, ten. Twelve. Then eleven as one collapsed. Another fell. Then a third. But the others came on. Hold! Cholto said, Hold! Siobhan fired. A creature tumbled, still burning into the gutter. Another collapsed, this time without a shot being fired. A memory came to him, one he never consciously tried to remember, that of a motel at the beginning of this nightmare. Here we stand, he said. We can do no more. We won't have to, Siobhan said. The fire's doing our job for us. It's killing them. Not quickly enough, Gloria said. Siobhan fired a shot from her borrowed rifle, felling a zombie that was staggering ahead of the others. It collapsed, still burning in the middle of the road. Overhead came another sound. Is that the helicopter? Gloria asked. Even Sholto looked up, but he couldn't see it. All too quickly, the high-pitched buzz receded into the night. It's gone to Dundalk, Sholto said, turning back to the road. The zombies were all down, either shot or burned even beyond the ability of the virus to reanimate. And is that the sign? Gloria asked. Not yet, Sholto said. What if everyone has fallen back? A sailor asked. What if the zombies are already behind us? What if they killed Reg? No, Sholto said. We do our job and trust everyone else will do the same. That's how we survive today, tomorrow, and long enough to see next year. A zombie staggered out of the once again growing smoke. Its legs were alight, with more flames flickering from its scalp. Siobhan fired. That's it, she said. I'm out. Two more minutes, Sholto said, eyeing the flames. Two more minutes, then we go. There were footsteps behind them, then an out-of-breath shout. It's me, it's me, Reg called. Ammo, he said, holding out a bag. Not much, all we can spare. We're not retreating, Gloria asked. The ship's horn, Reg said, still breathless. Listen for the horn, calling people back. The Admiral. Get your breath, take your time. Cholto said, but I think we've got the message. Pass the ammo out. He took a magazine for himself and watched the road. Reg took a breath, then another, and then coughed. I'm all right, he said. I'm okay. The Admiral's almost finished loading the ships. She said, to hold until you heard the horn. When will that be? A sailor asked. Not long, Reg said. I don't think it matters. Siobhan said as she lowered the rifle. Not even a zombie will make it through the blaze now. Ten minutes, and the flames will reach us. Less if the wind changes. Then go, all of you. I'll hold the line here, Sholto said. Nah, Gloria said. Not after today. No, I'm seeing this through to the end. What was it you said? Here we stand. Well, I'd rather stand here where I can see danger come than on the dockside in the dark. At least it's warm here, Reg said. First time I've been properly warm since Anglesey. That's it, Reg, Gloria said. Always look on the bright side. Nice, Sholto said. But... And then a foghorn rent the air. That's the signal, Gloria said. Sholto took one last look at the road. Then, gratefully ran with the others back to the waterfront. Chapter 22 A Liar's Confession Belfast Harbour A barrier had been thrown up on the roads by the infirmary. Like the hasty construct they'd pulled together by the warehouses, it might slow the undead, but it wouldn't stop them. Made of highly flammable wood and plastic, it wouldn't even slow the inferno. The Admiral stood ramrod rigid behind the barricade, a tense-looking bodyguard of old hands behind her, with Colum by her side. He didn't look tense, just tired. You all here? Colum asked, counting each of the rear guard off as they climbed over the barrier. Yes, good. Off you go, then. 
There's a launch waiting to take you out to the John Cabot. How many more people are you waiting on? Sholto asked, as Gloria and the others headed through. He and Siobhan hung back. You're the last, the Admiral said. Colum held out a dog-eared piece of paper. Everyone who went out has come back. I can promise you that. I can't promise everyone who was here this morning has known the ships, though. Boarding was too chaotic. As he spoke, a trace of anxiety slipped into his voice. We have everyone, the Admiral said. No one would choose to stay behind. The fire is stopping the zombies, Shalto said. They're pushing through the ruins, the barricades, and into the harbor. But they're a light burning up, dying. Yes, we heard, the Admiral said. I dispatched the helicopter to Dundalk, but from the air they reported that the fire had engulfed the harbor entrance. There's a wall of flame between us and the city. The motorway will stop the inferno, Colum said. The flooded streets will do the rest. Belfast will survive. Perhaps, the Admiral said. But we won't unless we depart now. We're cut off from the city. If the wind changes, we'll have less than twenty minutes. Even if it doesn't, we don't have much more than half an hour. There's no time to gather more food or collect more supplies. It's over. Which ship is Frenick on? Sholto asked. He isn't, the Admiral said. He's in the cage behind the infirmary. I was keeping him ashore until the last minute. I'll get him, Sholto said. Siobhan, have you got that phone? The one you were using to gather evidence. Sure, why? Can I have it? Thanks. And before anyone could ask any other questions, he jogged away to the rear of the infirmary. Luca Petrelli was on guard outside. Are you alone? Shalto asked. Theo's inside, Petrelli said. Are we leaving? We are. I just want a few minutes with the prisoner. Aye, sir. Petrelli stepped aside. Inside, Toussaint sat on the desk. Fennec was in the cage. Specialist, go wait outside, Shalto said. Toussaint looked at Shalto, then the prisoner. Do you want the keys? At that, Fennec stiffened. Yeah, I guess so, Shalto said. I'll need five minutes. Give me a shout if the fire gets too close. Aye, sir. Toussaint handed over the keys to the cage and headed for the door. Shalto waited until he was outside, then picked up the lamp from the desk. It was the only light in the room. He walked over to the prisoner. Fennec was handcuffed with a chain around his ankles, standing in the cage that still reeked of Marcus's vomit. Quite a come down from this morning, Sholto said. Why are you doing this? Fennec asked. I, I didn't do anything. There's no point lying, Sholto said. Your sister confessed before she tried to shoot me. She's dead, but we recorded that confession. I don't know what she said, but it's not true, Fennec said. Save it. We don't have time, Sholto said. The fire's spreading too fast. It'll be here in about twenty minutes, and we'll be long gone. You're not coming with us. You'd leave me to burn to death? Don't I even get a trial? Nope. There'll be no trial. What would be the point? With a confession from your sister, the jury's findings are a foregone conclusion. You're guilty. But right now, you do have a small measure of leverage. Fennec stiffened. What? There are a few questions I didn't get to ask your sister. There are a few things I'd like cleared up. I'll offer you a deal. I'll let you go. Like I said, you aren't coming with us. If you want to avoid burning to death, you'll have to swim. Even if you don't drown, the speed the fire's spreading, there's a good chance the blaze will reach the opposite shore before you do. There's an even better chance the zombies will kill you if you make it to dry land, but it is a chance. It's a chance you didn't give your victims. The alternative isn't a noose. In about four and a half minutes, Specialist Toussaint will return, and I'll leave, and I'll leave you locked in that cage. Understand? So don't waste time with protestations of innocence. No prevarication. He took out the pistol he'd taken from Kennedy, 
recognize this? he asked, ejecting the magazine. Fennec looked between the gun and Sholto and back to the gun. He didn't speak. I'll take that as a yes. Six bullets left in the magazine, one in the chamber. For each lie, I'll remove a bullet. If I remove them all, or if the specialist returns, you'll stay here in chains. Answer honestly, and I'll leave you the gun and the bullets. I'll give you the chance you never gave any of your victims, understand? First question. Which of you shot Willis? I don't know what you're talking about, Fennec said. Sholto ejected the cartridge from the chamber and put it in his pocket. He placed the gun on the table and picked up the magazine. Which of you shot Willis? The lamplight was dim and diffused, but it was bright enough to illuminate Fennec's eyes as they darted from the pistol on the desk to the magazine in Sholto's hand. She did, Fennec said, adding quickly. I don't know what she told you, but she did. Who's she? My sister. She killed Willis and his people. It was her idea. That I believe, Sholto said. Why didn't you shoot Marcus? She... She liked poison, Fennec said. She always liked poison. That's how she killed her husband. I didn't know about that, not until after the outbreak. If I had, I'd have gone to the police. I would. She killed her husband? Years ago. That wasn't her only victim. I didn't know. Not until after the outbreak. That begged a dozen more questions. But the answers would only give a more complete picture of a criminal who was now dead. Rachel? He asked, deciding to let Fennec's desperate guilt supply the specifics of the question. Nicola knew her from before the outbreak, Fennec said. Sholto pried the topmost cartridge free. I knew her. Okay, yes, I knew her, Fennec said. Inwardly, Sholto smiled. Fennec had broken far more quickly than he'd expected, but that still didn't leave him with much time. The Claymores. Why did you take those? That was Willis's idea. People know what a mine looks like. Why did he have to die? Because we're all going to America, Fennec said. He was a loose end? No. Yes, but no. He didn't need to die. Humanity has been saved, you see? That's what this was about. It was about saving the human race. On Anglesey, we were dying one by one. We stood no chance making Belfast habitable. That was obvious. Everyone was going to die, but they didn't have to. The zombies are dying, don't you see? In a few months, it'll be a year since the outbreak. They'll be dead. What are we doing except wasting our time? We have to look to the future. By killing everyone? No, not everyone. We have to think of the future of our species. I mean, that's what my sister believed. She learned it from Dr. Singh. The zombies are dying. Soon they'll be dead. Then what? Then where? The shadow of a nuclear power station in Wales is hardly the place to rebuild civilization. Sholto pried another cartridge loose. It could have been. How many others are there? There's no one. He extracted another round from the magazine. How many others? No one, I swear. She hired Willis. She tried to hire Rachel, but Rachel always had plans of her own. Always wanted to be in charge. Always. And Bishop? That had nothing to do with us, Fennec said. That was Rachel. It was all her. But you knew what she was doing. You knew what Bishop was doing. No. Sholto took another round out of the gun. You're running out of bullets. Running out of time. We didn't know the specifics. Okay, okay, we didn't care just like we didn't care what Marcus was doing. It was always about the species as a whole. It was the big picture. Right. What happened to my bag? What? Sholto pried another cartridge out of the gun. My bag? What happened to it? I... It went into the sea. I had some photos in there, Sholto said. Why did you take it? 
We wanted those codes. The codes for Kempton's bunker. The codes were for the satellites, and they were never in my bag, Cholto said. Last question. When did this begin? What do you mean? You know what I'm asking, Cholto said. Confess. Admit to what I know. Then you get the gun and the key. You mean, you mean about Dr. Singh? No. You kill him too, huh? No. I want to know when this began. You mean the power plant? That was all Willis. It was his idea. Create a crisis, then provide a solution. And that was obviously a lie. It didn't matter. Whether the idea had originated from Fennec or Kennedy, Willis or Rachel, or even Paul or Bishop, the result was the same. They had been working to destroy Anglesey for months. They had ruined humanity's best chance of survival, and then killed one another, and killed so many more along the way, all so they could be king of a dung heap, a ruler with an empire of one. What mattered... All that mattered was that Fennec was the last. Is there anything else you want to say? Sholto asked. Anything else to admit? It was always her, Fennec said. I tried to stop her. I did. Step back from the door, he said. Move. Fennec shuffled back from the cage door. Sholto unlocked it. Step forward, he said. Fennec took a step towards him, holding out his shackled hands. Cholto ignored them, reached up, and tore the bandage in the side of the man's face. You got that in the warehouse? It was a bottle, Fennec said. Looks like a cut to me, Cholto said. A straight line cut. The kind you get from a knife, not a bottle. Why did you go to the warehouse? Because of the writing, I... I... And he stumbled into silence, uncertain what lie to give. You went there to make sure Marcus was dead. No, I... I was trying to calm things down. Hold out your hands, Cholto said. Fennec extended his hands, wrists forward. No, I said hold them out, Cholto said. Palms upwards. He reached into his coat and took out the phone. The voice recorder was still on, but he switched to the photographs taken earlier that day, skipping back until he found the image of the fingerprint on the knife. He turned on the phone's light and shone it on Fennec's hands. There was a scar on the index finger of his right hand. Cholto checked the photograph of the print Siobhan had taken from the knife. The void on the print matched the scar. You went into the warehouse to kill Marcus, Shalto said. I don't think you were expecting a riot. I wonder if your sister was. Did she send you on that task? You said she knew her poisons. She knew what to put in that wine to make sure a riot would start, yes? Yes. She could have poisoned the wine with something that would simply have made every drinker soporific, and then dead. Instead, she wanted a brawl so that you would die, too. You were another loose end, Leo, weren't you? No, Fennec said. You were supposed to die, and she, the grieving sister, the judge, would have been left to rule. You went into the warehouse with instructions to make sure Marcus was dead. No. You drew your knife, but the riot was already underway. You couldn't reach Marcus so you decided to improvise. You slashed your own face, but someone came at you. You lashed out, stabbed them, killed them. Reflexively, you threw the knife into the darkest recesses of the warehouse. But you left a print behind. A fingerprint with a void that matches the scar on your index finger. No, no, Fennec said. No, that's, that's a coincidence. Sholto shrugged. He turned the phone's light off, then turned off the voice recorder. He put the phone away and threw the keys to Fennec. Go on. Undo the shackles. Cholto walked back to the desk and picked up the gun. 
You're letting me go? Fennec asked. Sholto slid the magazine back into the gun, raised it, and fired. The bullet entered between the man's eyes. Fennec collapsed, dead. No, he said. The door opened. Toussaint and Petrelli rushed in. I undid the cage, undid his cuffs so we could walk more quickly. He went for my gun. Toussaint looked between Fennec and Sholto. Aye, sir, Toussaint said. That's exactly what happened, isn't it, Private? Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess, Petrelli said. Did he tell you anything? I have a recording of his confession. He said his sister was the ringleader, and I think she was. But he was complicit in all of it. They'd been trying to destroy the power station for months, before they realized the water treatment plant was the weak link. They killed Dr. Singh back on Anglesey, and Fennec stabbed the guy during the warehouse brawl earlier today. There are a few other details, and a few other crimes to which he confessed, but they can wait. It's time to leave, and time to leave Belfast behind, leave the past too. It's time to look to the future. And that's looking pretty bleak to me, Tucson said. Part 3, Day 257, the 25th of November Endings and Beginnings The Irish Sea and Dundalk Chapter 23 One Person, One Vote The Irish Sea You have a great radio voice, Sholto said, as he tried to find a position where he could properly extend his legs. This cabin on the John Cabot was small, though none were large, but with most of the space taken up by recently installed bunk beds, there was barely enough room for Sholto, let alone Siobhan as well. I said as much as I could, but it won't be enough, Siobhan said. People will have questions, lots of them. You should write an account. That was always more Bill's territory than mine, Sholto said. He gave up trying to sit and lay down on the bunk. Even then, the bunk wasn't long enough. People have a right to know, Siobhan said. They'll demand it. If we don't publish an account, there'll have to be an inquiry. I think we both know which of those is preferable. A written account won't stop people asking questions. It won't stop rumors and doubts. Just look at what happened after Bill's journals were published back on Anglesey. It will quell the anxiety, Siobhan said. She sighed. All this for power, all because they didn't want to share what was in some mythical warehouse of Kempton's. You know, but everyone still thinks it exists. They do? I was asked about it eight times between the control room and this cabin. Granted, I must have seen at least a hundred people, but still, that was the first question that came to the minds of eight of them. Maybe the warehouse is real. Maybe it's not, Sholto said. The only person who can confirm whether it ever existed is Sorica Locke. No, I think we need to look elsewhere for our salvation now, starting with Calais and those ships. A low rumble was followed by a persistent vibration, and the entire cabin shuddered. That's the engines, Siobhan said. And we're heading for Dundalk, Sholto said. He glanced out the small porthole. The sky was brightening. Dawn was on its way. Our destination depends on who wins, Siobhan said. Since it could be anyone, our destination could be anywhere. Yep, and that's the point, Sholto said. In this election, it'll be one person, one vote. Everyone gets to write down one name and only one name. There are no candidates, no speeches, no manifestos, no debates. It's a popularity contest. Pure and simple. That's precisely why I'm worried, Javon said. You really think an election is necessary? Our new leader needs a mandate, Sholto said. Otherwise, it's only a matter of time before there's another challenge. Maybe it'll be a mutiny. Maybe a coup. Maybe people will just up and leave first chance they get. Give everyone a say. Give them a voice and make it clear that voice is heard. 
And sure, they'll grumble and grouse, but they'll back our decisions. At least for a few weeks. It won't be our decisions, Chaborn said. Cholto grinned and leaned back. At the end of her broadcast, after she'd summarized the evidence against Fennec and Kennedy and played a few selective clips of their confessions, Siobhan had made an announcement. There was to be an election to select who was in charge of this flotilla. Every adult on each of the ships would write down the name of the person they thought should lead. One name per person, handed in when they collected their breakfast. It had to be the name of someone on board one of the ships, but it could be anyone, except Sholto or Siobhan, as they would count the ballots. There were no other stipulations, restrictions, rules, or guidelines. You're not worried Marcus might win? Siobhan asked. Nope. No one will vote for him. It's unlikely anyone will ever want to shake his hand, let alone buy a drink from him. And you're not worried about who might win? It could be anyone. It won't be, Charlto said confidently. There'll be some people who'll vote for themselves and some who'll vote for a friend. I'd say that'll account for about a third of the ballots. The rest will vote for one of two people. You think? Sure. And whichever of those two wins will be heading for Dundalk. Doesn't that defeat the point of an election? Siobhan asked. That depends on what you think the purpose of an election is, Sholto said. Before he had to say any more, there was a knock on the door. It opened. Callie stood there. Behind her was Private Petrelli, a box in his hands. That's the first box of ballots, Callie said, all from the John Cabot. You heard the engines? They're hard to miss, Sholto said. The winds changed direction, Callie said. It's blowing the smoke out to sea. We're going to move away from the shore. Not to Dundalk, she added though more for the people filling the corridor outside. Not yet, because the Admiral says our final destination has to be made by our new leader. But we have to get away from the smoke. We'll get the ballots from the other ships when we stop. That'll be in about an hour, the Admiral thinks. Then we should get started, Sholto said. And when you bring the next lot of ballots, do you think you can bring some food? I can't remember the last time I ate. How do you want to do this? Siobhan asked, opening the first box. I'll read them. You tally them, Sholto said, taking the box from her. You want to place a bet? On the winner? No. Suit yourself. She took out the pen and notebook in which she'd written the speech she'd just broadcast, turned to a fresh page, and looked up. Go on. Hang on. He looked around, and took a moment to consider the future then picked up a pillow. We need something to put the counted ballots in. This pillowcase will do. Nice floral pattern. Not the kind of thing you expect to find on a ship. First one, Admiral Gunderson. Got it. Next. The Admiral. The Admiral. Column. The Admiral. Column. Column. John Whitley. The Admiral. Reg Caffney, Column. One by one he read the names. One by one Siobhan marked them off. By the time Callie opened the door with a large vacuum flask and two empty bowls in her hands and Petrelli behind her with another plastic crate, they'd almost finished. More ballots and some breakfast, Callie said. Here's winning. Nope, Siobhan said. Absolutely not. There'll be no running tally. No more questions either. Just leave those there and go. Eh, fine, Callie said. Not even a small hint. Thanks for the breakfast, Sholto said, ushering her outside. Fish stew laced with paprika, Siobhan said, opening the flask. At least it smells of fish and smoke, and I'm going to assume that's paprika. Who is winning? Sholto asked, taking a bowl from her. Is it Colm or the Admiral? The Admiral. Column's a few votes behind. You knew those two would be the front runners. Well, the Admiral's been running things since we arrived in Belfast. Column's been walking the harbour, getting to know people, being friendly and being seen. The Admiral will be the first name that comes to everyone's minds, 
columns will be the second. Which of those two someone picks will depend on whether they distrust experience enough to want change. It's what most elections come down to. You're a cynic, Siobhan said. Eight people voted for Reg Caffney. He's the closest thing we have to a pre-outbreak celebrity, Sholto said. Three for Gloria, though. And I bet one of those was from Reg, Sholto said. Third place is John Whitley, Siobhan said. He's got twenty-nine votes, so that's a very distant third. What's your theory on people voting for him? Is it that they want a military ruler, but not the admiral? I'd say those votes most likely came from the people in her crew who are threatening to mutiny. They want change, but for that change to be pretty much the same as what they have now. Yes, you definitely are a cynic. Shall we? They continued counting and Callie continued bringing new boxes. The engines slowed, and the ballots were brought in from the other ships. It took hours, during which time the ships moved further from the shore, but through the portholes truncated vista, it was impossible to judge how far out to sea they'd travelled. Callie refused to tell them until they told her who'd won, and so they kept on counting until they were finished. And one more for the Admiral. Sholto said, stuffing the scrap of paper into the fourth pillowcase. And that's our lot. That's it. They're all counted, Javon said. Right. Give me a moment. Well, no. It's obvious who's won. It's the Admiral. Not by much, though. It's a margin of under a hundred. Sounds about right, Sholto said, stuffing the ballots further into the pillowcase, then tying the end. He did the same with the other three pillowcases. Siobhan looked at him, then at the cloth sacks, then back at him. Colum's a good man, she said. He is. But maybe the Admiral is the leader we need right now. I'd say so, Sholto said. More importantly, that's what your tally shows. The people have spoken. With the Admiral in charge, there'd be no mutiny, not now. Not for a few weeks, anyway, Sholto said. Siobhan looked again at the bags. Sholto knew what question she wanted to ask, but knew that she wouldn't. The people have spoken, Siobhan said. What did they say? That you get the leaders you deserve, not those you want. In my experience in the elections I've been involved in, people always get the leader they need, Sholto said. Hmm. I think that is a statement you and I will dig into over the coming days. We have our winner, our leader. I better tell the Admiral, and then tell everyone else. Are you coming? I'll get rid of these, Shalto said, indicating the stuffed pillowcases. It's only extra weight, and that's a waste of fuel. Hmm. She said no more, but left the cabin. Shalto picked up the pillowcases triple-checked that he wasn't leaving any ballots behind, then made his way out of the cabin and back onto the deck. Everyone asked him who'd won. To everyone, he gave the same answer. Listen to the ship's address system. It'll be announced in a moment. And it was, before he reached the ship's stern. Javon's voice rang out across the deck, announcing that the Admiral had won. Even as she spoke, the engines roared into life, drowning out her words. It didn't drown out the noise from the passengers and crew, because everyone was silent. Cholto hadn't expected a cheer, though. Not today. Not after the events of yesterday. As the ship rocked, beginning its slow turn southward, the Admiral's voice rang across the ship. It is a new day, a new beginning, she said. This is not where we thought we'd be. Our destination is not where we thought we'd be going. New challenges await us, but we shall face them as we have faced so many before. We often talk about being at a crossroads. I think we have passed that junction. Ahead of us lies a straight path with no turnings in sight. Together, we must go forward, because we cannot go back. We have to travel together, and so we cannot be divided. In unity lies our future, 
and the salvation of our species. There was a pause. Then John Whitley came on. We're making best possible speed for Dundalk. According to Mary O'Leary, we can expect to find food and coal there and hardly any zombies. That got a cheer. With the announcement made, Sholto was ignored as he pushed his way to the back of the ship. Unceremoniously, he threw the pillowcases over the side. They bobbed briefly in the ship's frothing wake, but then sank as the cloth and paper inside absorbed the water. He leaned on the rail, watching them disappear beneath the waves. The election had only formalized the status quo. The Admiral had taken charge when word came that Mary's ship had run aground. Chavorn had fallen back into the role of police officer, while Colum had assumed responsibility for morale. No one had asked them. They had seen a task for which they were qualified and fallen into that role. Yes, the Admiral was the leader they needed. For now. Next month? Who could say? Events changed so swiftly. Benick and Kennedy, two more executions. It was best to think of them in those terms rather than as murder. It was a philosophical distinction, but not one he'd lose any sleep over, if only because each day ended in exhaustion. If the past was a guide, their faces would haunt him during the sleepless wait for dawn after a nervous sentry raised the alarm, thinking the undead approached. Of course, there wouldn't be any of those alarms raised while they were aboard the ship. He turned his gaze to the haze over Belfast where the fire still raged, but his mind returned to a childhood visit to a café with his father. He closed his eyes, but when he tried to recall his father's face, he saw Bill instead. Nothing prevented him repositioning the satellites now. It was time to find his brother, and he would find him. He'd managed it before. Chapter 24 A Glimpse of the Future to Come Dundalk Kim switched the sat phone off. Did you hear all of that? The Admiral was elected, is that right? Mirabelle said. But I didn't hear who came second. Column, Kim said. They're bringing their ships here to Dundalk and should arrive this evening. I think that they'll get here in time for some to come ashore, but the majority will have to stay aboard until tomorrow. Of course, I suppose that decision is the Admiral's now. She looked over at Mary, but the old woman simply smiled. For once, the meeting was not being held in public, but in the small office in which Daisy and Annette slept, Mary planned, and in which Kim sometimes managed to doze for a few fitful minutes. Though the office was small, there was enough room for Mary, Bran, Mirabelle, and Kim. The windows had been boarded up, inside and out, leaving the wind-up camping lantern as their only illumination. Even so, the room was brightened by Daisy's mural. It now stretched across all four walls, and even covered the door. A band of yellow was bordered by one of dark blue and another of a lighter blue, the top of which was a ragged line marking the infant's uppermost reach. Beneath the defunct light switch was a jagged black line topped with four green blobs that, they assumed, was a palm tree. Kim still had no idea what inspired the child to draw a desert island, or even if that was what Daisy had drawn. Mary had said the composition was far beyond what they should expect from a child Daisy's age, and should be taken as an indication the girl was suffering no psychological effect from the shipwreck. Kim wasn't convinced, but was happy to defer to the teacher's experience, partly because there was just too much else to worry about. Did they say something about the sabotage? Mirabelle asked. Do they think it's over? I hope so, Kim said. But no, they didn't mention it, so there's no change from the message last night. It's a crowded ship, isn't it? Bran said. They'll be conscious that everything that's said can be overheard. What else did they say? Mary asked. They're not sure how much food they've brought with them, 
and won't be able to do a stock take until they're able to send some people ashore and free up some space. Last night, though, Callie did mention something about how they'd boarded the ships carrying weapons and clothes, and that some people didn't even grab those. I think we can assume that whatever they took ashore was left behind in Belfast, along with whatever they found in the city. But they did bring their weapons, Bran asked. Some did, yes, Kim said. But it's the same as with the food. They don't know how many they've brought. Reading between the lines, it's machetes and tools, more than it's guns and ammo. Which is a situation we've been in before, Mary said. Let's not forget that. No, Kim said. And their next impending problem will be fresh water. They left that behind, too. Their desalinization gear is working overtime, but doesn't stand a chance of keeping up. They're sailing here in a freighter and cargo ships that were designed for crews of a dozen. Do they have enough water for today? Bran asked. Yes, and maybe tomorrow, but no more, and that's with them on short rations. I'm reading between the lines again, though. And we're on short rations ourselves, Mary said. We can't hold out hope for rain. What about freshwater sources? Well, there are some streams to the north of Dundalk Bay, Bran said. We can ask Commander Crawley to send a team to mark a route. Perhaps even ships and containers there. However, I think we should depart before they arrive. Shouldn't we wait for them? Mirabelle asked. We can have fresh water and hot food ready when they arrive. We could even find some new clothes and other bits and pieces. Can we really, dear? Mary asked. How long have we been here, and how many clean and dry stitches of clothing do we have between us? That's my point, Bran said, though I'd put it in a starker terms of available calories. The grain we salvage from the wreck represents our entire reserve, for us and them, enlivened by a paltry selection of spices. After it's consumed, and for as long as we are here, we'll be relying entirely on fish. Did they say how many small boats they managed to save? No, Kim said, but they didn't have many in Belfast to start with. I don't suppose they know how much fishing gear they've salvaged? Bran asked. No, and we didn't find much here in Dundalk. Not that many of us are skilled with line or net. What you mean, Mary said, is that we won't be able to catch enough fish to feed us all. Exactly, Bran said. Food? Water, even coal, the longer we stay here, the more resources we consume that the Admiral needs as much as us. We've thirty meals each aboard the New World, and we won't find any more here. What we need, what the Admiral needs, is a safe harbour somewhere warm, within sailing distance of green leaf trees that contain either fruit or birds. Somewhere we can scavenge new clothes, medicines and all the rest. Mary said, yes, I agree, and for that we'll need better ships. That means Calais. How long would it take us to reach there? Commander Crawley thinks two days, perhaps three, Kim said. But if we depart now, we'll have to leave most of the supplies here in the college, not at the coal depot. It doesn't make much difference whether we move them or the Admiral does, Bran said. What's crucial is finding out whether those ships in Calais can sail or not. And my mind is very much on what we'll do if the answer is not. Thirty meals each, that's ten days, maybe fifteen. Maybe we'll get lucky in Calais and find a ship stocked with tins in a harbour full of fish. Maybe there'll be a storm that delays us, and one so strong we can't fish. Maybe the ships there are unusable, and we'll have less than a week to find food or face starvation. Remaining here, we could only give the Admiral a welcome, Mary said. But that won't keep them safe. No, we'll leave, and we'll do it today, now. As soon as the last stragglers have finished breakfast, we should secure the canteen and the supplies we're leaving behind, Bran said. We'll travel to the waterfront in one large group, like we did when we moved from the hotel. I'll ask Commander Crawley to leave a rear guard behind to secure the coal depot and landing site. We'll leave them a boat and ask they cross the harbour and mark out a couple of streams. I'd say Vasco Fonseca should command it, but we can leave behind some of the ship's crew who, 
who might prefer to be reunited with their old comrades. Agreed, Mary said. What about the helicopter? Mirabelle asked. Do we bring that with us? There's space on deck, just about, Bran said. When we reach France, it would make searching for Bill easier, Kim, Mary said. Yes, yes it would, Kim said, realising that the final decision was being left to her. But the helicopter is only useful as long as we have fuel. I didn't ask Callie if they were able to salvage any aviation fuel, but I can't imagine they did. That means the only source is still the remaining tankers up near Belfast International. The only way they'll retrieve it is by flying the helicopter back up there. No, best we leave the helicopter here. Good, Bran said. That will forestall an argument with the pilot over whether the Admiral or Mary is an overall command. That's an issue we'll have to settle, but uh, one I'd like to put off for now. Then we're all agreed? Kim asked. Good. You won't need my help on the journey to the harbour. Before we leave, I'd like to return to the hospital. We never did confirm that it was empty of the undead, and we should at least tell the Admiral that before she arrives. But really, it's this mystery over the Irish survivors I want an answer to. Did they bring the ammunition from Dublin? And did they then take it all with them? We found about half the ammunition, right? Fifty thousand rounds of nine millimeter, Bran said, and an assortment of grenades, shotgun shells, and a small collection of other personal weapons and ammunition. So we found about half of what that log said they had. They might have taken the remainder with them, but why leave some behind? They had time to set up those sound lures, after all. They might have used the ammunition, I suppose. But what if they didn't? What if it's in the hospital? What you mean is that curiosity is eating you alive, Mary said, but it would be pleasant to discuss that mystery as an alternative to the problems they had in Belfast. Bran, you'll go with her. He really needs to lead the people to the harbour, Kim said. I think I can manage that well enough on my own, Mary said. While it would be nice to have some answers to the mystery of our missing Irish survivors, it would be worse if we were left here having suffered another tragedy. Off you go. We'll see you at the ship. Do you think those clouds look like snow? Annette asked. I think it's smoke from the fire in Belfast, Kim said. No way, Annette said. It can't be. That's miles from here. Blocked drains and flooded gutters left them a narrow, mud-coated path down which to trudge. Bran was on point with Ken and Dee Dee. Donny and Mirabelle were just behind, with Kim and Annette at the rear. At a crossroads, where a pair of pubs faced one another, the rain and snowmelt had drained into the cellars. The windows of the public houses were intact. The brickwork appeared sound. The signs, cleaned by the rain, almost sparkled. But those flooded pubs would be the first buildings to collapse, bringing down the houses that shared an adjoining wall. It wouldn't happen today nor tomorrow, and probably not before the Admiral left Dundalk, but there would be ruins long before anyone ever returned to this town. Bran stopped, crouched, raised a warning hand, but then waved the all clear without a shot being fired. The previous night had been a sleepless one for all in Dundalk, as they'd waited for the next infrequent update from Belfast. That tension had spread to the centuries, and a dozen shots had been fired into the night, though dawn's first light had shone on only one new corpse outside their barricade. We won't be coming back, will we? Annette said. I mean, it'll be France, then Spain or America. We won't come back here. To Dundalk? No, Kim said. I was just thinking the same. I meant Ireland. I kind of like it. More than Anglesey, anyway. Even though there's more undead and far less electricity. It's, even without the sabotage, we'd have had to leave Anglesey sometime, Annette said. We knew that from when we first arrived there. Here it's different, because wherever we end up, it'll be somewhere like this, won't it? A small town close to the sea. I expect so. Yeah. And this town wasn't so bad. Yeah, it's kind of sad that we're leaving. What about you, Donny? 
she asked. What's that? Donnie said, turning around. Are you sad about leaving? Annette asked. You mean, am I sad about the prospect of sleeping on board a ship, where I won't wake every morning worried that the undead have surrounded us during the night? No, I can't say that I am. I meant sad about leaving Ireland, Annette said, leaving your home. My flat was in Belfast, Donny said, and don't they say home is where you hang your hat, though I never was one for hats. They always blew off in the wind. Mirabelle laughed. What about you, Kim? Annette asked. Are you sad about leaving? Leaving here? No. I'm glad we're alive and thankful for that. Donnie's right. Home's an idea in time, a state of mind, not walls and roofs. An idea in time? Annette repeated. Yeah, I like that. Still, I'll miss Ireland. But we got to leave. We got to find Bill. We do, Kim said. They trudged onward. Kim? Annette asked. Yes. Exactly how are we going to find Bill? With the satellites, Kim said. We'll find the plane first and we'll take it from there. Yeah, but... But what if we can't find the plane? We will. Okay. But you know that we might not, Annette said. I mean, what if they didn't land in France? What if they just kept going? That's why we have to find the plane, Kim said. Yeah, but... But Bran had stopped and crouched down again. This time he stayed crouched and waved them all forward. Kim ushered Annette ahead, checked the safety on her rifle, and then checked the road behind. They were alone, but only now did she realize that if they had to flee, they'd have to run in single file along the flooded road. Slowly more alert than ever, she caught up with the others, but it wasn't a zombie that had caused Bran to stop. Ahead. You see, Bran said. It's the cat, Annette said. The cat sat in the middle of the road, watching them beadily. Mostly black with patches of grubby white fur, the ragged red collar around its neck hung loose, betraying how skinny it had grown in the last months. She looks hungry, Annette said, taking a step towards her. Try not to look like food, then, Donny said. Ha ha, not funny, Annette said. Here, puss, here, puss. Doubled over, hand extended, she sidled towards the cat who blinked, stood, and ran away up the road. See, see what you did, Annette said, rounding on Donny. Just behind them, the eave window of a two-story terraced house shattered. Glass fell, splashing onto the flooded pavement below as an arm reached through the broken frame. A head followed, but the rest of the zombie got caught on the jagged pane. Mine, Bran said, firing before anyone else could. He carried one of the submachine guns, salvaged from the depot, and to which Rahinda had affixed a suppressor. The shot was louder than from one of the rifles, but the echo soon died away. Clear, Bran said. And the cat's gone, Annette said. She's following us, Kim said. How can she be when she was in front, Annette said. Fine, then she found us. But that means she'll find us again. It looks like she was heading to the hospital. Maybe we'll catch up with her there. The hospital had changed since the day they'd first found it. The undead killed during the survivors' fighting retreat had been trampled by the thousand-strong pack that had swept from the building. The abandoned ambulances had been shunted into one another, the wing mirrors broken, their bumpers crushed. Kim reached for the handle of the nearest door, but the frame was so distorted it wouldn't open. Pity. You wanted something from inside? Annette asked. I wanted to... Near her feet came a soft scraping. Kim pushed Annette away from the ambulance and jumped back herself as a decaying arm swept out from beneath the vehicle. The arm swung back, then forth, and then slapped onto the concrete. Black pus oozed from broken skin as exposed muscles tightened, and the zombie hauled its shoulders, then its head from beneath the ambulance. Kim had already slung her rifle 
and had her machete in hand. She stamped her foot down on the creature's wrist, breaking the bone and pinning its arm. As it tugged, a sinew ripped as its mouth snapped at her leg. She stabbed the heavy blade down. Why can't they just die? Annette said. I know, Kim said. Back up, Bran said. Stay alert. He fell flat to the ground and peered under the remaining vehicles. Looks clear. He pushed himself back to his feet. Mum, I mean, I mean, what were you looking for in the ambulance? Annette asked. Where were they going and where did they come from? Kim said, looking away so Annette wouldn't see her smile. Did they come from Dublin and then go on foot to the barracks? Or was this where some of them came after they left those barricades in the town? I suppose I'm really just trying to find enough answers that we don't have to go inside. The hospital itself had barely changed since their first visit. More windows had been smashed, the door by the ramp behind the ambulances had been ripped from its hinges, but otherwise it was as darkly forbidding as when they'd first seen it. Well, there's no point putting it off, she said. How do we do this? The corridors are narrow, Bran said. We don't want to get in each other's way. Ken? Dee Dee? You go through that door over there. That building seems to be connected to this one by that corridor. Walk the exterior. Always keep the windows on your left. You're looking for ammunition or other caches of supplies. Stick to the exterior until you find yourself back at the main entrance. Kim, you and I'll go back inside, into the interior. Annette, you're keeping the time. You have a watch? Sure. After thirty minutes, if we're not outside, fire an unsilenced shot. Mirabel, Donny, you stay here too. Watch the road. If more than ten zombies come, fire an unsilenced shot. Ken, Dee Dee, if you get in trouble, do the same. Wherever we hear that shot, that's where we'll go. Thirty minutes, no more. Inside was dark. The floor was damp, the carpet sodden with what Kim hoped was rainwater. Bran turned on his torch. Kim did the same. The weak beams adding to the second-hand light from broken windows. A polystyrene panel snapped beneath her feet as she ducked around an aluminium ventilation pipe which had fallen through the false ceiling. Ahead, Bran paused just before an open door. At least, the top two-thirds were open. The bottom third was still attached by its lower hinge. He tapped his rifle against the wall and then kicked the broken door, which barely moved. Kim pushed aside a jumble of hanging wires and then saw what Bran had seen. There were zombies inside the room, lying next to the door, unmoving. Bran raised his rifle. Okay, he said. Kim wasn't sure if he was talking to her or to the undead, but they didn't move. They're dead, she asked. I think so, he said. Trampled when the pack pursued us? Must have been, Bran said hesitantly, as he focused his torch on the hairless scalp of the uppermost creature. It doesn't look damaged. I suppose people could die from brain injuries without there being an obvious trauma, Kim said. I'm grasping at straws here. Bran raised the light's beam, scanning the room. Ten dead. Nothing else in there. Nothing obvious. No clue how they ended up in the room in the first place. Let's move on. Kim took the lead. The next door had been completely removed from its hinges and lay in two parts on the corridor's floor. Inside the room, a desk had been upturned. On the other side were bones, still covered in as much skin as cloth. Doesn't look like the corpse of a zombie, Kim said, but it's not been eaten by rodents or insects. Don't forget the thousand zombies that were in here before we arrived. Even a mouse is smart enough to stay away from that kind of hell. That submachine gun, that's an MP7. Kim picked it up. Empty. That's the same type you found in the barracks. She bent down and pushed the corpse's collar aside. Hanging around spine and rotten flesh was a pair of identity discs. She pulled them free. 
Let me see, Bran said. Dutch. Well, I think that confirms they were connected to the people we found in the barracks. The question is whether they were part of the same group. You think they might have arrived later? Maybe. This hospital wasn't marked on that map we found, and it's not inside their barricade. The group in the barracks might have arrived first, aiming to secure the town and the harbour. They failed and had to flee, but had no way of warning the second wave. How much time do we have left? Kim asked, playing the light around the detritus littering the room. Twenty minutes, Bran said. Let's keep going. Hope we find a more obvious clue somewhere else. The next door was closed. Kim gripped the handle, looked at Bran, and waited for him to nod. She turned the handle and pushed the door inward. It was another dark and empty office. No, not empty. As she panned her light to the left, a figure lurched towards it. The exposed teeth, the sunken eyes, the ragged tufts of hair. It took her less than a second to realize it was one of the undead. But it took Bran even less than that. He fired. The zombie fell, loudly clattering onto a desk chair, before tumbling to the ground. That one wasn't dead, Bran said. Let's move. Beyond that door, the corridor branched. They chose the turning that took them deeper into the building. The corridors grew darker as they moved beyond the second-hand light from the exterior windows. The illumination from their torches was enough to read the signs, but since they'd all been ripped from the walls or the chains holding them to the ceiling, they were useless. The closed doors were now often secured with number locks, the windows reinforced with mesh. The doors that were open, or ripped from their hinges, revealed examination rooms and smaller treatment rooms. Kim's foot glanced against something that spun away, knocking into the edge of an upturned patient trolley, partially blocking a set of open double doors. Instinctively, she tracked her light down to see what she'd kicked. It's a knife, she said. A bayonet, Bran said. German, I think. Kim let the light play upwards, over the trolley, and through the doors. She wished she hadn't. She turned the light back onto the corridor. Children, she said. Mostly children. Lots of children. Kim walked on, more swiftly now, wanting to get away from that unsealed tomb. Bran didn't. He played his light into the room. Kim? Whatever it is, I don't want to know. They were zombies, he said. That doesn't make it any better, she said. I didn't mean that. There's a set of speakers in here. Speakers and what looks like a stereo unit. The kind you'd slot your phone into. Perhaps that was so the hospital staff could listen to music while they worked. It's affixed to the wall with electrical tape, Bran said. A lot of tape. Okay. Interesting, Kim said, still not taking a step back towards the room. They lured some zombies here or used sound to keep them there. Perhaps. That would suggest they were part of the same group who were at the barracks. I guess some of them didn't make it out on the ship. Some of them ended up here. Like you said, perhaps. We've still not found any ammunition, though, or an answer to whether the Admiral should spend time sending people here. I think we've about ten minutes. At the next branch in the corridor, a sign was still attached to the wall, giving directions to a canteen. Might be worth a look, Kim said. After all, it's where we were keeping our supplies in the college. A rattle came from a door just along the corridor. The rattle came again. Kim turned the handle, then pushed, but the zombie pushed back. Bran raised his boot, kicking at the frame. The wood split. Another kick, and the door swung backwards, knocking the zombie from its feet. Kim fired. It's in uniform, she said. She played the light around the room. It's a stock room. Looks like bandages, syringes. I don't think we'll be able to use any of that now. Not after that zombie was inside. What's in here? Bran said, picking up a military duffel bag. Ammo. All nine millimetre. 
There's a sidearm, a Glock, MREs about three days' worth, some clothes, and an assortment of the usual personal survival equipment. Some military issue, but mostly scavenged civilian gear. So he was probably part of a team that was luring the undead here, but got infected and trapped himself inside. Or not. We're finding more questions than answers. Let's find the canteen, and then go. But in the canteen they found an answer. Just not to the question they'd been asking. How many? Kim whispered. A hundred, Bran said, his voice just as low. They're, they're zombies, aren't they? Kim said. I think so. I'd say so, Bran said. Yes. And are they dead? Bran took a step into the room, then kicked the outstretched leg of the nearest creature. It didn't move. I think so. I think they're dead. Get ready to run, Kim whispered. Then more loudly she said, Move! Attack! Do something! We're standing here! No movement came from the sea of corpses carpeting the room. It was difficult to imagine the room as it had been a year before. The circular tables and upright chairs had been stacked haphazardly against the serving counter on the room's far side. It wasn't a barricade designed to keep people out but to keep the undead at bay, away from the monstrous speaker stacks positioned next to the serving counter door. You know what this means, Kim said, what this is telling us. The reply came from outside, in the form of a muffled but unmistakably unsuppressed shot. That's thirty minutes, Bran said. Then we better get back outside before they come in, Kim said. It took another ten minutes to navigate through the dark corridors to an exit, by which time Ken and Dee Dee had already returned to the car park and were about to venture inside. Everything cool? Annette asked. I'd say yes, Kim said. What did you find? We only got a quarter way round the building, Dee Dee said. There's a room with tools, axes, shovels, that kind of thing. There's some sharpening stones, too. The room next to that had a padlock on the door. There were boxes of shotgun shells inside. Not military, Kent added. It looks like they came from a farming supply place. What about you? Did you see any zombies? Kim asked. A few, Dee Dee said. Three dead, four crawling, none walking. You? Yes. Yes, we saw zombies. A lot. They're dead, Kim said. Not shot, not stabbed. Just dead. About a hundred of them were in a canteen. There were some more speakers, too. I think they were lured there, like we saw at the barricades in town. But that's not important, not really. The zombies were dead. So? Annette asked. So at some point you have to say that you have as much evidence as you'll ever get, Kim said. At some point you have to add up all the little pieces and call it proof. Proof of what? Annette asked. That the zombies are dying. That they can die, Kim said. The soldiers lured them to this hospital, and while a thousand or so zombies were still alive when we arrived, not all of them were. You remember that pile of dead by the barricade, the ones that were frozen? I think they were dying. In a few more weeks or months, they would have been dead. But not all of them would. Bran said. We just killed a zombie in uniform. Had to have been infected right at the beginning of the outbreak. It was still very much, very much a threat. Yeah. And didn't Callie say that the Horde was still heading towards London? Annette asked. It doesn't change much. So should we just get those shotgun shells and go? Kim cricked her head to one side. What? Annette asked. Kim smiled. Nothing, and we'll leave the shotgun shells for the Admiral, the people from Belfast. Belfast? We'll need a new name for them. We'll need a new name for us as well. But they need to see the dead zombies. They need to see it for themselves. After all they've been through in Belfast, they need something new, something good to brighten their spirits. That the end might be near is about as good as news gets. Yeah. Maybe, Annette said, but nothing changes, does it? 
You'll still have to check each house, each room, each cupboard, always expecting the undead. For one more year, Kim said, one more year and maybe they'll all be gone. We've been saying that for months, Annette said. I think it's good news, Mirabelle said hurriedly, and I'd like to see it for myself. But do we have time? Not really, Bran said. Mary will be at the harbour by now, and everyone should be boarding. We don't want to delay our departure. Never mind, Mirabelle said. I suppose I'll see a sight like that somewhere else soon. I think so, Kim said. I really do. Lead the way then, Bran. And what about the cat? Annette asked. We'll ask Thaddeus to keep an eye out for her, Kim said. Yes, because we'll be keeping our eyes out for the undead, Bran said. This isn't the time to get complacent. The mood was subdued as they headed back to the harbour, taking a slightly longer route on the off chance they might find some further evidence left by the missing survivors. They saw none, though when Kim turned around, she did see something. Quietly, Kim whispered to Annette, and slowly turn around. Why? Annette asked, spinning around. It's the cat! The black and white feline stopped and took a cautious step backwards. She's following us, Kim said. See? No, leave her be, and she'll follow us to the ship. But what if she doesn't? That's her choice, Kim said. They reached the barricade the soldiers had built on the motorway, and found Pete there with two dozen others. You're the last, Pete said. How far behind everyone else are we? Bran asked. About thirty minutes, Pete said. You didn't find any ammo then? Just some shotgun shells, Annette said. We're leaving them for the Admiral. We'll tell you about it on the ship, Kim said. Wait, Annette said, looking back along the road. We've got to wait for the cat. No, don't stare. She doesn't like that. Look away or something. Kim sighed. She looked at the barricade, then up at the turbine towering above the town. Annette was right. A town like Dundalk would make for a great home. A town like it, but not Dundalk. Not somewhere with a coastline along the Irish Sea. Where it would be, she didn't know. But they'd find it soon. Epilogue The Irish Sea That cat'll play merry hell on such a crowded ship, Mary said. If we ever see it again, Kim said. I told Annette the cat would be feral after so long without human contact. I'm surprised it allowed itself to be picked up, but not surprised it darted off the moment she put it down. There's so many people aboard, I don't think it'll stay hidden for long, Mary said, though I suspect it'll jump ship the first chance it gets. Still, we're a ship with a cat, and isn't that traditional? Ah, my own luxury yacht, yes, she smiled. This is the life. But would you be a dear and fetch me a blanket? Kim opened the sliding balcony doors and stepped inside and into the stateroom. They assumed the opulent cabin had been designed for Kempton herself, though now it was home to Rohinda and the collective. All were busy hand-converting the suppressors to fit the submachine guns. If we get to France, and if we find more ammo for the rifles, can they be slotted back onto our SA-80s? Kim asked. No, Rohinda said. We'll have to start from scratch. It'll be time-consuming, but not difficult. Personally, I'd rather spend the time working the kinks out of my crossbows. Those are the future. As soon as we have time, Kim said. She found a blanket and took it back outside. Here you are, Mary. You seem happy. I am, Mary said. I'm saying farewell to Ireland, at least for now. I never got the chance before, but regretted it when I was in that retirement home. I really did think that I'd never have a chance to see Ireland again. Not alive, anyway. Of course, that was the real regret, the real fear, that I would die in that home. Ah, she breathed in. Yes, for me at least, this is a happier end to my story. An end? 
I'm just speaking metaphorically, dear. Besides, we'll be returning to Ireland. You think? There is Elysium to consider, Mary said. I spoke to the Admiral. You told her what we found in the hospital? I did. She should have shared it with the passengers by now. She had them all on deck looking for whales. For whales, really? Kim asked. They were more common on the western coast, but yes, whales used to visit Ireland's shores. The Admiral's real goal was to clear the space around the control room so she could talk in private. To say what? To tell you that she is now in charge? Of course not, Mary said. Our goals are aligned and our paths are entwined. Why quibble over which of us holds the compass? No, she doesn't think the grain ships will make it to France. Oh, I see. Can they make it to Dundalk? She thinks so. I asked whether we should stay close in case a rescue had to be launched, but she thinks the risk of sinking is less than the reward of us getting to France a few hours more quickly. But they won't be following? Kim asked. The Admiral doesn't think so. She'll stay in Dundalk for a few days and use the time to inspect the ships. After a proper stock take of what they've brought and what we've left, she'll make a decision. I think, though, she's already made it. They'll go to Elysium. I see. Using the Amundsen? No, the Amundsen will have to return to Svalbard to collect more fuel. If the grain ships can make it, she'll use those. Otherwise, Heather Jones will have to bring her boats up along the coast. That, though, is a decision for the Admiral to make with Heather. They're using the Amundsen to ferry people from Belfast, aren't they? You mean that those passengers currently aboard the icebreaker will have to disembark before it goes north? Yes. And that means when Dundalk has to be abandoned, for whatever reason, there won't be enough space on the grain ships and John Cabot for all of them. We really need those ships from Calais, then, Kim said. Yes, we do, Mary said. But when we find them, we'll take them to Elysium. From there, America will be our next destination, not Spain. Perhaps, Mary said. It's best not to plan too far ahead. But whether America is our next destination, there is a very good chance it won't be our last. Now, I think wherever we go... We might well return to Ireland, and that thought will keep me warm through this coming winter. Do you want me to get you another blanket? Perhaps we should go back inside. It's getting cold out here. Inside, into a cramped cabin that reeks of a lot of things of which gun oil is the most pleasant. I think not. Not yet. When I was a teacher, and I dreamed of retirement, I often thought it would begin with a cruise. I didn't imagine it would be on a ship as luxurious as this. Then again, I didn't imagine I'd have to share my cabin with quite so many people. When I found myself in that wretched home, a cruise became a bit of a fantasy for me, a dream that allowed my mind to escape while my body spent far too long trapped in a bed. For George, the fantasy was getting a little flat and a little job. He wanted his second chance. I wanted one last holiday. Well, now my fantasy is made real. All that's missing is George. And Bill, Kim said. George will find him, Mary said. I hope so. I do hope he's okay. Believe that he is, Mary said, because there's no advantage in believing the worst. And Bartholomew Wright has survived a lot worse than a plane crash. From the deck above, came Commander Crawley's strident yell. Will someone do something about this wretched cat? And unless you want to go and deal with that, Mary said, let's sit here for a while, and I'll tell you about the first time I left Ireland. There might be something in a grandmother's old stories of use to a young woman who has suddenly found herself a mother. I should begin with a little family history. Great Uncle John is a good man to start with. He had to leave Ireland after the Civil War and went to Australia. Though really, to tell his story I should go back a few more generations to the famine and those ancestors who had no choice but to take the boat to America. Kim relaxed in the chair, zipped her coat up tight, and listened to Mary, 
while she watched Ireland recede into the distance. To be continued. This has been Surviving the Evacuation, Book 13, Futures Beginning, written by Frank Tail, narrated by Tim Bruce, copyright 2018 by Frank Tail, production copyright 2018 by Frank Tail. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.